you guys are thinking. Yeah, there's still a lot of people outside, but. No, no, they, uh, yeah, if you want to join the network, just use the Wi-Fi password. Ignore what it says over there. Okay. The passport number is for people who are staying at the hotel. So I just put instead of the password. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's your passport number. Comes for everyone. Put that number there, which is not a password. Can people hear me on live stream or Zoom? Can someone, can someone on Zoom speak? Okay, is that okay? Good. Yeah, hi, can owner. We can, uh, I can hear you. Okay, maybe I. Okay, thanks. Should we close the doors? Uh, maybe wait, wait a few more seconds. We'll, we'll start, I think, in a minute or so. Let's, let's wait. It's a bit of chaotic here. Oh, you mean one of the Okay. So can we see the uh, YouTube also, Jeff? It's content. Uh, I can send the YouTube thing to chat. Yeah, I just send it so that I can take a look at what's going on in there. Okay. We can also test it, of course, but. Okay, so, yeah. You can go straight. Is it looking good there? Yeah, there are quite a few people watching. Okay, for those people on YouTube, we're going to start soon. I think you should close the Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Should I keep it open in the background or no? You don't think you should. Yeah, because of the bandwidth problems? Yeah. Okay, so let's see if it's working. Okay. I don't need this one. Uh, we don't have a good isolation between the rooms here. We have an open door. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like we have an open door. Nice and easy. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, it doesn't work sometimes, as you can see. Uh, watch your minutes. Okay, let's get started. And everything is still good, right? Next clip, yeah. Okay. Video panel. Body meeting controls. Okay. Make this a little bigger. Okay. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, in person here in Istanbul, as well as online on YouTube and Zoom uh, for our first ever bio arch. Or ARC workshop. This is a workshop on hardware acceleration of bioinformatics workloads. And it's the first time we're holding it with the Recon conference. Uh, this is the 23rd year of Recon, 25th? 27th. 27th? Okay, yeah. Good to have some system that takes the Recon after 27 years, let's say, architecture. So the goal of the workshop is really to present and discuss new ideas and accelerating bioinformatics workloads, and specifically with the co-design of hardware and software and new system designs in computer architectures. Uh, so I think of this as system design for bioinformatics, which is a topic that's going to become increasingly important, in my opinion, because definitely software uh, innovations are not keeping up with the amount of data that we're generating in bioinformatics today, and with the amount of computational analysis that we need to do in the entire bioinformatics stack. And I'm going to give a talk about genome analysis as an example, but there are a bunch of other examples in other bioinformatics domains, in my opinion, that look at like proteins, for example, uh, and other types of uh, data, many types of omics in general, 
And these are all increasing. Proteomics is another example uh, that's increasing in terms of the data. Uh, but genomics has, of course, been developed for a long time, and it's really pushing our limits uh, in terms of our devices and other things. So that's the goal of the workshop. Uh, and you can see that it's going to be today. We're starting a bit late uh, due to technical issues with the organization. Uh, and uh, what we have done is we basically asked people to submit talks, and we united a bunch of talks. So we're going to have a bunch of talks. <clears throat> this is also being live streamed on YouTube, and I assume people are following on YouTube. If you have questions on YouTube, feel free to ask us. Uh, I think maybe John will monitor them, or anybody can monitor them if they wish. Uh, and we'll try to handle them as much as possible. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll go to the talk soon, but we also have a panel on hardware acceleration. Uh, this is uh, for the entire recon uh, conference on April 17th afternoon. And we have some confirmed speakers. Mohammed is here, Damla and Raya. We may have one or two more, let's see. That's to be determined. Uh, but we're going to discuss uh, hardware acceleration for the broader uh, recon community over there. So this workshop is organized by me and John, who's sitting over there with my PhD student. You're going to hear him talk later on and introduce some speakers. Okay, so let me uh, cover the program very quickly. Uh, this was supposed to be the opening remarks, as you can see already over time. Not too bad, one minute. But I was hoping to actually use this time for actually the talk also, but uh, not, now it's not going to happen. And then I'm going to give a brief introduction to accelerating genome analysis. Uh, this is going to mainly foreshadow some thoughts uh, that I have and some of the talks that uh, are going to come, especially from our group. And then you can see there are a bunch of talks uh, from Gagan, uh, Leonid. Some of these are going to be online because people could not travel. And some of these are going to be in person. Uh, and then we're going to have a coffee break and then a bunch of other talks online and, and in person. And then lunch break. Uh, just the, this is just to uh, uh, tell people on YouTube that when, when we're not live streaming, there's a break going on. Uh, otherwise, we will live stream. And you can see that there are a bunch of talks, academia and industry. Uh, and research labs also. Uh, okay, I don't want to go through all of these clearly. Uh, how many talks do we have? 16? 16, 16, okay. Yeah, you can see that we have 16 talks. So hopefully it's going to be exciting. A lot of them are focused on genomics, but not all of them. So I think, I think that also kind of gives you a feel of the field, right? Genomics has clearly been pushing forward and there's a lot of more work in architectures and system design for genomics. But maybe we should also be exploring other stuff that is outside genomics within the bigger domain of bioinformatics. Any questions? Okay, then I'll I'll jump to my talk, uh, which is uh, going to be accelerating genome analysis. So for that, I'll stop sharing the screen. Then I'll share the PowerPoint. Everything is still good, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll try to stick to the time limit, I think, because we have a tight schedule. But maybe we can have a shorter lunch break if needed. Is there a lunch provided here? Does anybody know? You don't know? Okay. Oh, no, no lunch. Okay, so no lunch provided, but there are quite a few places around, so you can have probably better lunch than conference would provide, anyways. <laughs> yeah. That's usually the case. Conference food is not good, but stuff outside is much better. Okay, so uh, let me give you a quick overview of uh, accelerating genome analysis. It's supposed to be a longer talk, but I'll try to keep it to 30 minutes. Uh, this is going to be more of a personal talk because I'm going to tell you uh, our personal journey uh, on uh, how we start on genome analysis and what we're doing. Uh, clearly, there's other stuff that's going on in genome analysis that I cannot cover uh, in 30 minutes. For that, I'll refer you to some papers. Uh, that we have been writing uh, with people and some who, who some of whom are in this room. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, I think system design for bioinformatics is a critical problem. It has large implications, societal implications, scientific, medical, personal implications. And this talk uh, is an overview of accelerating a key step in bioinformatics, which is genome sequence analysis. And even within that, I think in particular, I'll focus a lot on read mapping, not exclusively, but mostly because that's the area that we've been focusing on. So you can see that there's bioinformatics and then genome sequence analysis and then there's read mapping. We're really focusing on one area for 10 years or so. 
So imagine what else can we focus on uh, around that. And uh, there are many bottlenecks that exist in accessing and manipulating huge amounts of data during uh, gen genomic data during analysis. And I'm going to cover some recent ideas in accelerating read mapping. And we've started this actually for, since uh, September 2006 or so. But more recently, we've been doing a lot more work in the area. Uh, so hopefully, it'll be interesting. So when we started, uh, what did we uh, think about? Well, basically, we were kind of dreaming. We wanted to design these genome analysis engines that can perform comprehensive genome analysis very, very quickly, like within a minute, let's say. Uh, of course, that's kind of uh, uh, aggressive, let's say, because within two weeks was not very good. And then the question may be sophisticated, like or simple things like this, which are these DNAs that the DNA segment match with. Or what is the likely genetic disposition of this patient to this drug that's harder? And yeah, there are many other harder questions. I will not go into a lot of questions because we don't have time in this talk, but you can imagine a lot of things. You can have a device that can sequence your genome and quickly tell you a lot of things about your health. Maybe combine that information from other data uh, that you may have about your life. So that was our dream, basically. And I think we're getting closer to that dream, but we're not there yet. I think there's a lot more to do uh, in this area. My internet connection is unstable. Is it good? OK. OK, so basically, we need really faster and scalable genome analysis because there are many applications. We can understand genetic variations. We can understand species, the evolution. We can predict uh, different sort of diseases and outbreaks. And we can also. Uh, understand what's going on in this room, for example, what kind of microbes are we being exposed to, et cetera. And we can know what personalized medicine solutions that are tailored to uh, the genetic, genetic disposition of, of people, including other data as well. And there are many, many other applications. And I think there's a bright future because we have technologies that can enable this. We can actually generate a lot of genomic data very, very quickly at high throughput, but we need to somehow figure out how to analyze this data. Before I go into more detail, I'll mention some of these papers that we have written uh, together with co-authors, some of whom are here, that talk about accelerating genome analysis. This is a relatively easy introduction, I would say, led by Mohammed, who is here, who's going to give you two talks later on. Uh, and uh, Gagan is going to give a talk that covers part of this. So these are some overview readings that talk about accelerating genome analysis. That's from our group. And this is a more recent one that was invited to the special issue of this journal. Uh, that is actually more comprehensive, over, I would say. And we have another paper that's in the works that I'm writing with John right now. Uh, that's a shorter one, very short one, uh, that's going to appear in DAC uh, in June. OK. So I think uh, before I go into more detail, I would say that uh, we have a problem. We have uh, questions to answer. And for this, uh, it's really a system design problem. Because we have technology, genomic technology, at the low level of this device genomic data. And on top of this, we're building algorithms to uh, sort through that data and make decisions. Uh, but we can't ignore what's going on in between, in my opinion. We really need to design these genomic devices so that uh, we can uh, process the data relatively quickly without moving it too much around, because that's going to be a problem. OK, this is an agenda, but I will not <laughs> really stick to this full agenda. So let's uh, continue. So I don't think we need to talk about what's a genome made of in this place. Uh, clearly, we have nucleotide bases. And, uh, this determines a lot of things, uh, not everything in our lives clearly, but this determines some of our uh, personality traits, some of our physical traits for sure, and uh, some of our dispositions to different things. Uh, but clearly there are environmental effects that also uh, go into it. And this is real, clearly, people have photographed it, and there are lots of stories, but we don't have time to go over it. But in the end, uh, this is what a genome looks like, at least translated into the four nucleotide-based sequences. Uh, it's basically a huge text. And the length of the text determines of the species. Uh, it is is based on the uh, species. You can see that humans are kind of in the middle and not the most uh, like longest genome. And some other species like viruses are much smaller, uh, as you can see. But basically, uh, this also shows a variety of different uh, species in terms of length. But also, uh, these all of these actually uh, can be translated into this text. And the question is basically, if you, if you actually sequence all of these, let's pick these five, how do you determine what is what, for example? Right? That's, uh, that's not going to be easy. Uh, so basically, uh, in DNA sequencing, we want to find the complete sequence of ACGTs, these are nucleotide bases, in an organism DNA or RNA. The challenge is, uh, there's no machine today. Unfortunately, the technologies today uh, take long DNA as input, but they actually chop it into pieces. So we, don't, we cannot get the full sequence. There's no technology that's really good at that today. 
Maybe in the future it'll change, but we have not found it yet. Uh, and all sequencing machines chop DNA into small pieces, different lengths, and identify these relatively small pieces, but they do not tell you how they fit together. Some of them have some implications of how they fit together, but not perfect. So it, that's why genome sequencing uh, becomes a problem. Basically, you take large DNA molecule and you chop it into pieces with some technology. And these small DNA fragments are called weaves, and they need to identify it, uh, be identified somehow. And as I said, uh, current sequencing machines provide small randomized fragments of the original DNA sequence called weaves. So you need to map them somehow to answer inter interesting questions, like what is the genetic disposition that you have for some disease? So I, uh, I think Mohammed also uses this for um, uh, like untangling yarn balls, right? You have, <laughs> you have these yarn balls, and you can think of these as different DNAs. And right now you can untangle them nicely, but we don't have a technology to do that. The technology goes through and cuts through all of these, and you somehow need to figure out which yarn ball, which piece belongs to which yarn ball. And of course, this is one example question, right? Sometimes you may want to compare different yarn balls uh, to each other in metagenomics right now. Okay, so these are some choppers. Uh, genome sequencers, and we have a lot of interesting ones, as you can see. Uh, some of these are huge, like this. Some of these are very small, like this. There are even smaller ones. And you can put many small ones together to uh, form a data center or farm of uh, sequencers. Basically, there are more, and all produce data with different uh, properties. And these are more examples on the high throughput uh, domain. So uh, because of these technologies, genome sequencing data has been growing because we are able to actually, we, we have very good technologies uh, from, from a relative perspective. So we're able to actually reduce the cost of sequencing a genome significantly. Uh, you can see in this curve, I'm gonna show this again. As a result, we can generate a lot of genomic data. Then. This is actually a more newer version of that curve. So you can see that this is the cost of a transistor and this is the cost of genomic data sequence. You can see that it's actually reducing much faster than if you go the transistor, which we've been quite successful with. So uh, essentially genomic technology is actually much stronger, let's say sequencing technology is much stronger than our fabrication technologies, which we develop for more longer, I would say. Okay, so I don't want to make more of that, but basically uh, you, have, you can think of uh, the puzzle as you have this reference genome, it gets kind of, uh, uh, bro, uh, you have this reference that you have somehow constructed, and when you sequence someone's genome, you get sequence weeds. And our task is to somehow puzzle, uh, piece together this puzzle. Depending on the analysis, you may want perfect piecing or partial piecing, but in the end, you have to piece together something. Uh, and in the worst case, you may have to piece together the entire uh, genome. And this is uh, the data generator. This is the chopper. Uh, this actually chops, uh, generates data with different characteristics, uh, as we will see soon. It gives you longer reads, relatively longer reads, but uh, it has more error rate compared to some of the bigger choppers we have. And this is a great data generator. This can generate a lot of data at high throughput, low latency. Unfortunately, this device cannot even analyze data. Basically, you have to move the data somewhere uh, to a laptop or to a data center. So, we're, so you can think of these as devices that are distributed all over the world and they're generating lots of data and we're moving all of that data to somewhere to do the process. So there are a lot of overheads uh, that we're incurring globally uh, in data analysis. So uh, this was uh, the, in terms of uh, the read length uh, and the accuracy of the sequencing because you have sequencing errors when you actually do the sequencing. This is where nanopore technology kind of sits. You have longer reads and this is where more traditional high throughput se sequencing technologies sit. They are very short reads, like 100 or 300 base pairs, but their accuracy is much closer to 100%. Not perfectly 100%, but closer. So you can see that they have a trade off. And there are other technologies that are more expensive that sit kind of in the middle, uh, but currently they're expensive. And clearly, developing technology is good. Uh, the question is can we ever reach very long reads and very high accuracy at low cost? We're not there yet. So because of this, uh, sequencing uh, is actually very good today, if you will, with these caveats. But data analysis is very much following. Basically, we need to map what we sequence to a reference genome, for example. And then we can do other studies on it, variant calling, and enable scientific discovery and medical advancements. I'm going through this relatively quickly. Clearly, we don't have a lot of time. But if you're interested in read mapping, for example, how do you map the sequence reads to a reference genome? Even that area is very rich. As you can see, this is a paper that was led by Mohammed, who is here, that talks about uh, 30 years of, maybe more than 30 years of read mapping, as you can see. There are lots of technologies that have been developed. And 
there are some commonalities and there are some differences, which we're not going to be able to get into in this talk. So I'll mention one problem in this talk, which is essentially read mapping. So we're going to go a little bit more detail into read mapping and how to accelerate it. Uh, essentially, uh, basically, the, the problem is the sequencer is too good today. It can generate lots of data, but our computational analysis is slow. So we're really bottlenecked by the computational analysis. These are some numbers that you can find, but it really depends on the analysis also in the end. And basically, we have a huge bottleneck in analyzing. Uh, or mapping uh, the reads into reference genome. And uh, I like this picture actually because uh, we have different technologies that can, we have a special purpose machine for data generation. This is genomic uh, data generation. This case, this is one machine from, from Illumina, but you can actually have lots of nanopore machines all over here. They're specialized, they're very fast, uh, reasonably accurate, but we're, we're moving that data to a very general purpose machines on the right side. Uh, maybe far away. That's what the state of this. And these general purpose machines are not really fit for analyzing the genomic data that's produced over here. So they're not really designed for this purpose. As a result, they have very slow and inefficient processing capability and large amounts of data movement all over the place, all over the world. And I like this picture because unfortunately, this picture is very similar in other domains as well. Video, for example, we generate, if you, if you uh, replace it with a video camera, we can generate lots of video and images all over the world again. And we're doing the same thing, basically. We don't have processing people. Uh, if, you have, if you use web links, that's another thing. On the internet, we generate a lot of data and we're moving it to machines. So we basically have a huge data moon problem. Uh, but genomics is, I think, uh, well, we do actually bad, but <laughs> genomics is pretty bad also. Okay, so I think uh, the problem that we're going to talk a little bit more about is we need to reconstruct the entire genome from many sequenced reads. Uh, that is coming out of this machine. And can we do that quickly? And can we also do that with minimal data movements? And in the end, can we somehow do everything without moving data uh, here, if that's if that makes sense? So you could make it personalized on private also if that machine is, belongs to you, for example, as a human. Okay, so basically that's the problem of read mapping. How do we map many short DNA fragments called reads to a known reference genome with some differences allowed? We have this DNA logically. Physically, it looks like this. We chop it into pieces using the sequencing machine. And we kind of try to figure out where the pieces map in the reference gene. So it's a statistical process in the end. It's not perfect because there are errors when you chop. And there are also variations of this DNA compared to a particular reference genome that was constructed. Okay. And mapping short reads to a reference genome is challenging in the end. And metagenomic analysis makes this worse, actually. You have genetic material directly recovered from environmental samples, for example. You may not have, you may not know what these are, what these references are. Now your task is to kind of classify them, map them to, the, uh, to, the, to a different reference database so that you can figure out what species they may belong to or they may closely relate to, let's say. Clearly this task is a lot harder as you can see. In the previous case, we assumed that we know the reference uh, species. Okay. And basically, this is costly. Uh, people use dynamic programming algorithms, and there are lots of papers that are written on this topic, which I'll let you find out. A lot of them are actually in the read mapping survey that Mohammed led that I mentioned earlier. But this is a nice paper that talks about computational cost. And this is a survey that I just mentioned. Okay, so basically, uh, read mappers today, even though they're optimized, uh, they still spend a lot of time in sequence alignment, more than 60% of the time. This number keeps changing, of course, as you optimize the software. And if you, I'm going to talk about some hardware methods for accelerating this. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the software methods. So what, what does it take to accelerate this? This is a picture from our IEEE micro paper that I mentioned earlier. Basically, uh, there are multiple steps uh, in, uh, in the uh, read mapping pipeline. Uh, indexing the reference genome, for example, is one step. Filtering what is not going to map nicely to the reference genome or different parts of the reference genome is another step. And finally, sequence alignment is another step. And all of these uh, have required software algorithms, clearly. And it's important to optimize the software. But all of these can be accelerated through hardware as well, because they, uh, like uh, sequence alignment, can be accelerated through hardware, FPGAs, et cetera. So we're going to talk about uh, that. And the paper covered a lot more than what I mentioned, and the, the later version covered more. OK, that's the paper. But I should also say that we have a genomics course that uh, Mohammed and John have been leading in the past few years. If you want more information, there's a lot more. And you can also attend the course online on YouTube. Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to skip some parts that I normally talk about. 
I'm going to jump into hardware acceleration. Basically, how can we accelerate this uh, in hardware? I'm going to talk about, as I mentioned, our personal journey. This is a work done by Mohammed some years ago. This is his first paper in his PhD thesis, right? PhD paper. And the idea was basically to accelerate uh, pre alignment in DNA read mapping. I will not go into a lot of detail in any of these papers today. Uh, I don't think Mohammed is going to talk about this even, right? He's going to talk about newer stuff. But basically, the takeaway is uh, by using the configurable architectures that are common today, FPGAs, you can accelerate filtering. And the filtering is the idea that uh, which, which reads should not be considered for which locations in the reference genome? Which ones should you not even compare to in the reference genome? And the, the, the takeaway is that most of the reads that you generate should not be compared to most uh, locations in the reference genome. That's the takeaway. And you can accelerate it much faster by uh, uh, FPGAs. And again, you can read the paper for more detail. This is the first FPGA based filter, and it's real, uh, and the results are real. And these are all freely available online. So people have tried this, people have replicated the results. Since it was relatively old, I'm not going to spend more time on this. So the conclusions over here is that you can greatly speed up read mapping. Uh, at the time, it was 10x compared to the state of the art mapper. And we also envisioned at the time that this can be integrated with a sequencing device. Uh, basically, it can enable real time filtering while sequencing. And it's uh, this sort of hardware acceleration can hopefully pave the way for on device genomic analysis. Okay, there's more, and I'll let you to the paper. But this is an example of algorithm architecture uh, co design. You have the algorithm. Uh, that was developed like using shifted timing distance, Mohammed modified it in different ways, and then we map it to the logic device at the bottom. So, of course, some of the layers you don't go through over here. That's the nice part in reconfigurable computing, uh, but uh, that's the idea over here. I will mention that uh, we, uh, we actually did more work. This is Mohammed's work also. Uh, essentially, uh, different ap approaches to uh, pre alignment filtering that use different algorithms. So uh, I don't want to go into this detail. I want to go into the next one a little bit more detail. But Mohammed is going to talk about this, right? Mohammed, Suji. So I'll let you uh, think uh, when he talks. But I will mention the sneaky snake a little bit because this is an example of uh, algorithmic changes that you can find from different domains that can enable much faster analysis. Uh, and the idea here is that when you have correct alignment, usually you have a sequence of non-overlapping long matches. And this resembles uh, the problem of approximate uh, single net routing problem in the LSI chip layout. Basically, in the LSI chip layout, you have some entrance and you have some exit, if you will, and you want to route some input signal to some, to some output node. And you have to go through essentially uh, some repeaters, if you will. And people have developed algorithms to actually minimize the number of repeaters. And uh, the idea of Sneaky Snake, which Mohammed will talk about in more detail, is to approximate. Uh, reduce the approximate stream matching problem to the single net routing problem in the LSI chip layout. And it turns out this is actually very efficient, as you can see. It's four orders more magnitude, uh, of magnitude more accurate than Shuji and Gatekeeper, which I briefly mentioned. And it can really accelerate state of the art CPU uh, sequence aligners. Okay. And the numbers, Mohammed will go into more detail in a second. First or second talk? Second, second talk. Bit. Second one, yes. Okay, uh, later Donna will also talk about another algorithm architecture co-designed for a different purpose here, approximate stream back matching, uh, uh, not filtering, if you will. Uh, and here, the idea was to actually have a fast and flexible framework that can accelerate multiple steps of genome sequence analysis, not one step. Uh, and this is really the first acceleration framework for genome uh, sequence analysis, uh, approximate stream matching. And this also uses another algorithm. Basically, I think this points to the importance of looking at different types of algorithms that are friendly to designing in hardware. So if you want to accelerate something in hardware, maybe you should not start with the existing algorithms that are commonly used in software. That's certainly one approach, but maybe there are other much better ways of designing algorithms and hardware together. So Donna has been looking at the BiTap algorithm that was developed in the 1990s, for example, that uses simple and bitwise operations to perform approximate stream matching. And this is very friendly to hardware, except it has some shortcomings like you know, how to parallelize it uh, and how to perform traceback were not done uh, with those, in those prior works and Donna added these. And she basically co-designed uh, scale and memory efficient algorithms with low power together with uh, low power and area efficient hardware accelerators. Again, she will talk more about this, so I won't go into more detail, but basically you can do it. There's an accelerator for edge distance calculation over here, and there's an accelerator for traceback and they communicate with each other in some ways. And this is the uh, 
uh, edit distance cal calculation accelerator. It's actually a systolic array based accelerator, and Dama will talk more about this. I like looking at this because some of these accelerators uh, resemble machine learning accelerators, also, at least conceptually. So there may be ways of actually taking advantage of some of the existing machine learning accelerators for these different purposes that we may have. So it's good to have these thoughts in mind. There. So traceback accelerator is actually very specialized uh, for traceback. Again, I'll let Dama talk about it. As I mentioned, it's going to be an overview of us. Some of the talks that are going to be uh, coming. Okay, and the good, uh, we did this work together with Intel actually. So Intel helped a lot in evaluating uh, the uh, area efficiency and performance and uh, the energy of the accelerator. And you can see that uh, the, the amount of additional hardware you need to add to a state of the art Xeon CPU core at the time is not that bad. And power is also not that bad. But you get significant performance improvements on top of this. So there are multiple use cases of genasm. Uh, you can use it for pre-alignment filtering, read alignment, as well as edit distance calculation. Uh, again, uh, I will leave the details to Dalma, but there are also other use cases potentially that we have not investigated in that work, like overlap finding between reads, hash table based indexing, and also even generic texture, right? Because approximate stream matching is actually uh, more general than genomics. It can be applied, applied to text search and there's more that can be sped up. And the numbers look quite good, as you can see, uh, especially compared to software approaches that are common today, like Minimap 2, you get huge speed ups, huge power consumptions, more than 100% uh, X speed up. Uh, and this is kind of expected because we're actually accelerating things with hardware. Okay, what else should I say over here? And yeah. Any questions? So I'll leave this to Dalma. Dalma is going to give multiple talks. Uh, one is going to be on the work that she, she has done uh, during her PhD, this is part of which uh, this is part of it, and then she's going to also talk about some of the works that she's been doing at Bionano Genomics after her PhD. Okay, like here, uh, Joel is going to give a talk on how to make this even better, basically. <laughs> so he figured out that genasm is not good enough, let's say, and overcame uh, genasm limitations uh, with multiple algorithmic changes that are actually accelerated with multiple different types of devices. But, uh, uh, Damla, in her later work, uh, looked into sequence of the graph mapping, which is an area that I investigated as much. Uh, so, in uh, what I've described so far, you get reads and you try to map them to a linear reference sheet. But modern uh, genomics is moving towards more graph based references to represent the variations within a species, for example, because you may not have a single reference genome representing the entire population of humans, for example. Why not have different types of reference genomes uh, encoded together as a graph that uh, also incorporate the variations across human beings, at least the common variations. And that's the idea. Now it turns out the sequence to graph mapping enables a lot more quality because uh, it can uh, these different populations or different variations. But unfortunately, it's a much more difficult problem because computationally now you have to map onto a graph, not onto a sequence. And uh, there, there have been algorithms for this clearly, which some analyzed and showed that they're not, uh, they're bottlenecks, they're not scalable, and there's certainly no prior hardware design. So in her the second uh, major work, she targeted this hardware design, uh, and uh, she basically designed a, a specialized high performance, scalable, low cost uh, algorithm hardware co-design that alleviates bottlenecks and sequence the graph map. And again, I will not go into the details of this, but basically, this is the sequence of graph mapping pipeline that Donald will talk about in more detail. There are a bunch of pre-processing steps where you need to index the graph and construct the graph also. And then you need to analyze the graph, uh, which is based on uh, seeding, filtering, chaining, clustering, and the alignment in the end. And this is the hardware that actually essentially does uh, a lot of those things. Well, especially accelerates this part, not the, not the pre-processing steps. But again, I will leave this to Donna to talk about, but you can see that these are very specialized hardware structures. Uh, they, they can be implemented on FPGA, uh, be implemented on ASIC process. And uh, yeah, there are multiple different parts of the pipeline that gets accelerated using these hardware structures. If you do go through the pain of performance compared to pure software design like graph aligner or VG, uh, in terms of sequence to graph mapping. And also in terms of sequence to graph alignments, you can actually get significant speed ups over at state of the art software. So we compared the different types of software because different types of software uh, tackle the different use cases uh, that we target over here. 
And again, also it's a universal accelerator. So we just we don't just focus on the sequence of graph mapping, but we also do sequence to sequence alignment. The numbers here are lower because clearly there are a lot of specialized accelerators that have been designed for sequence to sequence alignment in the past, including some of our works, but also some of other people's works. Okay, so again, I'll leave this to Domla, but uh, if you cannot uh, wait for Domla, uh, there's another, I don't know what that means here. So, okay, yeah, somehow I missed this. Yeah, you can, if you cannot wait for Domla, you can watch her video online also from this. I'm not going to talk about base calling. Uh, Gagan, who is going to talk next after me, is going to talk about base calling, uh, but we don't have time, so I'm going to skip that up. So let me talk about uh, some more emerging technology. So far, what we've been talking about is, let's say, things that you can build uh, relatively easily uh, today. You have FPGAs, ASICs, GPUs. I think those are interesting, no question about that. But can we do something that fundamentally makes data moment? All of the previous ones are evolving by data moments. I think we need to push the analysis more towards the memory structures, storage structures, and the sensing structures where data is, genomic data is stored and generated. That way you can reduce the data moment bottleneck. So that's what we've been also working on. This is my one of my favorite pictures. Basically, you have this, let's say, very powerful device today. Processing is done only in this chip that has a lot of SRAM, which is memory. The DRAM stores a lot of data. Storage stores a lot of data, sensors generate a lot of data. Unfortunately, they have no processing capability. So you have to bring all of the data all the way into this a small component in this processor chip to process it. This is the data mode bottleneck, basically. And we have we have seen this a lot in the genomic domain. And we're going to have talks that discuss this later. So basically, we would like to accelerate this. And this is a more general approach, but you can actually have genomic data over here. And we want to basically query the genomic data. Uh, to ask questions to it, like the ones we have discussed earlier, and then get results. So there are many, many things that need to be done here that I'm not going to go into detail uh, about because this really changes the paradigm uh, because now the processor is not processing the data, but memory or sensors or storage is processing the data, and there's a lot to do here. But the problem is if you want to get rid of this data moment, you really need to design algorithms, in general bioinformatics algorithms that fit processing in memory. In this case, we talk about mapping and filtering because that's what we've been working on. But there's more. And uh, Gagan is going to talk about this a little bit, I think, uh, on near memory pre alignment filtering. Uh, so uh, Gagan and Mohammed worked together to do to port near memory to uh, the sneaky snake to near memory to do pre alignment filtering in near memory. And uh, basically, we found out that read mapping is heavily bottlenecked by data moves from main memory. And we wanted to perform read mapping near where data is like using specialized logic. So what we did in this work is to redesign the exterior logic of Sneaky Snake to exploit near memory computation capability on real FPJ boards. So this is actually real. You can do this in real systems, and that's what we did, we did together with IBM. And we showed that you can significantly improve performance and efficiency of Sneaky Snake uh, compared to an IBM Power 9 CPU. And you can see the results are quite large, like 20x improvements, 130x improvements. And these are both performance and energy. Okay, and this is the system that where we accelerate. Basically, offload some computation to this FPGA board that has high bandwidth, low latency access to memory, and you have specialized logic near memory, essentially. So that's what you can do today. You can get significant performance energy improvements, uh, and you can read more papers. I'm going to talk more about that. But in the future, I think we have a lot more opportunity. Basically, in the future, if you actually have new devices that can do in-memory computation, they can improve performance even more. Good filter is one example that I'm not going to talk about. I don't think there's a talk also. This is one of the earliest works in this area, actually. And we wanted to actually take advantage of these emerging devices where you have a logic layer and the memory layers on top so that they can accelerate uh, genomic analysis in the logic layer. In this case, it was pre-alignment filtering. So this requires changing the uh, algorithms, changing the data structures, how you represent uh, the reference genome, for example. And again, I will not talk more about this, but I will just say other true three-dimensional technologies are under development, so there's going to be a lot more in this area, in my opinion. Let me briefly talk about in-storage filtering. So memory is big, but a lot of the data that we're dealing with in genomics is not fitting in memory. You try hard to make it fit in memory, you go through a lot of hoops, but it's really a storage problem, in my opinion, going into the future. So we really need to think about storage as well. So this is one work Nika is going to talk about later. And the idea is basically, instead of moving data all the way from the storage system to memory and computation units, uh, why don't we actually eliminate that data moment? So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I know that we don't have a lot of time. But basically, we've done a lot of work to uh, overall as a community to accelerate computation. So computational overhead is reduced, 
But unfortunately, the data model over here does not reduce. We still bring data all the way from the storage system into the computation and then back and forth. So the idea is in this work is to filter reads judiciously in the storage system so that you don't move them. You move only what's necessary, let's say, to main memory caches and the computation. So it looks like this is Victoria. You move very small amount of data. So what do you filter? Again, I think I'll, I'll let Nika talk about that. This is actually important, figuring out how to do this relatively efficiently. Uh, and I'll let uh, Nika talk about that. And I'm going to skip that slide. So basically, there are challenges. The challenge is uh, how do you actually cater for many different types of workloads where you can actually filter different amounts of data? And how do you actually design the storage system such that you take advantage of limited hardware resources? And uh, the results that we have are significant. Uh, depending on the application, we get different types of speed up. But you can see that the speed up can be more than 30x. And the energy reduction can be close to 30x over here. So I think these are very promising results because you improve both performance and energy at the same time by 30x. OK, so Nika will talk more about that. So there's a lot more here that I'm not going to talk about. We keep updating this paper on PIM review that Juan has been uh, contributing a lot to also. And then we have other papers also that we've been writing on processing in memory. And if you're interested in processing in memory in general, there's a lot more to do in this area. And you can follow our PIM course that's led by Juan over here. So let me quickly talk about uh, the, uh, what's happening in industry today in terms of processing in memory. And today, we're actually in a good spot that people are actually designing these processing near memory engines. So this is the Altman company that has processing processors inside the DRAM chip. Samsung, SK Hynix, Samsung and Meta, and Alibaba, they all have processors inside the DRAM chip or on the DRAM module. So basically, people are actually trying to test this concept of putting computation very close to uh, the memory banks. And storage is going to be a lot more, in my opinion. So this is the optimum processing in DRAM engine uh, that has essentially processors and memory next to each other inside the DRAM chip. And these are real. And you can see uh, that we've been testing the system. And Juan has been delivering a lot of lectures. You can see that uh, this is a general purpose processor. So you can offload a lot of computation. And you can watch a lot of presentations from Juan, as well as papers that we have written that summarize the concept and analysis. So I think there's a lot more to do in this sort of system. And we've been actually developing algorithms uh, for this, for sequence alignments. And this doctor is later going to present uh, our work on OpMap that's going to appear. I think it's already appeared in bioinformatics, right? Well, very close to this one. OK. Uh, later, Hayo is also going to talk about uh, how we uh, minimize the data moment in multiple ways by consolidating base calling and read mapping. Uh, and also uh, a non volatile memory based processing in memory in this uh, architecture. Again, I, I don't have time to talk about that. But let me uh, quickly talk about future opportunities and then we're going to conclude. I think uh, there will be new genome sequencing technology, even though you know, these are some relatively new sequencing technologies, nanopore sequencing. We don't quite understand, in my opinion. I think we need to do a lot more over here. But there are also new applications like graph analytics based genomics. Uh, references are getting updated, uh, and we need to develop techniques to actually uh, cater for that. And John is going to talk about that. And we've actually been developing tools like Airlift and PassVMap to uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, past reference updates. And there's also new frontiers that John is going to deliver a talk, I think, at Recon. Is that correct? ISMB. ISMB. Are you not going to talk about the left you call Blank to me. Okay, blank. Okay. I'm not talking about blank. <laughs> Basically, what's happening is we, uh, we have uh, a lot of raw signals also. So maybe read mapping is not that interesting anymore. Uh, maybe, or maybe in some cases it's not interesting. Can we actually uh, directly operate on the raw signal data that's generated by this device and other devices? And that's the idea. So again, this is a teaser. We don't have time to talk about this. And Bono is going to talk about target goal, which actually accelerates uh, some of these analysis. Okay. So there's a lot more to do over here, but I'm going to conclude because we don't have time. Uh, I will conclude, uh, before I fully conclude, I will say that there are things that are happening in industry. So Illumina has been incorporating FPGAs in their platforms, so that they can uh, accelerate analysis. NVIDIA has also been using GPUs in their platforms to accelerate analysis. You can see that, I mean, these are relatively simple things to incorporate, but it's a good thing that people are incorporating them. Uh, and then NVIDIA has been adding more specialized instructions for dynamic programming, which could be used for other things. And Donald is later going to talk about the work that they've been doing in NVIDIA to accelerate genomics. I think these are definitely interesting, but clearly industry is going to be like shorter term oriented uh, 
I think the question is what can we do in the longer term that can really uh, make a huge difference. Okay, so we call our dream. Uh, are we, where are we uh, in our dream? We want to have an embedded device that can perform compressed with genome analysis in real time. We still have a long ways to go, basically, because data is increasing and the things that we want to do in genome analysis is also becoming more sophisticated. We're kind of reading. Uh, it's not, it's a moving target, basically. Our goal has been changing. And we have still a long way to go in terms of energy efficiency, performance, security, and privacy. And we have a huge memory bottleneck that we need to tackle. So let me conclude. I think uh, hopefully I've convinced you that system design for bioinformatics is a critical problem, and there will be many talks to convince you if you're not convinced yet. Uh, and we've talked about especially read mapping in this talk with some deviations. And uh, hopefully uh, you've seen that there are a lot of potential improvements that you can get, and there are many opportunities that are, and there will be even more opportunities going into the future, especially with new sequencing technologies that we need to really understand and analyze, and also with new applications and use cases that I mentioned uh, toward the end. So basically, we have a bright future for genome analysis and hardware software co-design uh, to accelerate it. And again, this was a short version, so if you want a longer version of this talk, there are multiple versions. And as I said, we have the genomics course, PIM course, and also an SSD course that can help you get into this topic. This is where I'll stop. Any questions? You're not too bad on the time. You that we started 17 minutes late. Any questions about you? Yeah. There's, there's no questions. Okay. Now we should probably move past. Okay. People can always ask questions or we email or some other way. We'll be here the entire day. Um, who's next? Gaga. <laughs> okay. Do you want to introduce you? Yeah, maybe I'll introduce Gaga. Gaga, are you there? Uh, hi, Ono. Yes, I'm there. Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, can you share your screen? Uh, yes, I'll do that. Uh, but I need the permission for that. That, I think. I think you should be able to do it now. Yeah, go ahead. According to John, you can do it now. So, let's. I think you're running out of battery over here, John. Looks very low. Yeah, that's not connected perfectly. Can you see my screen now? Okay, now we can see your screen, but we cannot see you. Wait a second. Oh, did I do something that? Okay, that's you. How do we put this down so that we people can see Gagan also? Ah. Okay, side by side. Should we turn off our camera? Um, it's okay, I can make it a bit, but okay. it's not going to, yeah. Okay. I'll pin him. Okay, yeah, if you can. Okay, let me introduce Gagan, who's our next speaker. Uh, Gagan is going to talk about hardware accelerated genome sequencing, a co design approach, which is going to cover multiple works. Uh, that, that he has been doing in this area, uh, including, uh, as I mentioned earlier, accelerating pre-alignment filtering and base calling and more. And uh, part of this work has been a collaboration between uh, our group and AMD, where he is right now. Uh, he's a researcher at AMD. And before that, he was a postdoc at ETH and a PhD student at TU Eindhoven, and also an intern at IBM Research. So he's, he has both industry and academia uh, connections. So Gaga, you can go ahead. Thank you, Honor. People can talk to you right now nicely. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Honor, for the introduction. Um, and I'm really glad to present in this uh, first BioArc workshop. Uh, as Honor mentioned, uh, I'll present two works. Uh, one of them is uh, purely when uh, when I was a postdoctoral researcher at uh, ETH Zurich, and the other one is also a collaboration between AMD and ETH Zurich as well. Um, so I will first start with, uh, I, I don't really need to give like a lot of introduction because Honor gave a really great uh, talk on the overview of complete genome analysis, but still I'll get a bit of refresher. Uh, as we know, until today, there's not a single machine that can read the entire content of genome. So we always have to break down the sequence into smaller chunks. So I would like to go with this slide, which is from uh, Mohammed, uh, one of our works, where we 
uh, see a typical genome analysis pipeline. So there's, we always start from a DNA sample and which we generate from sequencing machine. And then there are different machines, different companies, for example, Illumina, ONT, PacBio. Uh, these are the major companies. And then once we have the genoming data, then we start the genome processing step. And the very first step is base calling, where we convert the raw sequencing data to ACGT uh, DNA base pairs. And for example, like uh, this process over here, I show it from ONT, but similar approaches are used by different companies as well. Then we go through a complete pipeline of uh, steps to perform read mapping to locate each read sequence in a reference genome. So where we perform indexing, seeding, pre-alignment filtering, and sequence alignment. And like uh, Oro mentioned, traditionally, there have been a lot of research on re read mapping, especially the sequence alignment part. So we were also interested in focusing on the previous steps before sequence alignment because they can also become bottleneck. So in the very first work, we focused on base calling. Um, as I mentioned, it's the very first step in the genomic analysis where we use modern base callers are using like complex deep learning based models. So for example, you have a sequencer, uh, you give an input squig uh, squiggle and then you pass through like complex deep learning based models to uh, in the end to map it to an ACGT base pair. And there's not really one to one mapping between the input signal and the out output characteristics. So the overall sequence can only be decoded by aggregating over multiple time steps. So it's a bit complicated problem. So we were interested in accelerating and analyzing these deep learning based base callers. So in the very first step, we wanted to see like how these models perform if we prune a part of the model. So pruning is nothing but it's like a model compression technique. Uh, where we discard network connections that are not really important to the performance. So if over here you see one of the, the state-of-the-art base colors, which is Bonito, which is an open source base color from ONT, um, on the x-axis is the sparsity. Sparsity means like how much pruning we perform. So if we do 100% pruning, it means we remove complete weights of a neural network. And 0% is we don't really remove anything. On, and on the y-axis is the accuracy. And the higher, the better. Uh, we perform two different ways of pruning. One is structured pruning and the other one is unstructured pruning. Um, unstructured pruning is that we don't really keep the structure and we just prune randomly from anywhere uh, from different layers of neural network. Uh, this kind of pruning leads to really high sparsity, but with this pruning, we know how much of the model is really not important. So which con contributes very little to the model's inference or the accuracy. And structured pruning is more hardware friendly because we retain the structure so you can accelerate it quite well on any accelerator. Uh, and then we also have the figure which uh, correlates to the model size over here. So when we perform pruning or unstructured pruning, how the model size changes. And we observe like even when we perform like 30% of pruning uh, for this model, we, we see still the accuracy remains the same, which means like we can get rid of 30% of model using structured pruning. However, when we go for unstructured pruning, this is this becomes 85%. So we can get rid of 85% of the model and still we get the same accuracy, which is a lot. Um, and we, if we see the, like compare it to the model size, we can get over 6.6 6 .6 times lower model without any losing, uh, loss in accuracy. And then if you wanna further push the limits, like if you wanna analyze how much more we can prune, we see with structured pruning, we can still do 60% of pruning and still we, the model is able to uh, perform base calling with 72% accuracy. And with unstructured, it's 97% and still we get 81% of accuracy, which is a lot still. So it means like we just, 3% of the model, we are performing base calling and still we are getting 81% accuracy. And for and if we see the model size, now we are left with only like 33.3 times lower model. This is because often these base callers are adapted from speech recognition domain. It's because the problem is kind of similar. We have like an input signal, which could be a speech, and then we need to map it to a, a, a vocabulary, which in our case is ACGT signals. And in speech recognition domain, the, the vocabulary is quite bigger and higher. So often we need like way bigger models. But over here, in, if you just take the model from speech recognition domain and apply it in, into base calling, it leads to often over-parameterized model, and we don't really need that. And when we go for hardware acceleration, an important uh, effect is to analyze the quantization. So quantization is like reduction of the bit width precision at which the calculations are performed. So in neural network, we quantize both the activations and the, and the weights. Over here, I have an example of uh, 
of one of the organisms on the x-axis you are seeing the quantization of weights and activation using like different bridge precisions and on the y-axis we have the accuracy and we have a similar plot for like model size how the model size changes with different precisions and we observe even when we go like four times lower still we get the almost the same accuracy so there's not really loss in any accuracy and in this case we are using the the same uh, precision for all the layers, but we could also have designs where we could have different precisions for different layers, and we can have a mixed precision architecture. And even if we go lower, like we use four bits, still we hardly see any loss in accuracy. And even with the, the lowest one, which we evaluated, which is three bits uh, for weights and two bits for activation, still we are able to base call with 82% of accuracy, which shows like we really need to uh, quantize this model and still we don't really lose a lot of information. Because, and however, most of the base colors are using floating point precision to represent each of these neural network layers. So there's really a lot of room for improvement to accelerate this process. However, to be fair, it's quite a complicated process. It's not just easy that you can just bring a model from a speech domain and apply it here, because there are so many considerations you need to think about, like different uh, uh, neural network modules, different layers, configuration of the layers. It could be uh, different kernel sizes, what sort of convolution, what sort of group size. So there's a lot of stuff. And, and then if we throw quantization into the picture as well, the, the design space really explodes. So that's why in our work, we our goal was to overcome these issues by developing a comprehensive framework that allows optimizing uh, and specializing deep learning based base scholars with high efficiency and performance. To this end, in this work, we introduced Rubicon, which is the first framework for specializing and optimizing a machine learning based base scholar for a specific hardware. Um, we developed Rubicon using two key uh, machine learning mechanism. Uh, the first one we call it as QBAS, which is the quantization of air base calling architecture search, uh, which allows you to specialize a base color architecture for hardware implementation. And in the second mechanism, we provide skip clip, which allows us to remove skip connections or residual connections, which are quite popular now in, um, and they are present in a lot of base colors. But, and when you're trying to accelerate, it helps you to reduce the resource and storage requirement without any loss in accuracy. So I'll briefly go over uh, uh, Cubas. Cubas is uh, it's a framework that automates the process of finding efficient and high performance hardware aware genomic base scholars. And in Cubas, we use neural architecture search to evaluate millions of different base color options. So in, in neural architecture search, what we do is we always first define a search space that consists of all the different options. Like I mentioned before, there could be uh, different uh, modules, whether we want to use a convolution or, or LSTM or like kernel sizes or the size of uh, the, the type of quantization. That's our search space. And then we uh, choose a search strategy, which picks one model out of this search space. And then we perform uh, like performance estimation of the, the chosen model. And then we keep on doing this pro process and provide a feedback to the search strategy. And in the end, like once we find this optimal model, we use it as our final model. And this process helps us to evaluate millions or billions of options. So if I go in over like how it looks like in a Cuba uh, uh, search space, so we what we did, we defined the search space as a sequentially connected blocks where each block receives input from its direct previous block. And in, in, in this search space, like I mentioned, our goal is not just to find the, uh, the, the neural network module, but also to find like which precision is the best for weights and activation. And I like, like I mentioned, adding quantization into the picture, uh, the search space explodes. It's like we have billions of more options. And then we add, uh, during the, the QBAS, we need to provide the, the raw sequencing data, which comes from ONT, and they are like a lot of open source data sets, uh, so that we go with the data sets and we update the model weights during the search process. And then we provide hardware constraints in terms of latency or in terms of throughput. So which, uh, and you can also specify like what sort of um, a latency would you like to achieve? Would you want to go for a rather inaccurate model, but uh, it's able to satisfy a latency constraint, or you don't really care about the, the latency and you would like like a highly accurate model. So you can provide this uh, in, in the hardware constraint. And then during the search phase, we enable different edges and updates the, the architectural weights. 
Um, and so we go over different connections and we choose over uh, different modules. And for, for example, over here, we have the first uh, module, which is a uh, eight by eight uh, quantized one D convolution, which is connected to another eight by four convolution. And then in the end, we have identity. Identity is nothing, but it's just, uh, you just map the input to the output. So you can easily remove this block. So this kind of search space also helps us getting remote, uh, like removing uh, multiple blocks as well. So in the end, if you see why we are really uh, not just trying to quantize the complete uh, model into a single uh, quantization uh, space, but we for each layer, we are using a different quantization. So it really leads to a completely mixed precision architecture. And now I'll go over our uh, second uh, block, which is Kip Clip. As I mentioned, like now in deep learning uh, based networks, uh, we often have skip connection or residuals, for example, over here, uh, which help to mitigate the vanishing gradient problems. And so they help with to improve the accuracy. And so we see like a lot of base scholars have also started having a lot of skip connections. But if we think from hardware point of view, it's not really good to have these skip connections because they increase the data lifetime. So if we have to uh, store the data somewhere because we need to feed it later. So they, so we will have to buffer it. Like we need like more storage, and also additionally, these layers need to match the channel sizes. So you perform additional computation, and and also it uh, it leads to irregularity because we have these connections which could span like multiple layers. It could be like ten layers as well. So they're not really good from hardware acceleration point of view. So that's why we wanted to get rid of these uh, connections. So we pro we provided a, another module, which we call as skip clip, which helps you remove uh, skip connection, which are present in the base colors. And for this process, we use knowledge distillation. So in knowledge distillation, what we do, we have like a pre-trained uh, model, which is which we call as a teacher network. So for example, you take your uh, unpruned, completely off the shelf model, and then we take a student network. For example, over here, we have a model that comes out of QBAS. And then what we want to do is like, we want to teach our student network to mimic how the teacher network uh, behaves. So what we do, we, we perform, we start the skip clip process. So in the first epoch, um, we perform forward pass for both of the, for, for the networks and use the, the loss from the teacher network to update the weights of the student network. Um, and this way, we are just doing the backward pass for the student network. And then in the next epoch, we remove one of the skip connections from the student network and we train for the entire epoch. And then we do the similar way. We go for the next epoch and then we remove another skip connection. And we keep on doing this process until we get rid of all the, the blocks. And then we do several steps of fine tuning so that we are able to recover uh, the lost inaccuracy. And we observe if we do it this way, we are able to remove all the skip connection. So in the end, skip uh, skip clips gets the best of both worlds that we are getting a highly accurate model and the topic uh, topo topology is quite regular. So we can really easily accelerate on uh, on a, any hardware accelerator. And these two blocks are like, we, we, we can use it together or separately. They're independent of each other. And then using these two blocks, we developed uh, an example base color, which we call as Ruby call, which was developed using QBAS and skip clip uh, techniques. Um, if you see over here, Ruby call has uh, uh, multiple blocks, which are all of them are quantized. And we observe that the lower blocks, the earlier blocks use higher precision, which are using like 16 by 16 for bots and weight and activation. While for the, for the later blocks, we only have eight, eight bits or four bits. Uh, which which makes sense because if you think about it, like from the uh, uh, if you see from the input side, we have an analog signal which requires more precision. But on the on the output side, we just only need to map it to ACGT base pairs, so we can really do it with a lower precision. So QBAS is able to learn these kind of techniques, so it it really performs hardware aware and also algorithmic aware search. And in the end, we have a CTC block, which decodes the nucleotides to map it to ACGT base pair. So in the end, we have a really mixed precision architecture. And then we wanted to compare this architecture with other base scholars out there to see like how good or bad like our search uh, algorithm was. So we compare with five state of the art base scholars like from ONT and other open source base scholars like uh, uh, essay call, which uses a transformer, and Dorado Fast, which is quite state of the art, where they're using LibTorch 
um, to uh, to use the tensor cores, uh, but it's basically it's like a Bonito version of uh, um, the CRF model where they're using RNN. And then we evaluate two different versions of Rubicol. One is Rubicol MP, which is the mixed precision uh, 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 version, which I showed before. And then we also analyze the uh, Rubicon FP, which is just using like traditionally like floating point precision. So you can easily use it on any GPU. And first we show the base calling throughput. Uh, so on the x-axis is uh, different species and on the y-axis is the base calling throughput. And we compare with different um, uh, base uh, baselines. Um, if we see, like if we compare to Dorado, which is the, the state of the art fastest uh, base caller, we observe that Rubicol MP outperformed Dorado by 3.9x, uh, which is because we are really using mixed precision, not just like a single specific precision for all of the cores. And then if we compare Rubicon MP with like Rubicon FP, which is using floating point precision, just by going to a mixed precision uh, architecture, we are able to get 63x higher performance, and which is quite amazing compared to other uh, base color, which are still using floating point precision. And then we also perform hardware code design, and that really helps to accelerate the performance. And so if we compare with all of the uh, base colors, uh, Rubicol is consistently outperforming all the evaluated base colors. And then we also wanted to see like the accuracy because that's also an important metric. And over here, we just have Rubicol, uh, we, instead of Rubicol MP or FP because they use the same model architecture and in the end we get the same accuracy. So we just show Rubicol. Um, so Rubicol provides uh, 2.97 higher accuracy than Dorado Fast. So it's not just the accuracy, uh, the speed, but also accuracy compared to the Dorado Fast version, which is the fastest base caller. And then if we compare with a hand-tuned um, uh, expert design model, which is the Bonito model, uh, which is uh, from ONT, we call it as expert design model because this model has the same backend as our model. Um, we get way higher performance uh, in both the versions, like in the floating point version and also the MP version, which is the mixed precision version. And we get similar accuracy for like similar gains compared to other baseline uh, uh, approaches. So if we want to compare the overall results, so we have we want to plot it in terms of uh, different metrics to get a Pareto plot. Uh, so we have uh, base calling throughput on the y-axis and on the x-axis, the parameters, how many parameters are there. So parameters kind of correlate with how many, uh, how much calculation or multiplications, the convolutions you need to perform. And then we, we do it like similar for the model size. So the lower, the better on the x-axis. And then we have another metric, which is the base calling accuracy. We plotted the base calling accuracy in the in the reverse order. So if you see the, the Pareto point always lies on the left side, uh, the higher, the better. And if you see for the for the parameters, Dorado Fast has the lowest amount of parameters, but still uh, it gives lower accuracy, low, lower throughput. This is because Rubicol MP is using like really diff, like uh, low, lower precision than what Dorado can do. And still it's providing way higher performance. And we see a similar trend for the model size. However, if we compare to the to the accuracy, as I mentioned before, we are getting a 2.9% higher accuracy with using Rubicol. So Rubicol provides the ability to base call accurately, quickly, and efficiently. So it can easily uh, lead to reduction in model size and neural uh, network model parameters. So in our second work, I'll quickly go over the pre-alignment filtering work. Uh, which Ono mentioned. This work was mentioned, uh, which, which was published in IEEE Micro. As Ono mentioned, like we spent a lot of time, execution time on read mapping, uh, almost which is mostly on dynamic map, uh, dynamic programming step. How, however, overwhelming amount of these candidate locations are dissimilar, so we have to discard it. So it doesn't really make sense to perform this uh, uh, this dynamic programming step. So if we can get rid of these dissimilar uh, uh, candidates before, it would really help accelerate the read mapping step. So therefore, we have these pre-alignment filters that do exactly the same. And the sneaky snake is state-of-the-art pre-alignment filter, which is from uh, our group from uh, Mohammed. Uh, and the key idea will give a really high idea about like what how this uh, accelerates pre-alignment filtering is by approximating the edit distance calculation. Uh, which is similar to a single net routing problem in VLSI. So, for example, we have a VLSI chip over here. 
and we when we dissect it, then we can find some components and link around the chip. And the problem becomes similar to like the, the snake tra traversal through a maze. So the snake wants to go out of the chip layout or, or the maze, and we need to find the, the shortest path, uh, how the snake can progress. And uh, there are like more details about probably which Mohammed will discuss about. And in this work, our goal was to analyze the performance of this sneaky snake on, on a server grid system and see how we can uh, accelerate this uh, algorithm. So we over here, we have a roof line plot. On the x-axis is the arithmetic intensity, and on the y-axis is the performance. If we plot the sneaky snake on this power nine system, we observe that this algorithm is heavily memory, memory bound and it has complex memory access patterns. Therefore, it leads to limited uh, performance and high energy consumption on CPU based system. And so therefore, our goal in this work was to mitigate the performance bottleneck of these modern pre alignment filtering in an energy efficient way. And we also wanted to evaluate near memory acceleration on real hardware using state of the art interfaces like open CAPI. So in this work, we built a near memory, the first near memory pre-alignment filtering accelerator using an actual system, which was connected to, uh, which we have a power nine system with an HPM based uh, FPGA board. Um, and we optimized this accelerator using data centric caching scheme where we have heterogeneous memory hierarchy using URAM, BRAM, HPM. And we evaluate different systems as well, not just HPM, but we also evaluate the tra uh, traditional DDR4-based system. We evaluate different interconnect technologies like CAPI2, OpenCAPI. And we also try like scaling of processing elements using a single channel or multiple channels because these HBM-based uh, uh, boats, they provide a lot of channels, like up to 32 channels, which, which we can exploit. So we wanted to study all these different characteristics of the model, uh, of, the, of the boat. So in our contribution, we also include the scalability analysis. Uh, so if you see over here, we have the performance results for runtime uh, for a number of different number of processing elements on the X axis. And we have different configurations using HBM, using open CAPI interface, or if you're using multiple channels or single channel, um, or using different, uh, uh, like, or, or we are using DDR4 technology. And we also do a comparison for energy efficiency similarly. And then we observe that near memory acceleration improves performance and energy efficiency by up to 27x and 133x respectively over the complete CPU based system. And we also provide a lot of insights and observations. For example, this HPM designs, uh, they can avoid the memory excess congestion, which is typical in DDR4 based FPGA design if we scale properly with the number of channels available. And then we open source our design and you please feel free to try out on our GitHub page. Um, so there are many more details, and I recommend you to read our IEEE micro paper for that. Uh, before I conclude, I would like to come back to this nice picture. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, we accelerate two steps in the pipeline and demonstrate like great results. However, like Owner was mentioning, mentioning before, the task is still not over. There's still a long way to go because the ultimate goal would be to perform end-to-end -end genome sequencing uh, sequencing pipeline on a single device rather than using different state-of-the-art approaches where we perform different steps. And we are seeing in industry and in academia a process a progress towards that direction. At the end, I would like to acknowledge the help and support from everyone. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gagan. Thanks Any so questions much. to Gagan? Sorry, I went a bit over time. Yeah, yeah, but uh, we had some connection issues, so we couldn't catch you everywhere. Hopefully, it was better on YouTube. Okay. I think it was better on YouTube. Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. I assume there are no questions. Do you have any questions? You can tell one question. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hey, Gagan. Uh, so I have one quick question. Uh, you were showing these um, Rubicon um, FP and I guess MP results. Right. Uh, and FP looked significantly slower right. uh, than the other one. And they and you said the, their accuracy is same. So right. could you quickly describe what are the potential use cases of F FP if the accuracy is same, but it's slower? Right. It, it's a good question. First, I'll mention like why the accuracy is same because uh, in our like 
our goal was to keep like throughout this uh, when we were trying to develop a example base color our goal was to keep the accuracy same it doesn't matter if we go for lower precision or uh, or we prune the model and that's what we observe from our uh like the motivation slides which i showed that we can really get push the accuracy push the the quantization and still keep the accuracy and why we and that's why with these two models we always get the same accuracy and the potential use case for this FP is that you can really use it out of the, the box on any GPU. So because like we are using a lot of these um, um, base colors on GPU right now. So that's why we build like one FP version. So you can run on uh, GPU while for the MP, it's like mixed precision. So right now we don't really have the support on the GPU to exploit from at least from the high level library, like from PyTorch or uh, TensorFlow, you can't really accelerate like a mixed precision dynamically adaptive uh, low precision cores. So that's why we, uh, and I mean, if you use like a libtorch, which is like a C++ interface to the tensor cores, then you can exploit these uh, uh, low precision units. But at the moment, it's not possible. That's why we wanted to have two different versions. So that one is like kind of a bit more um, specialized. So you see what you can achieve. And the other one is more like what you can use out of the box. And it kind of shows like what you're missing on, like amount of performance which you are losing just by staying on floating point. And if we see like uh, like ONT has already started moving towards using LibTorch so that they can exploit these low precision units. So we see that even these companies are realizing that we need to kind of move towards uh, uh, getting squeezing every inch of performance from it. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gagan. Thanks, John. Okay, thanks, Gagan. Uh, I think we should move to the next talk since we don't have much time. Uh, next up is Leonid. Leonid, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, we can hear you and see you also. Very good. Uh, okay, let me introduce you quickly. Uh, so Leonid is uh, with Bar Ilan University. Uh, before that, he was at Technion. He was at the Technion. He's been doing uh, work on genomic acceleration using especially new technologies like RM in the past. And he's going to talk about some of the work that he's been doing on hardware accelerated detection and classification of pathogens of epidemic significance. So Leonid, please go ahead. Right. Thank you very much. I'll uh, try to be uh, quick. Um, so... Uh, Good morning, everybody. And uh, Ramadan Karim to our Muslim participants. Let me give you a quick um, introduction to uh, our lab. It's called Enix with the engineering department of Berlin University. We have six faculty members and 100 re uh, researchers and students including grads and, under, and undergrads. Uh, many uh, uh, research topics, which I'm not gonna cover, you can take a look. I mean, it's easier to find things which are which we're not interested in. Um, an interesting fact about Enix, uh, 50 plus tape outs in eight years of its existence. Uh, some of those chips, are a large system on chips with application processors and several um, heterogeneous components. So that's 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 an interesting operation and uh, something worth uh, looking at. Um, first, let me start with the motivation, and I have a very long motivation, which is divided in several parts. The first one is. Uh, viral pandemics, uh, like the one that we have uh, uh, completed recently, or maybe we just learned to live with that because it's uh, still lurking out there. We just kind of pretend it's not there, but it but it is there. But let's imagine that in a few short years, the world is struck again by a new viral pandemic. Many, many people agree that it's going to happen. We don't know when exactly, but there's very little doubt it's going to happen again. And let's assume that in this new pandemic, the virus is gonna mutate as quickly as it did in uh, COVID-19 pandemic, creating 
many, many hundreds, maybe thousands of viral uh, variants and lineages. One of the lessons uh, of COVID-19 is that uh, polymerase chain reaction test, which is the main diagnostic tools used today is not really adequate for uh, serious variant discovery because first it doesn't know, uh, it cannot discover new variants. And second, to classify a newly uh, obtained samples into existing lineages of families, it requires so-called primers to be designed per lineage. And that's an, an expensive and very, very lengthy process. So uh, assuming that PCR can be used for classifying a viral genome into hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, existing lineages, that's kind of impractical. So the ultimate solution for that is uh, DNA sequencing and then uh, computational analysis. Now, the problem here is that this is a very large scale task. Again, uh, based on the lessons from COVID-19 uh, pandemics, we can easily assume that uh, we're gonna test hundreds of millions of people daily during the next viral pandemic, of which you know, 10, 15% may uh, uh, test positive, of which we're gonna again sequence 10 to 15% to create statistically, statistically significant results. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands, potentially millions, maybe even tens of millions of viral genomes sequenced daily. Again, it's not something which is completely unreasonable given the progress of sequencing technologies. And we would have to process all those newly sequenced genomes in as wide context as possible because it's not uh, gonna work out if we only will compare a newly sequenced genome with one single reference. Uh, we know that now. So that's, a, again, a problem of very, very large scale. Another motivational component is called sepsis, which is a quick blood infection that typically happens, for example, in a hospital environment where people undergo surgeries and all kinds of procedures when their uh, immune systems is weakened. So it's uh, completely plausible that a person can undergo a complex operation and come out just fine and then develop a blood infection, which can cause uh, severe illness or death. Um, I, was, I was amazed myself when I learned that up to half of hospital death in the United States alone are caused by sepsis. Now, in sepsis, uh, early identification of the microbial pathogen that is responsible for this infection is absolutely critical. If we cannot find out quickly uh, the uh, nature of the pathogen, quickly meaning in hours, maybe a day, then it just might be too late. And what happens in real life, not only we cannot identify them quickly, in third of the cases, the underlying pathogen is not even identified. So the result is the result is that antibiotic treatment is not pathogen targeted. It's uh, rather more epidemiological, meaning you know you just decide on treatment based on what goes around these days. And um, uh, all these uh, clearly leads to uh, antimicrobial abuse and overuse which again leads to our third motivational component, which is uh, uh, closely, uh, closely linked to the second one, and that's called AMR, antimicrobial resistance. And that's an overly uh, uh, continuously escalating global crisis, which might not be as uh, uh, well known as viral pandemic, but it's uh, probably as dangerous, maybe even more dangerous. Uh, World Health Organization, for example, uh, uh, defines AMR as one of the top global, global public health threats that are facing humanity. AMR causes uh, at least 700,000 deaths a year, 
and is expected to grow extremely significantly in the next 25, 30 years. Again, AMR is caused by our inability, excuse me, I mean, it's not caused by our inability, but one of the reasons for AMR is our inability to understand quickly, to identify, to identify quickly microbial pathogens that cause all kinds of infections and inflammations. And as a result, uh, the treatment again is more epidemiological than pathogen direct, uh, a, a pathogen uh, uh, related. And then uh, antimicrobials are overused and abused, which lead to more AMR. So to summarize uh, the pain, uh, accurate pathogen detection and classification is a time critical problem, both in viral pandemics, when we talk about viral pathogen and in a antimicrobial resistance in all kinds of blood infections, in all, in all kinds of uh, bacterial infections in general, again, time critical. It's a problem of very large scale especially in viral pandemic, where we have uh, tens and hundreds of millions of uh, test samples daily, but also in, uh, in, 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 in bacterial pathogen, uh, because you know, it happens everywhere in the world, in every hospital, in every clinic, to every patient. Traditional methods, which range from uh, PCR and then, you know, petri dishes and growing samples and growing cultures. Through the computational methods that are in use today, they are either prohibitively slow, even on high performance computer infrastructure, or they trade accuracy for speed, which make them uh, less accurate. So that's, that's the pain that we would like to resolve. Uh, our solution is a real-time hardware accelerated pathogen classifier. It's hardware accelerated because as we know, as owner explained to us very eloquently, uh, it's unhealthy to have a special purpose machine to generate data and to have a general purpose machine to crunch it. So to work as fast as the sequencer does, we need a hardware accelerated solution. The input to this solution, to this platform would be a set or a stream of unaligned DNA reads, which are sourced from a metagenomic sample. Well, that's the real life scenario when we have a sample which contains mainly the host DNA, a host DNA but also lots of DNAs of uh, all other organisms. Uh, that can be found in blood or spot or uh, urine sample. And some of those organisms can be, you know, pre-processed, excuse me. Some of those DNAs can be uh, amplified, for example, some maybe not. So uh, we need to deal with metagenomic samples and we preferably don't want to Preferably, we don't want to align the reads and assemble the genome to apply the classification. And yet the output, the output we want to first detect the pathogen, the target pathogen that we're looking for, or several target pathogens. We want to classify the pathogens that, that are found in a sample into existing classes or to signal that a new variant, for example, of a viral uh, of a viral pathogen uh, is discovered, or we want to profile the pathogens. If there are several bacterial and viral pathogens in a sample, we want to, you know, like profile, build a profile of uh, pathogens that we find. The requirements for such a platform would be uh, real-time operation. Uh, so if we're talking about nanopore, uh, base sequencer that would be at the speed of sequencer. And if it's a Illumina class sequencer, then you know as fast as possible. And we would obviously require high accuracy and all those criteria that comes with accuracy, sensitivity, precision, specificity, all of those. And we would envision this classifier as a portable 
device, it's not the only embodiment, obviously, but the preferable embodiment is a portable device which works in conjunction with a portable sequencer and provides a, the answer quickly and accurately in a uh, field environment, for example, in small clinics, in labs, everywhere where uh, samples are tested. That's the idea. Uh, two different solutions which we have come up with and I can uh, uh, discuss here. So it's a little busy slide. So let's look at the right top uh, angle first. So this solution is based on a special kind of memory, which is called an associative or content addressable memory. And to some of you, or maybe most of you who don't know what that is, so in uh, addition to read and write, content addressable memory, unlike normal random addressable memory, can also search or look up or compare a search pattern with the entire content of the memory in a single clock cycle. So it allows you a very, very quick search. Um, associative access is used everywhere in computer architecture. You know, everybody knows what cache is. So cache, for example, is a kind of associative memory, maybe not fully associative, but it's a kind of associative memory where we perform a search operation, we search for a tag in every cycle. So the solution that I am talking about here is called Humming Distance um, Tolerant Content Resume Memory, or HDCAM, and a pathogen identifier which is based on this HDCAM. So here at the center, that's the you know, illustration of a classification pipeline based on HDCAM. So we have a sample and we have a sequencer and we have a bunch of unaligned DNA reads and we feed them into HDCAM, which prior to that, uh, uh, we where prior to that, we built a reference database and the reference database, again, built offline, placed in the HDCAM, which is a memory. And the reference database can be uh, built linearly or as a graph, and it can contain, contain several species of bacterial and, uh, um, and viral pathogen, uh, can be built using KMERS, for example, or I mean, other DNA fragments. We don't need to go into that right now. Uh, this is more of a circuit work you know, rather than algorithmic work. So most of the uh, innovation here is in the circuit, at the circuit level. Um, this design was actually uh, taped out. So we have a silicon prototype for this design. And at the bottom, you can see that's the chip. It's actually a multi-project chip of the kind that I was talking about earlier that we tape out in Enix. So it has, I think like 12 different student projects. One of those is HDCOM. And this is a uh, evaluation setup. So that's something which exists in silicon and we are developing a bunch of different applications which have to do with genome classification, both in viral and bacterial uh, directions on this silicon prototype. Another solution that I would like to briefly cover is called EDAM, which is an edit distance tolerant uh, pathogen classifier. And unlike HDCOM, which tolerates Hammond distance, which allows it to uh, uh, tolerate sequencing errors and small variations, EDAM is utilizing the observation that most uh, AD, excuse me, well, not errors, most, most errors and, and variations in DNA are, are actually edits, not simply replacements. And what you can see here in the middle part, it's an illustration of how a single edit can create a huge Hamming distance. So if we want to tolerate edits, tolerating Hamming distance is not enough. We need to build a special, uh, special hardware which uh, accounts for edit distance, not just humming distance. And that's what we did here. 
Again, I'm not going in deep into design. So here in the center, we have a similar looking uh, pathogen pipeline, but the solution over here is based on any distance tolerant uh, memory structure rather than having distance tolerant. Here at the uh, bottom right, you can see the base cell, which is kind of complex, uh, very large. So it's uh, not easy to scale for which we have a different solution, which is based on resistive memory uh, that allows much more uh, dense implementation. And at the bottom in the center, you have uh, a quick comparison of EDAM uh, performance, meaning actually uh, accuracy, precision, uh, precision uh, sensitivity, and F1 score compared to a to, to Kraken, which uh, arguably mo uh, one of the most popular classifiers today. It's a software tool, uh, and what you see here is uh, sensitivity again, precision, and F1 score uh, versus EDAM. Uh, edit distance threshold, the ability to tolerate edits. And if you look at F1 score, for example, there is a clear uh, optimum point at which we strongly outperform Kraken, again, because Kraken uses uh, exact matching versus database, and we allow edit distance, uh, which uh, uh, contributes to both sensitivity and precision and ultimately leads to a higher F1 score. Um, that's about it. Just one last uh, message here. Uh, we have a uh, sister workshop, which is called AACBB, Accelerator Architecture in Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, which happens in uh, um, conjunction with ISCA conference in June, and that's actually the same day as uh, owners uh, uh, PIM tutorial. So uh, please consider contributing and participating in this workshop. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Leonid, for the nice talk. It would be better to see you in person here, but I know you're yeah. teaching, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Any questions to Leonid? Actually, I have a question. Uh, why RRAM for the last work you mentioned? Why? Well, yeah. Why resist the RAM? Uh, only because of, uh, only because of uh, density. Okay, so, I see. Yeah, for example, if you look at EDAM and you have to go and look left and right to make sure you account for edits, in VRAM, you can simply uh, create three different copies of the same fragment. One is like centerpiece, one shifted left and one shifted right. And because it's so dense, you can do it in a single cell. So you uh, not only getting a denser solution, you also lose all these finding connections left and right which create the wire, you know, wire bound situations. So that's, that's the reason. Okay. Okay. It makes sense. Basically you get a lot more density. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? My pleasure. From the audience. Yeah. I will reiterate that if you want to go to ISCA, uh, Leonid's workshop is definitely worth submitting to. And I've participated in that workshop many times. I intend to be present in two workshops this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, we're, okay. we're looking, we're looking, we're looking to seeing you in both. Yes. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Leonid, again. Uh, now we'll transition to the next talk. Next up, we have Mohammed while he's setting up. I've already mentioned several works of Mohammed in my talk. Mohammed has been doing hardware acceleration of genomics for a long time now starting with Gatekeeper. And his PhD thesis was on this topic at Bill Kent, co-advised by John Alcan and myself. And then he joined ETH as a postdoc and a senior researcher and a lecturer. And he's been here for some time now. And he's been 
doing a lot of work on this topic, as well as other topics in bioinformatics. So uh, he's going, yeah, he's going to talk about. In this talk, he's going to talk about something different, actually, not hardware acceleration, but getting rid of, let's say, uh, some of the data in our analyses, uh, which we call sparsified genomics. And he's going to give an example implementation of it called genome on diet. I think this is a very promising direction to examine going into the future. And I believe it's very amenable to hardware acceleration, although I'm not sure if he's going to talk about that today. Okay, you already have your much other for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here in Istanbul again. Uh, so good morning everyone. Wait a minute until the logistics is completed. Thanks John. All right. I hope everyone can hear me on YouTube, Zoom. Muhammad can hear you. Perfect, thanks. Okay, so today we'll be talking about genome and diet, how we can handle very large scale genomic analyses via sparsified genomics. And it's one way to reduce the data, mo uh, data movement of problems. So as Honor introduced already the genome sequencing machines, they are rapidly growing with the high throughput, you can get a huge amount of data with very short time. Regardless of the, the sequencing technology, it could be OMT, Nanopore, or PacBio, HiFi, or Alumni. However, we still use general purpose computing uh, systems to do the analysis, and that causes the problem. Because those are specialized for the job that they are doing. With A slow component And we tried to understand the uh, several work that we did on GPU FPGA acceleration as accelerators to support some systematic operation at the processor side. Was good. You can continue. However, we are not solving the data movement problem yet with the GPU and the FPGA uh, accelerators. Why is that? Because we still need to move the data from the sequencer to the storage, to the main memory, through uh, bandwidth limited buses, and, as well as power hungry uh, communication, which are off chip. So we need to move the data from several places all the way to the accelerator or the CPU itself. And that is the major bottleneck in current computer systems. Why is that? Because the data movement alone accounts for about 60% of the total system energy. That's without doing any computation, just trying to transfer the data to the processor or to the accelerator. And what we did next is to try to do the paradigm shift. So instead of using the GPU and FPGA or regular accelerator, we try to move one further step closer to the data where it reside, reside either in the memory system or the storage itself. And we have several work around that direction. And in most of this work, we already demonstrate a great performance of energy efficiency by one to three orders of magnitudes. However, we said, we asked ourselves a question, can we do something else that even the CPU algorithm can benefit from that? So without doing processing in memory, for example, uh, Hopefully, by that magic solution, can we also benefit both hardware accelerators as well as software solutions? And this is our goal. We would like to reduce the execution time, the memory, the storage footprint via sparsified genomics. And what is sparsified genomics? I have this little example, hopefully can clarify the things. Think about this genomic sequence. I would like to have another copy of it. Exactly the same thing, right? So it's exact match, nothing happened, right? Now, I would like to skip every other character in that sequence, just to drop every other character and get what we call a sparsified version of that sequence. Now, remember, this is the exact same copy. So when we drop every other character, still, we assume this should be exactly matching the other sparsified sequence. 
Now, what is the benefit of dropping these bases? We slash directly the size of the data by half. So now we have less data movement, hopefully, because we are going to process only the specified version, but not the original one. And with that, we already dropped half of the size of this data. Mm -hmm. However, as everything in life is not ideal, this is not the case in genomics. If you drop something, you may lose it for good, and then it might affect the end result. Now, this example is very short sequence. But think about very large sequence, like a human genome, 3 billion characters, for example. There's no way to try to compare that genome to another genome uh, as is. So normally we use kind of indexing techniques, which extracting subsequences from that sequence, save it in a storage or an index data structure that you can query very quickly. So now we extract all overlapping k-mers, regardless of the method, could be minimizer, synchmer, stroke-mer, whatever. I will try to do the same thing for the other copy, but with one modification that we are going to skip only the first character. Why is that? Because sequencing machine and preparation protocol that you follow. So by skipping the first character, and now we skip every other character as usual, and we get the specified version of the sequence. And now we extract all the overlapping things. Now, assuming this is what you get from the sequencer and this is the reference gene. Now I'd like to match this with that. Remember, the two sequences are exactly the same, just we missed the first character. Once we try to match all these paper subsequences, we got no single match at all. And that is telling us that specified genomics is really a challenging problem. So you drop half of the character, but they no longer match. Now, how we address that problem? How we enable processing half of the size of the genome without losing any accuracy? We propose a genome on diet library, which is a library consists of five steps. You could enable some of them, disable some of them, depending on the application that you are using. It's really uh, application independent that you can use it for anything which can be supported by specified genomics. What is the first step? As I explained in the example, we would like to get the reference genome, which is something huge, very large. And then we get a pattern that is defined by the user. This is, should be minimal repeating pattern, which is one zero. That is the only thing provided by the user. And when then we repeat that pattern as long as we have more characters in the reference genome. And now we do and operation, for example, or drop this character whenever we have a zero. So we got this is the result of the reference genome. So we cut the size of the reference genome by half, and then we extract the k-mers as usual. And then those are the things to be stored in the index data structure. Now that is what we do to the reference genome. Until now, we didn't discuss how we solve the problem, how we cannot match two similar sequences. Now, the second step that we are providing, now we are working on the reads that we got from the sequencing machine. Remember, we already stored the index that we built in the previous step. Now, this is the read sequence. We apply the exact same pattern. We adjust the length, of course, depending on the read length. And then we got the new version of the read. And now we extract the k-mers. Again, this is independent of the method that we are using for seeding. Could be minimizer, stroke mer, sync mer, anything. Now, to address that problem that we discussed, we don't know if the pattern should be applied from here or from here or starting from there and so on. So, we could apply the pattern at any location. And every time we apply the pattern at different location, we got totally different results because it's going to control the bases that are going to be dropped. And every time the zero is, shift, is shifted to another location, we are going to drop different phases than previous. So what we said, we propose a simple hack that is a heuristic, greedy approach. But we said, okay, the pattern is just one zero, right? And then repeating itself. So we have two, exactly two options. Either we apply it in the first character or the second character. And that's what we do here. We said, okay, let's apply the pattern now in the second character. 
So we just shifted by single step. And then we got the new version, and then you can see how it's different from what we got before. Then extract the K-mers. But then we have two versions of K-mers. Which one to consider? What we do, we check those K-mers in the index that we built in the previous step. We check them, we didn't see them over there. So they never happened. We check those, we find both of them exist that give us some insight. What is it? That this version or this version already exists in the reference genome, but not this one. So everything we did over here was wrong. Yeah. It isn't the correct thing that we should consider moving forward. And that is, again, read the choice. The more seed matches you get, the more likely the sequence will appear in the reference gene. Now, in the third step, we already know the shift amount that we need to apply to the read itself. So we just apply it over there, which is a single step shift to the pattern. And then we got the new copy of the read, we extract the camers, and then you can use them for whatever the purpose of your application. If your purpose was to query that the index, then you can use them directly to query. If your purpose was to match it with another camera extracted from another sequence, you could still do that. Now, in read mapping application, we would like some computational step that can tell us where are the mapping locations. And because the seed, remember the seed we extracted from here, they are already sparsified. So these bases, every once in a while, we have some base drop. So those are not a complete chunk that we can use to do chaining, for example. So what we propose next, we said, okay, those seeds are specified as well. So we cannot directly link them to build the anchor or the chain of the seed. So let's do a location voting, which is following seed and vote approach. So what we said, sorry, I think the colors are, um, as by the data presenter, but hopefully it's clear from far away. What we said, whenever we have this location or the seed matches that are scattered around the genome, scattered at certain location, for example, if all the seed matches coming from this location, the reference genome, then probably that is the correct mapping location where the read is extracted from. And then we use that to determine the correct mapping location. Which, are, which is replacing the chaining step in Minimap 2, for example, or any uh, read mapper. The last step proposed in our library is to do sequence alignment. And this is independent. You could apply whatever you would like to have, wavefront algorithm, KSW2, any kind of sequence alignment. Now, collectively, having all those five steps, you could study or apply it to different applications as I'm going to show in the results. We implemented our library on top of Minimap2 because it used very well optimized um, functions from KLib, for example, to build the hash table to do the query and so on. So we exploited all those optimization so that we can provide a very fast performance. However, we also propose our own software optimization. For example, AVX acceleration to the seeding step where we extract the k-mers, build the hash value for each k-mer, and then find the minimum hash value and store it in the hash table. So all of those software optimization, they are independent of genome and die. You could still use them to accelerate minimap tool, for example. And there are many more details, for example, a quick filter to detect the exactly matching short reads without performing sequence alignment. All right, what are the applications that can benefit from the five step that we presented? So the first type of application does compare sequences for similarities. So in here, we don't mean sequence alignment because in sequence alignment, you still care about every base. So if you drop some of the bases, you may affect the cigar string or the end result. But there are many other applications that could benefit from that. For example, free alignment filtering. I just would like to approximate the edit distance between two sequences. Give me an estimation whether this is exceeding a threshold or uh, below a threshold. Same with containment search. 
you have COVID-19 data and you'd like to search whether this really has that genome or not. So you have a hash table and you'd like to check if the read exists in the hash table or not. You don't care about every single base in that read. And in those application, normally we don't, we may or may not require building an index data structure. The second type of application does require building very huge index. For example, metagenomic uh, taxonomic profiling, track into, for example, or pan genomics. So you have very large reference genome, you would like to build an index data structure out of those. And remember when we dropped half of the bases, by going also to cut the size of the hash table by half. Also remember the index can be up to 21 X larger than the indexed reference genome. This is something really troublesome for hardware accelerators because you send the 3 billion bases to the accelerator and then you build index data structure that is up to 21 X larger than that. And I'm comparing here, by the way, to two bit encoded index genome, not to the file size that you can see in the past file. The third type of application does require building the index during the analysis, not as a pre computed index. What kind of application? Think about uh, cancer cells. You got the fast queue or the reads from this cancerous cell, and you got another fast queue from healthy cell. And you'd like to compare them to find somatic mutation, for example. So in this case, you don't have reference genome and both data, you got that during the analysis. So you cannot build something and store it and then you reuse it every time because every time you get data from new patient. And for those kind of application, the, you need to build the index on the fly. So the execution time for building the data structure or for the index really matters. You can see here, for example, in taxonomy profiling about 97% of the application just spent on building the index because there are no other steps that are involved in the application. And read mapping that percentage somewhere between 10 to 27% of the total execution time. All right, hopefully we are good in time. So I keep receiving this question, how applying the pattern to sequences is different from space C. And how many of you are aware about space C? All right, perfect. So I have this example so that to clarify what is space C thing in case you don't know what is it. So we have the sequence, we extract all overlapping k-mers, subsequences, and then we get the pattern from the user. And then we apply that pattern to the k-mers, but not to the sequence. And this is, are the end results that we got and which we need to store in the index data structure. So we're going to store those, and you can see how we can tolerate differences by excluding some of the bases from the camera itself. Now in the second, in our proposed method, we use the exact same pattern provided by the user in the space seeding, but we repeat it all over the input sequence. Now, how is this different from that? This is the new version of the sequence. And now we extract all overlapping k-mers as we did over there. However, this is the end result of the k-mers. And you can see the differences between this and that. Here we extract only three k-mers from the exact same amount of bases. But over there, we have about six k-mers extracted. And you can see that we already cut the number of k-mers by half. Now, there are other important differences between, between uh, space seeding and genome and diet. For example, genome and diet, each seed receives its own pattern. So here, the pattern used was one, triple, zeros, one, zero, one, and so on. But here you can see that this seed receives, for example, one, zero, one, and so on. But here, one, double one, zeros, double ones, and so on. So each seed has its own pattern. Now, why this is important, why you should care about those unique pattern for the seed. That's going to increase the sensitivity because um, we cannot guarantee where are the location of the mismatches could happen, could happen anywhere within the seed. So having multiple pattern, pattern going to increase the sensitivity as we show next. So here we did, we did three evaluation tests. So this is 500 sequence pairs in the x-axis and the three of them. 
the data over here very similar to each other. Those 500 sequences exactly very similar with a very small ratio of differences. Here's the exact same data, but here high divergence. It means there are lots of mismatches between the 500 sequence pairs. And here we use a pattern of one zero, here a different pattern, but here again one zero. And now we are comparing four methods of extracting the k-mers to see their sensitivity. And what we are testing is the number of k-mer matches uh, divided by the number of all matches extracted from the sequences. So how many of the matches that we calculated are useful for us? Remember, the, the k-mers get matched will be used for later on analyses. So the more we have, then the more useful analyses we are going to do. Now, when we extract all of our k-mers, just all of them, there is no minimizing, for example. Then the ratio will be about 70% of those k-mers extracted matches in the highly similar sequences. And when we extract minimizer seeds, it means we drop every a group of k-mers, we, we collect only one of them. That's what minimizer seed means. And then directly the ratio of uh, matching seed drop to around 40%. This is expected because we already lose some of the k-mers. Those k-mers could be useful, could be not useful. So we don't know. Now when space seed, we have it, we got a little bit increase in the number of matches. So the average maybe somewhere between 40 and 50% because now we tolerate more substitution within the k-mers. And in GM and diet, something similar to space C. When we move to irregular patterns, which will not affecting the overlapping seed at all because they don't use pattern, as well as the minimizer. So the all and the minimizer remain the same as previous. However, the space seed now it dropped. So the ratio now very similar to the minimizer because all the seeds receive the exact same pattern that we got from the user. Now, in genome diet, you can see the, in, an increase in the number of matching seeds because of that. Now, when we extract all the minimizer, all the seeds, all the minimizer, the ratio dropped because those sequences are not similar to each other. So we don't expect to have large ratio of uh, matching seeds. However, in space seed, that ratio increased dramatically because um, now we tolerate more mismatches, and the more mismatches you have, then we can do a good job for that. And that is the goal, basically, of space seed and genome and diet. In genome and diet, very similar to space seed. So to conclude, genome and diet provide the same or higher sensitivity compared to space seeding. But remember, genome and diet always extract the less amount of um, k-mers compared to space seed, and that's going to gain more performance and memory efficiency compared to space seed. All right, so we have other evaluation results. We evaluated three main applications, read mapping, containment search, and metagenomic profiling. And you can check the paper for more results, but we can see in read mapping, we provide up to 6x faster than Minimap2, which is state of the art, as well as 2x smaller memory footprint and 2x smaller index size. That is when we use a pattern of one zero. In containment search, so we got about 70x to 80, uh, 72 to 75x faster than KMC3, which is the state of the art camera counting library that you can use to do the containment search. And for metagenomic profiling, we compare with MetaLine, which is state of the art read mapping based um, uh, metagenomic taxonomic profiling. And you can see a huge benefit for that. And why the ratio we got in those two applications is much larger than the uh, speed up ratio we got in the read mapping. Remember, in the first few slides, we say that the execution time for building the index and seeding in metagenomic uh, taxonomic profiling was about 90% or so. So that's why accelerating the indexing sometimes can be considerably important depending on the application. But Again, we are not relying on this application only. We are providing a library that you could use it for any application, uh, depending on the purpose of the analysis. Here are another results we presented in the paper. Here we vary the pattern specified by the user. So you can see here we drop one fourth 
of the character here one third half and two thirds of the characters and you can see as we drop more bases from the character then the execution time is going to drop significantly compared to the original with no specification at all and the index size will be dropped as well and the peak memory directly dropped based on the pattern because we are cutting the, the, the number of payments that we extract. However, there's one important thing that the average number of seed matches per read is going to drop compared to the original one. And this is expected because we already lose some of the bases from the sequence and then we extract fewer payments from there. There are many more results. I'm going to just flash it over here, but you can check the paper for more details. This is uh, on read mapping. You can see how it scales compared to the W and K values uh, for a different setup and different data set, Alumina, HiFi, and OMT. And the next important results is uh, what kind of accuracy loss or if any loss we have in the structure of variation or variation detection. And we actually see benefits in terms of snaps, indels, and SVs compared to mini magnitude. All right, so as all of our work at Safari Research Group at ETH, the source code is publicly available. So you can play with it. You can enable some of those features, disable as I discussed, and you can access our preprint. And the, the paper is still under review. We got the reviews, great reviews actually from the reviewers. So we're going to address them hopefully soon and see how it goes. All right, that's the end of the talk. I'd like to thank the uh, co-authors and everyone at Safari who helped us in this project. And I'm happy to take questions, if any. Okay, great, Mohammed. Oh, it's over there. Any questions here or online? Question. Okay, go ahead, John. Has a is question. Is there a question? Is there a question online? Uh, I have one. Go ahead. Um, so, Hamza, thank you for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask. Um, I, I guess kind of um, you already showed uh, maybe the data kind of backs up uh, the answer to the question, but I wanted to kind of get the intuition um, behind how does um, how does the uh, how does this technique uh, handle um, uh, insertions and deletions? Because you know, in, with dense genomics, if you have an insertion, you just you know you, uh, uh, you it's just an insertion, and then everything else matches. Whereas if uh, over here, if you're kind of dropping every other base pair, if you have an insertion, everything else becomes a uh, becomes a uh, a mismatch unless you get two insertions, and then you kind of fix things up. So what's the intuition behind? How this technique is capable uh, of dealing with um, uh, with this, with insertions and deletions? That's a great question, Isa. Thanks for asking that. I don't know some of the colors are not appearing here, especially this bar and this one. But uh, this is how we handle very large structure variations, which are very large insertions or uh, deletions larger than fifty bases. So normally, this is uh, this approach also is adapted by other state of the art read mappers. So what we do normally, if there's a gap in the read, the, the extracted seeds, you will see it scattered around two regions, over here and over there. And that's what we call splice alignment, where we got two alignments instead of one alignment where we align the complete read to the complete reference genome. So what we do basically, we find those seed matches, and then we find the mapping location over the reference genome. And for those group of seed matches, we find another location somewhere else because that gap caused this uh, split between the two alignments. And we call one of them as primary alignment depends on which one is larger and the other one as supplementary alignment. Again, this approach is already adapted by other read mappers. And for us, uh, the, the, the other steps also, for example, how we decide where to start the shift from this location or the other location, um, so we also consider that because the more matches you get from this side, we don't need to worry about the other side from the read. Because if you got those matches correct, then everything else is correct. Because again, that one will be considered as totally different uh, outlining. Uh, I don't know where's the camera, so I don't know where should I look here or there, but. <laughs>
Yeah. So hopefully that answered your question exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay. I think we're kind of over the coffee break. How long shall we uh, keep the coffee break for? 10 minutes, maybe? Yeah, let's go for a coffee break for 10 minutes. Let's thank Mohammed again. Thanks, Mohammed. Thank you. I think that's a nice direction to explore further into. There are a lot of things to do, in my opinion, in this area. Do you agree? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> okay. Different flavor than yeah, yeah. It's also adapted by AIM framework, will be presented by ESAP, for example. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll start the next section in, session in 10 minutes. And Izzat will be talking about AIM and Nico will be talking about GenStore. Yours. This is yours also. Don't, don't lose it.
Uh, we'll start in a few minutes. Uh, Izzat, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me? Perfect. Yeah, we can also hear you. Thanks. Do you want me to start sharing? Uh, yes, that will be great. Okay. Okay, I guess we're starting very shortly. Uh, let me see. Looks good. Okay, uh, camera looks good as well. All right, let's get started, I guess. Everything looks good. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to have uh, two more talks before the lunch break. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Izzah's talk. Uh, before, I guess, I uh, let uh, Izzah to give his talk, I'll briefly uh, introduce him. So Izzah is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the American University of Beirut. Uh, his research interests are in the application acceleration um, and programming support for emerging parallel proce processors and memory technologies with a particular interest in GPUs, uh, PIM processing in memory. Uh, Izzat received his uh, master's and PhD in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Campaign, uh, where he received the Dan Vivoli Endo Fellowship as well. Uh, prior to that, he received his bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering at the American University of Beirut, where he is now uh, an assistant professor right now. Um, and he also received a distinguished uh, graduate award there when, when he's, well, he was doing his bachelor's. So I guess with that, uh, you can take it away, uh, Izzat. Okay, thank you, John, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for attending. It's a pleasure uh, to join you, and sorry that I had to join the remote. Um, uh, so I'll be talking today about um, a framework that we built uh, for high throughput sequence alignment using real processing memory systems. Um, the framework is called AIM. Uh, it was uh, developed uh, primarily by my master students, Safa, uh, with the help of Amir, and also in collaboration with Hamad Fuan and owner from uh, ETH. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, all of them for uh, their efforts in making this work possible. Um, so I, I'm not going to motivate uh, why sequence alignment is important. I think this audience um, already knows that, and, uh, and prior prior talks have already motivated that. Uh, but I'll start by commenting on some of the uh, kind of performance bottlenecks that uh, sequence alignment faces, especially on traditional processors like CPUs. Um, so here, this plot shows how um, the execution time, which is on the y-axis, uh, scales with the number of threads. Um, on the CPU for different algorithms. So I'm showing five different algorithms here. Uh, Needleman, Launch, Smith, Ford, Go, to Genasm, WFA, WFA Adaptive. Um, and then also um, uh, also uh, uh, with uh, different read lengths. So, so every line in this plot represents different read lengths. Um, and here what we can see is that as the uh, as number of thread increases, we see that there is a limited performance uh, improvement beyond a certain point. So the performance kind of improves from one thread down to 16 threads, but then there's kind of a stagnation and we see little improvement beyond that. Um, and kind of when we investigated why, we found that um, uh, as we increase the number of threads, uh, the instructions per cycle, uh, which is the number of instructions that the thread executes every cycle, uh, is steady up until 16 threads, but then it also starts to drop, which means that as we are increasing the number of threads that are executing, these threads are becoming more and more idle. Um, and, and when we looked into why, uh, so there's uh, more time spent by each thread's idle, meaning these threads are just sitting there and stalling. They're not doing any useful work. 
Um, so when we looked at why these threads are stalling, uh, we saw that as the number of threads increase, uh, we saw that there's an increase in the number of memory stalls. So there's these threads are spending more and more time waiting for memory, uh, meaning that we're adding these threads, but these threads aren't able to make as much progress um, as when there were fewer threads because they're not competing for the memory and, and, and so each thread has to wait a longer time for memory. And this is known as the uh, memory bandwidth bottleneck. Uh, so in conventional CPU processing, we have a CPU chip, right, which uh, has different cores and these cores are where we execute computations. Uh, and these cores access data from a memory chip, which uh, has a bunch of DRAM banks uh, and that store the data. Uh, and um, the, the, and uh, the more and more threads we have executing on the chip, uh, uh, the more and more data is, uh, is going to be re uh, requested by these threads. Uh, and what this does is creates a bottleneck for, uh, for the data when it, tries to, when it tries to go from the memory chip uh, to the CPU chip where the computation is being done. Uh, now, if uh, for applications that uh, do a lot of computations per, uh, for every data that they access, that's not a big deal, but uh, because uh, if we have many threads, still they're not. We're not going to have too many, too much data being requested at the same time. Uh, but for applications such as sequence alignment that don't do a lot of computations per unit data, uh, the memory bandwidth bottleneck becomes a big issue. Uh, so uh, an important solution to this uh, problem that uh, is kind of gaining a lot of attention in the literature is processing in memory. Uh, and so processing in memory is this idea that uh, if we have a computation that does not uh, does not use uh, um, that does not reuse data a lot. Is not very compute intensive. Is more memory intensive. Then instead of bringing the data all the way to the compute chip uh, to uh, perform computation, perform a few computations on it. Instead, uh, what we will do is we will put these weaker cores inside of the memory chip. Uh, these PIM cores, processing memory cores, and we will process the data where the memory, uh, we will process the data where it resides or closer to where it resides. Uh, and what this does, it helps us overcome this memory bandwidth bottleneck so that the computation is no longer memory bound. Um, now, there is um, there's been a lot of uh, work on processing in memory. There has been some hardware, uh, real hardware that was manufactured. There's also a lot of research, uh, research prototypes. Uh, and what we have done is we've been looking at um, um, performing sequence alignment on real PIM hardware. And specifically, we've looked at UpMem, which is the first real PIM hardware that has been made available. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how the UpMem system is organized, and then I'll talk about how our framework um, has kind of been designed to target the UpMem system. Uh, so the UpMem system, uh, designed by, uh, uh, named after their, the company that designed them is called UpMem. Um, so in, in an UpMem system, you have a host CPU, uh, and this host CPU has a, a bunch of uh, kind of DRAM DIMMs. Every DIMM has a bunch of DRAM chips. Uh, the, and each chip has a bunch of DRAM banks. Um, so this is the usual main memory that you will find in a system. But then also in addition to these DIMMs, you have these processing and memory enabled uh, DIMMs. So here, uh, these are special DIMMs uh, where with each, uh, inside of each, uh, each DIMM, you have again, a bunch of chips. These are called PIM chips. And then inside of each PIM chip, you have, uh, you have these DRAM banks, but these DRAM banks are special in that they also have processing memory capabilities. And this is kind of what it, uh, what these DIMMs look like in, in real life. They're, they're kind of standard, uh, standard uh, DRAM chips that you can plug into a system, but they have the, 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 the DRAM banks have this capability of executing uh, operations. Uh, so let me, uh, let me kind of zoom in into one of these PIM chips. So the PIM chip, is going to have multiple uh, uh, what we what are, what are called DPUs or data processing units, and each DPU is going to have a 64 megabyte DRAM bank. Uh, but then also in addition to have the DRAM bank, it's going to have some additional hardware that allows it to execute computations on the data in that bank. So there's a DMA engine that can take data from that DRAM bank and stream it to a kind of faster. Um, uh, SRAM-based uh, um, uh, uh, cache, or which is smaller, 64 kilobytes. This is called WRAM, and then and then there's also an instruction RAM that's also 24 kilobytes, more like an SRAM uh, SRAM uh, type of memory. Uh, and then these uh, are can be accessed by a execute uh, a computation core that can perform computations. And this core is a is a kind of RISC-V processor uh, that has 14 pipeline stages. Um, and to fully, one important note is to fully utilize this processor, you need to have at least 11 threads running. 
Um, otherwise, uh, there's going to be kind of stalls uh, because this because this processor has kind of a limited capability of handling um, of um, of handling hazards. So uh, because of uh, because they, it needs to uh, be kept simple so that it doesn't consume too much area inside of the PIM chip. Uh, so this is how uh, these uh, these upmem chips are organized. Uh, again, every every um, every member DRAM bank uh, is coupled with the score that can uh, that can execute computations of the data in that DRAM. Uh, and uh, to uh, to execute data, the data needs to be streamed from the DRAM bank uh, to this working RAM, and then the core will will perform the operations on the data on the working RAM. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, how we've targeted this hardware uh, with our framework for performing sequence alignment. Uh, so our framework is called AIM, uh, Alignment and Memory. Uh, and AIM uh, works as follows. Uh, the first uh, step uh, in kind of the workflow is to uh, get uh, sequence pairs uh, from an input file or maybe from somewhere else and bring them into the host memory of the CPU. Uh, the next step is we take these sequence pairs and we distribute them across all the different DPUs. So these, again, a DPU is this coupling of a DRAM bank with a core that can execute uh, on, uh, on the data in that DRAM bank. Um, so, uh, so we distribute these sequence pairs across these different DPUs. And then inside of every DPU, uh, we first stream the data from the MRAM to the WRAM. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about this process in a later slide. Uh, and then after we bring the data into the data into WRAM, uh, we have the threads that we can have many threads executing inside the same core. So we so every thread is handling streaming its own data from the MRAM to WRAM. And then also every thread will uh, access WRAM to perform its own sequence alignment. And then when the threads are done, they do the trace back, of course. Uh, they, uh, the threads will store. Um, uh, the result uh, back into the MRAM. Uh, and then after we are done, uh, uh, the CPU will bring the data from the MRAM to the host main memory, and then this data will be stored uh, back uh, to disk. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, there's a necessary step of putting things in the main memory of the host CPU uh, and then uh, moving them to the PIM-enabled PIM memory. And then same thing, you have to move it back from the PIM-enabled memory to the host CPU before you can store it to disk. Uh, this is a limitation in the current hardware that, of course, incurs an additional data transfer. I'm going to show uh, uh, how that impacts performance uh, in, in the evaluation. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the overall workflow of our framework AIM. Uh, we support different algorithms uh, inside of AIM. We support uh, the well-known needleman wunsch algorithm, also the smith smith Waterman go to algorithm, which uh, supports uh, the affine gap model. Uh, we also support Genet, which is um, uh, which is kind of based on bitwise uh, operations to perform alignment instead of the usual needleman wunsch and smith Waterman go to. Uh, um, I believe Damla is going to be presenting uh, on Genasm, so I won't talk too much about it in, in my presentation. Uh, and then finally, we um, we also look at uh, the wavefront algorithm, which is a state of the art, uh, uh, which is a state of the art uh, sequence alignment algorithm based on uh, based on wavefronts. Uh, so here, logically, you you have this uh, this uh, dynamic programming matrix that you uh, that you operate on, similar to Smith Warm and Go to, uh, but instead you actually store you actually kind of um, uh, operate on it kind of one wave front at a time where every wave front corresponds to like an incremental uh, a score that, uh, until you reach the um, until you reach the uh, uh, kind of the, 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 the bottom left bottom right of the matrix. And the idea here is to avoid exploring the whole matrix um, if, um, if, uh, if if that is unnecessary for you to kind of find the, the alignment score. Um, so what we've done uh, is we've uh, implemented uh, all four of these algorithms for WFA. We've implemented two versions of it, uh, uh, the, the regular version and also the heuristic version we'll called WFA Adaptive. Uh, and we've evaluated them on, um, on uh, uh, the UpNEM system. Uh, now, one important thing in, uh, uh, in implementing these algorithms on UpNEM is managing the UpNEM memory hierarchy. Uh, because you have this uh, this uh, DRAM bank, and then we also have the working RAM, which the core accesses in the working RAM is smaller, but it's faster. Uh, you have to manually manage the uh, uh, the data the data movement between the WRAM and the MRAM. So for every uh, for every algorithm, we actually have 
two different versions of the algorithm. One of them uh, uses WRAM only for storing the alignment data structures. By the alignment data structures, I mean uh, the dynamic programming matrix for Needleman launch, for example, or, um, or the wavefront components for the wavefront algorithm. Um, so here, <coughs> excuse me. So in the WRAM version, uh, what we do is uh, we put the sequence pairs in MRAM. Uh, MRAM again is the, the, large, uh, the large DRAM bank. So we put the sequence pairs in MRAM. We bring those into, uh, and then the thread uh, that's operating on a sequence pair will bring them one sequence pair at a time into WRAM. It'll have its own section in WRAM that it's responsible for, that, that where it can put its data. Uh, and then it'll uh, it'll also store the, the intermediate alignment data structures. So like the DP matrix, for example, inside of WRAM entirely, it'll do the alignment, uh, store the result, and then write back the result, uh, the alignment result to MRAM, uh, which will be later transferred to the CPU. So here, the, the key idea is that we're replacing the entire intermediate alignment data structure inside of the WRAM. Now, because the WRAM uh, is uh, limited in capacity, it's 64 kilobytes, whereas this MRAM is 64 megabytes, uh, this uh, places a restriction on how many threads we can support. Uh, and as the sequences that we're aligning get larger, these data structures get larger, so we can support fewer and fewer PIM threads. Uh, and because of that, we have another version. Oops. Uh, because of that, we have another version of uh, the... Um, uh, of the uh, the of every alignment algorithm, which uses both WRAM and MRAM for the uh, intermediate alignment data structures. So in this case, what, what happens is again we have the sequence pairs inside of the MRAM, but we're also going to put the entire alignment data structures also inside of MRAM. So here are the DP matrix and needle launch, for example, or the wavefront components in WFA. Uh, these will be inside of MRAM. Uh, and when, what the threads uh, are going to do is that when they're aligning a sequence pair, uh, depending on where there are the alignment, they're going to bring in only part of the data structure that they need for the current step in the alignment. So for example, uh, in Needleman launch, it's only going to bring in a certain set of antidiagonals, or in, w in WFA, it's going to only bring in a certain set of uh, wavefront components. It's not going to have all the wavefront components stored inside of the WRAM. And what this does is that it allows us to use less uh, less uh, WRAM per thread, which allows us to execute more threads on the DPU, which again is important because we we need to be we need to execute eleven threads simultaneously if we would like to fully utilize uh, the PIM cores. Um, uh, so so this so these are the two different versions that we provide uh, for each algorithm. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, show some results uh, that our framework has achieved. Uh, I'll start by comparing uh, our framework uh, uh, executing on PIM, uh, specifically UpMem, to uh, some CPU implementations. Um, first, uh, so we compared to three different CPUs um, uh, with kind of different, a varying number of threads, also a varying, a varying sizes of, uh, of cache. And one thing that we note is that uh, the CPU that has the largest L3 cache, in this case the Xeon 5, uh, also tends to be the best performing CPU in the majority of cases. Uh, and, uh, and this observation, again, uh, emphasizes the fact that this is indeed a, a memory-bound computation because we have a CPU that has you know, more threads, um, but uh, the CPU that has fewer threads but a larger cache ended up performing better um, because uh, it was better at dealing with this memory-boundedness of the computation. Uh, so our, our second observation. Uh, so here, the the, the this uh, this um, this additional gold bar represents uh, the perf uh, execution time uh, on upman. Uh, so again, I, excuse me, I forgot to introduce the plots. So we have execution time on the y-axis. So lower is better. Uh, we have different algorithms here: NW, Smithform, and Go2, Genas, and WFA, and WFA Adaptive. Uh, and then over here, we have different read lengths. Um, so as you can see, uh, in the case of upmem, in the majority of cases, uh, this this gold bar is lower than the blue bars, which shows that the PIM performance is uh, better than uh, the uh, the CPU performance. Uh, and for in the best case, uh, for Smith Worm to go to, our performance is up to four x faster uh, or four x higher throughput than uh, uh, the CPU. 
uh, WFA is uh, is up to 1.8 uh, times faster, and WFA adaptive is up to 2.56x uh, faster. So again, uh, we see that uh, PIM can substantially outperform the CPU uh, because of its ability to overcome the, this memory bandwidth bottleneck. Um, and now this uh, this gold bar includes uh, data transfer. Remember, I said at the beginning that we have to move data into the CPU's main memory and then move it from the CPU main memory to the PIM uh, to the PIM enabled memory. Um, so if we look at uh, if we look at results without data transfer, we see that the performance improves even more. Uh, we can have up to 25 uh, or 26x uh, faster for WFA and 28 times faster for WFA adaptive. Uh, now, why why is this result without data transfer important? Uh, so, like I said before, we have this uh, limitation of having to put things in main memory and then transfer them from main memory to the MRAM, and at the same time. When we're done, we have to move things from MRAM back to main memory and then write them back to disk. Now, in a future system, if uh, if these um, if these PIM memories improved uh, and became more advanced and were capable of supporting uh, writing directly uh, to the uh, to the uh, these PIM enabled DIMMs, uh, potentially we could uh, write things directly from disk to the these PIM uh, memories and then write things directly from these PIM memories back to the disk. And that will save us this data transfer, which will allow us to have even more uh, performance improvement from, uh, from being able to do processing in memory. Uh, the final observation from this plot is that um, uh, we have uh, for for the algorithms that are have regular accesses like Newton and Munch and Smith Waterman, and then also for the cases where we have small read lengths, we see that the CPU actually outperforms uh, PIM in these cases, uh, and that's expected because when the read lengths are small, the data structures are small, so the memory bandwidth is less of an issue. And then also when the accesses are regular, the the CPU cache tends to be good at dealing with those. Um, so again, it helps uh, it helps uh, with the memory bandwidth. Uh, so where we really see uh, the biggest improvements are when we have the more irregular memory axes coming from the uh, from these uh, the algorithms like WFA. Um, uh, we also scale to larger read lengths. So here you can see that uh, we continue to have a large speed ups for you know at a distances up to five percent, and also for read lengths of five thousand and ten thousand. Uh, we have one uh, case here where we uh, where our framework begins to uh, struggle with outperforming the CPU, uh, and what's happening over here is that we are limited by the WRAM capacity. We can't execute it. So here, the issue isn't memory bandwidth; it becomes the memory capacity that's available to a single GPU core. So what's happening here is that, uh, if you remember here, uh, we were storing uh, these data the, these data structures in WRAM. Uh, or in MRAM and storing parts of it in WRAM. So uh, what happens is, is when the sequences get very large, even the small component of the data structure that we would like to store becomes so large that the WRAM becomes insufficient to store it. So we end up having only one thread executing in this situation. So we underutilize the PIM core. So that's oh, that's what's happening over here. Um, and hopefully kind of in the future, we plan to overcome this. Uh, by kind of um, being kind of more fine grained in how we move data between MRAM and WRAM, and also potentially parallelizing the sequence alignment across more PIM threads to be able to utilize uh, the, uh, the, the, the the DPU pipeline more effectively. Uh, we also compare performance to uh, GPUs. So here you can see uh, compared to WFA uh, and impl a WFA implementation on GPU, uh, you can see that uh, in most cases. Uh, PIM outperforms the GPU and we have higher throughput. And here you can see that uh, the throughput improvement in most cases is high, up to 2.68 times faster uh, for the for the uh, large sequence sizes. Um, uh, we also, uh, uh, this is my final plot I'm going to show. Uh, here we compare, remember I talked about how we have uh, two different versions of each algorithm, one of them that only uses WRAM for the intermediate data structures and one of them that uses both. Uh, so. Uh, um, so here you can see that um, in some cases uh, the WRAM version is better. In other cases, I'm gonna kind of um, gonna speed up just to avoid uh, running going over time. In some cases, the WRAM version, which is the orange one, uh, is lower, so it's better. And then in some cases, uh, you see that uh, there's kind of a trade-off. So for small read lengths, 
the WRAM only version is better and for large read lengths, the MRAM uh, version becomes better. Uh, so this again shows the importance of providing these multiple algorithms uh, and our framework uh, supposed, supports both of these algorithms. Uh, so to summarize, uh, uh, we, uh, can we show that sequence alignment on traditional systems is limited by the memory bandwidth bottleneck. Processing in memory overcomes this bottleneck. Uh, and our framework alignment in memory is a PIM framework that supports different alignment algorithms and it's implemented on UPMEM, which is the first real PIM system. Uh, our results show that we have substantial speed ups over CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and uh, you can access uh, our source code uh, at this GitHub link. And this work was also published uh, at Bioinformatics very recently. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Excellent, yeah, thanks, thanks, Izzat. Uh, I guess we have some time for questions, Mohamed. Yeah, thanks, Izzat, uh, that's interesting. Uh, since the data transfer is also causing a problem here, do you think you can do further computation within the PIM core uh, before moving the end result to the CPU back? Uh, for example, you can do the further steps like variant calling, some other st uh, stuff because uh, you're going to filter out some of these results and maybe you don't need to move them anymore to the CPU back to do further analyses. I'm not sure if uh, those PIM cores allow for that. Do you have more space to do further computation? For example, reducing the parallelism instead of uh, leveraging all these cores uh, for alignment, you could reduce that. Some of them do alignment, some of them do some other stuff. What is your uh, takeaway uh, about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right, Mohammed. So here in our experimental setup and our evaluation, we've um, we kind of as we kind of sent sent the the reads to do the alignment and then brought them back. But you're absolutely right. Like if we have if we're going to integrate this framework into kind of a, a larger workflow, potentially the previous step or the next step can also be done in the PIM cores. And in this case, you'll be doing more work in the PIM cores, uh, which will allow you to amortize that data transfer overhead. So, so absolutely, that's um, um, if if kind of previous and next steps are also memory bound steps, uh, doing them in the PIM cores is is um, is a good idea. Um, it depends, of course, how much um, how much um, global communication needs to happen uh, for these previous and next steps because these PIM, these PIM systems are not very good, or at least this one is not very good at communicating across PIM cores. But if some previous or next step is embarrassingly parallel and can be done locally in the PIM core, um, then, that, that, then you're absolutely right, that can, uh, that can be done. Uh, another, another thing that uh, can be done to hide the, um, the, uh, the, this data transfer is that if a subsequent step is happening on the CPU, uh, instead of waiting until you're done and then doing the data transfer and then executing on the CPU, you can pipeline that. So uh, what you would do is you would kind of do some alignments and then transfer them to the CPU uh, and, and then kind of paralyze the transfer to the CPU with the computation on the CPU so that transfer becomes hidden by the computation. Um, so if you set up a pipeline like that, uh, the transfer time will affect you less and less as well. I see. I think that is a great point about the intercommunication issue between the PIM cores. I didn't think about it. Yeah, I see. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Izat, for the great talk. Uh, I also have a question for you. I'm Juan from ETH. Yeah, um, hi, Juan. <laughs> yeah my question, because the results that you showed are for different uh, read lengths and different uh, edit distance uh, values, right? So how good AIM uh, handle the case where you have different lengths, for example, imagine that you have a variety of uh, reads between 100 uh, characters and 500. So how, how good uh, the the framework itself could deal with this situation or how it could be, it could be, let's say, improved to handle that well? Yeah, so it it, um, it depends on the uh, it depends on the algorithm. So some of the algorithms um, are not really affected by uh, by uh, by the error rate, um, but uh, algorithms like WFA, for example, um, kind of the the, the uh, how how much error rate you have impacts how much memory you can uh, how much memory you need to allocate. So if you have to deal with reads that have higher and higher error rate, you're going to need to have 
more and more memory to be able because you're going to have more wavefront components that you need to store. Uh, so in that case, um, because of the limited uh, if, because of the limited memory capacity, um, the the error rate does become an issue, uh, and um, um, uh, and 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 if you have kind of variable error rates, you're going to have to dynamically adapt to those uh, those error rates as you're executing. Now our implementation does um, does handle that to some extent. Um, however, kind of um, uh, failing gracefully when you have very high error rates is something that kind of we still need to be able to support. Right now, we just kind of um, uh, we just kind of are unable to handle the situation if we have very high error. But doing um, more more intelligent things like maybe stopping one of the uh, one of the alignments so that another stopping one of the threads so that the other thread can use its memory. Um, that's something that can be done, but that's not something that we currently do uh, in our framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, thank you very much, Isat. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks again, Isat. Yeah, thanks. I guess our next speaker is uh, Nika. Uh, I guess while she gets uh, her setup ready, uh, I can start introducing her. Okay, I can already see her. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Um, so Nika is uh, going to give the next talk, uh, Janstor. Uh, Nika is a PhD student in the software research group at ETH Zurich, uh, where he, she also got uh, her master's uh, at ETH uh, before uh, she got her uh, bachelor's from University of Tehran. And uh, during uh, her PhD, she's currently working on uh, mainly like uh, emerging uh, memory and processing technologies, uh, focusing on, uh, let's say, bioinformatics workloads and also uh, doing near data processing and uh, processing in memory, uh, storage systems, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think JanStore summarizes a part of uh, her PhD uh, uh, work, let's say. So I guess without uh, further ado, uh, Nika, you can start, I guess. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jan. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, and I guess the screen is also shared, right, correctly? Exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello. As uh, Jen mentioned, I am Nika, and today I will talk about GenStore, a high performance and storage processing system for genome sequence analysis. Uh, genome sequence analysis is critical for many applications, such as personalized medicine, outbreak tracing, and evolutionary studies. And genome sequencing machines extract the smaller fragments of the original DNA sequences known as reads. Read mapping, as uh, probably I have, uh, it has already been discussed uh, in this session, is a, one of the first key steps in genome sequence analysis that aligns reads to potential matching locations within the reference genome. And for each matching location, the alignment step tries to find uh, the degree of similarity between the read and the reference genome by calculating the alignment score. Calculating the alignment score requires computationally expensive approximate string matching, or ASM, to account for differences between the read and uh, the reference genome. Uh, read mapping performs alignment on large genomic data sets containing millions of reads, and therefore read mapping is both computationally expensive and incurs high data movement overhead. There has been significant effort into improving read mapping performance through efficient heuristics, hardware accelerators, and various filters that prune reads that do not require expensive computation. While these approaches address the computation overhead in read mapping and data movement uh, overhead in um, uh, memory and main memory in cache hierarchy, um, none of them alleviate the data movement overhead from storage system whose impact becomes even larger when other uh, overheads get alleviated. Our key idea is to filter reads that do not require expensive alignment computation in the storage system to fundamentally reduce data movement overhead of read mapping throughout the system. 
Examples of reads that would not uh, require the costly alignment step would be exactly matching reads to the reference genome uh, that do not need approximate string matching performed during the alignment and non-matching reads that have no potential matching locations in the reference genome and then uh, hence they can skip the alignment step. Uh, how However, filtering reads in a modern SSD can be challenging because of different behavior across read mapping workloads and the limited hardware resources that we have available uh, in the storage system. So by addressing these challenges, we propose GenStore, which is the first in storage processing system designed for genome sequence analysis to reduce both the computation uh, overhead and the data movement overhead from the storage system. And GenStore provides uh, high performance and energy benefits compared to state-of-the-art hardware and software baselines. So that was a, a summary and overview of my talk. Let's just start with some background on read mapping so we can dive into the talk in more detail. Um, so mapping reads to reference genome requires expensive computation on large data sets, as we talked about. And the storage space in the reference genome can actually be very large. For example, for the human reference genome, this can contain more than uh, 3 billion characters. So uh, usually read mappers use an index of the reference genome to reduce the search, search space. And this index contains unique k-length subsequences called k-mers extracted from the reference genome and the location of these k-mers uh, in the reference genome. Um, read mapping is uh, usually uh, can be considered as a three-step process. And a state-of-the-art read mappers involve several heuristics to reduce the cost of expensive alignment computation. And the first step, uh, seeding, the mapper determines the potential matching locations or seeds in the large reference genome where the read could map. And to do so, uh, the mapper extracts some k-mers out of the read, looks at the uh, location of these uh, k-mers inside the index, and if the k-mer um, hits, it marks these potential candidate locations as seeds or um, potential matching locations. So basically, these are locations in the reference genome that need to be further looked at. Um, so to further reduce the cost of uh, computationally expensive alignment, the read mapper performs a second step called chaining or seed filtering, in which the mapper prunes the seeds in the reference genome to which the reads would not align, using a simple approximation of the alignment score. At the end of this step, the reads that have all their locations filtered out can skip the third step. For the remaining reads, the third step, which is the costly alignment step, determines the uh, exact differences and similarities between a read and uh, the reference genome via approximate string matching operations. So uh, we perform experimental studies to understand the potential of efficient and storage filters for improving read mapping performance. We perform a case study on real world genomic read data sets on various read mapping systems and the state of the art SSD configurations. And we make several observations as I will summarize now. The ideal in storage filter can significantly improve performance by reducing the computation overhead and data movement overhead. Filtering outside SSD provides relatively lower performance benefits because it does not reduce the data movement overhead from SSDs, storage systems, uh, basically overall, and uh, also must compete with read mapping for system resources, such as SSDs external bandwidth, the main memory bandwidth, and computation resources. We also observed that hardware accelerators reduce the computation bottleneck significantly, and uh, that makes IO a larger bottleneck in the system. So motivated by these observations, our goal is to design an in-storage filter uh, for genome sequence analysis in a cost-effective manner. And we have three key uh, design objectives in uh, mind when designing this new system. So the first is that the system should provide high in-storage filtering performance to overlap filtering with the read mapping of unfiltered data. And second, the design should support reads with different properties and different degrees of genetic variation. And third, it should not require a significant additional hardware overhead. And to this end, we propose GenStore, which is the first uh, storage processing system designed for genome sequence analysis. Our key idea is to filter reads that does not, do, do not require the alignment step inside the storage system and send the unfiltered data to the host system for further processing. Uh, 
However, filtering reads in a modern SSD can be challenging because of different uh, read mapping behaviors for different workloads and the limited hardware resources that we have available there. Uh, so let's look at filtering opportunities based on the features of input read sets. So sequencing machines uh, produce one of two kinds of reads. So short reads, which are highly accurate and short, and long reads that are relatively less accurate, uh, but much lar larger. So short reads can be uh, up to a few of characters, and long reads can be hundreds to millions of DNA characters. And based on these, um, we leverage two filtering opportunities for reads that do not require the expensive alignment step. First, we can uh, filter exactly matching reads, which are reads that match exactly to uh, one or more subsequences of the reference genome and do not require um, approximate string matching during alignment. Uh, examples of these ones would be uh, frequently occurring in short read sets with uh, low sequencing error rates and also low genetic variation. And non-matching reads uh, are the second class, so these can do not have any potential matching location in the reference genome, and therefore they can skip the alignment step. And non-matching reads can occur in long read sets that have high sequencing errors, or uh, on shorter long read sets that have high degree of uh, genetic variation. By thorough analysis of mapping process of reads with different properties and different degrees of uh, genetic variation, we designed two low cost and storage filters. The first is GenStor EM for filtering exactly matching reads, and the second is GenStor EM for filtering non matching reads. So now let's take a closer look at GenStor EM. Uh, GenStor EM accelerates read mapping by using an efficient and storage filter to filter reads that have uh, at least one exactly matching location in the reference genome via simple operations and without requiring alignment. But the key challenge in designing the um, in designing GenStore EM is the large number of random accesses to large data structures inside the SSD. So as I have shown in the background slide, we need to look up a large index and the reference genome um, uh, in random places. So that can be challenging uh, when performed inside the storage because uh, NAND flash memory exhibits very poor performance for uh, random access reads compared to uh, more efficient streaming accesses, sequential streaming accesses, and there is a limited DRAM capacity inside uh, the SSD, which is relatively um, smaller compared to the size of data structures that we need to randomly access. So to reduce the number of these accesses per read, we introduce read size k-mers. So instead of extracting several k-mers per read, as I have shown again in the background slide, and perform uh, separate lookups for each of these individual k-mers, uh, we can use the whole read as one k-mer. So hence that's the concept of read sized k-mers. So we can only have one lookup per read. So that's how we reduce the number of accesses. So now that we already know where we would access for each read, because the whole read is one kmer, we can avoid random accesses to the index by introducing the concept of the sorted uh, index of these read size kmers. So um, we don't have several kmers. We don't need to look several places. Um, so we can already sort all the um, index. Uh, based on uh, how um, they appear. Uh, so this index, uh, sorted index allows finding exact matches via simple um, sequential scanning of the read set and the index. So now I want to show the key idea of GenStore EM with a simplified example in which short read uh, consists of 10 characters. Uh, as I said, they can go up to a few under characters. For this, I'm now showing a, a read with 10 characters. So now suppose we have two data structures. One is the sorted read table, uh, and each entry of it is a, a stores a read and its unique ID, and uh, the sorted kmer index, which contains all unique read size kmers extracted from the reference genome, along with the kmer's corresponding location in the reference genome. So similar to what we had uh, before, just cameras are having similar size as the read. So each data structure is sorted by read and camera in this example in alphabetical order. 
so we sequentially scan through these data structures in three different ways based on the uh, comparison result of the current read and KMER. Uh, so let's go through these uh, three ways, see what happens. So first, when this current read and KMER are identical, we record the read as an exactly matching read that can be filtered from further read mapping process. And then uh, we move to the next element in both of these arrays. So if the read is alphabetically larger than the KMER, we conclude that the KMER does not match any read because we would have otherwise um, encountered uh, the matching ones since we've been sequentially scanning. So we go to the next element in the index so we can examine the uh, next KMER. Okay, here, so if the KMER is alphabetically larger than the read, we conclude that the read does not match any KMER in the index and needs to be sent to um, the full uh, read mapping process wherever it's happening. Uh, then uh, we go to the next element in the sorted read table so we can examine the next read. So using this technique, GenStore EM avoids random accesses and performs filtering only using low-cost uh, logic. Despite the key benefits of the approach I just discussed for sorted read-sized uh, KMER index, this index takes up a large space. So it can be 126 gigs for a human index due to the large number of unique K, uh, KMERs and the fact that we need to store these big KMERs. So we reduce the size, uh, the uh, capacity overhead of this GenStore EM index by replacing the read sized KMERs with a strong uh, hash value of each read. They can act as uh, both a sorting criterion. So instead of alphabetic sorting, we can sort based on the hash values and um, it can be as a fingerprint of each entry. Uh, so using Strong hash values instead of read size KMERs reduces the size of the uh, index by 3.9 times. But this index is still larger than the baseline KMER index used in conventional read mappers. Um, but our proposal is feasible for in storage processing due to the large capacity and high internal bandwidth of modern NAND flash based SSDs because then we can uh, stream through these with high bandwidth efficiently. Now I uh, show the overall operation flow of GenStore EM, be it a sorted read table and sorted KMER index, uh, as I call them in these figures, SR table and SK index, in the NAND flash memory distributed across all channels and dies, and the comparator, uh, uh, yeah, so, so this is distributed evenly so that we can leverage the full internal bandwidth of the SSD. And we have the comparator logic on the SSD controller. And uh, we have two steps. So first, is, uh, in step one, reads uh, Genstore EM reads the um, two data structures from NAND flash chips to the SSD's internal DRAM in a batched manner. And the step two, uh, so as you see, these are the batches inside the DRAM. Uh, and the step two performs exact match filtering within each read batch using simple comparator logic. Step one and two are performed in a pipelined manner. And therefore, during filtering, GenStore EM can send the unfiltered reads to the host system for full read mapping. So this way, the filtering can concurrently happen inside the SSD. And as soon as we have reads that need a uh, more complex read mapping, they can go uh, to the host system or any other accelerator that uh, we have and perform read mapping. Now, let's take a closer look at GenStore NM for filtering non-matching reads. Using uh, chaining, uh, which um, was the second step in uh, high-level read mapping steps that I discussed in the background, uh, GenStore and M filters most of the non-matching reads, which are reads that would not align to any subsequences under the reference genome. Recall that uh, chaining filter calculates a similarity score for each read called chaining score and filters reads uh, with no high scoring potentially matching location. But calculating the chaining score inside the SSD can be challenging because finding the best chaining score requires performing many iterations of the dynamic programming algorithm for all seeds um, within a read. Um, so this can particularly be challenging for long reads because they can have um, really long lengths and uh, large numbers of um, uh, KMERS per read. 
So performing uh, many iterations of this dynamic programming algorithm and them uh, would require a lot of uh, buffering space and hardware resources, uh, which is expensive for uh, to afford inside the SSD. So to reduce the cost of chaining, GenStore NM uses a lightweight chaining filter to selectively perform chaining only on reads with a small number of seeds and directly sends reads that require more complex chaining to the host system. This idea is based on our observation from analyzing a wide a range of real-world genomic data sets. Uh, so as you see in this figure, um, we see the probability alignment probability of our read and long data set to subsequences in the reference genome as a function of a number of seeds per read. And we observe that reads with sufficiently large number of seeds are very likely to align to subsequences in the reference genome. And uh, such reads can be directly sent to the CPU for full read mapping. And they can um, uh, bypass the in-storage filter. Okay, I have uh, something in the chat, maybe I can. Okay, thanks, John, for the reminder about the time. Okay. Uh, okay, we observed that reads with a sufficiently large number of Cs are very likely to align to subsequences in the reference genome, and they can be directly sent to CPU for full read mapping, bypassing the storage filter. Um, so we conclude that, uh, uh -huh, yeah, so therefore, just using a very simple chaining uh, filter for the reads that um, have few seeds can uh, already filter many of non-aligning reads without needing costly hardware resources inside the SSC. And we conclude that um, uh, this already can uh, lead to a uh, small hardware overhead while uh, providing most of the gains of chaining filter. And more details of uh, this can be found in the paper uh, about the gesture and M's design. Now I go to the results. So we evaluate the following systems base, which is the state of the art software or hardware read mappers for both short and long reads. And GS is base integrated with GenStore. So it can be a different hardware or software mapper integrated with GenStore running concurrently in the storage system, filtering the reads that would not require the full mapper. So the mapper in the end can be anything. And we have these SSD configurations. Um, that uh, a low-end SSD, which is more cost-optimized, medium and then high-end SSD. So this can uh, show different trade-offs in terms of uh, performance and cost in the system. And for other details of the methodology, please refer to our paper. We analyzed the benefits of GenStore EM for a 22 gigabyte short read set, where 80% of reads exactly match uh, some sequences in the reference genome and can be filtered. So that's the human um, average uh, data case data sets. So we show the benefits of GenStore on software and hardware read mappers, and it provides up to 22.5 times the speed up compared to software baseline and 3.3 times the speed up compared to the hardware baseline. And on average, uh, 3.92 uh, times energy reduction. And we analyzed GenStore NM uh, for a 12 gigabyte long read set with very high genetic variation. Uh, compared to the reference genome where 99.7% uh, of the reads do not match any subsequences in the reference genome. And we showed the benefits of GenStore again on software and hardware read mappers for long reads. Uh, we show up to 27.9 times the speed up compared to software baseline and 19.2 times the speed up compared to hardware baseline. And on average, 27.2 times energy reduction. And we find area and power values of GenStore by synthesizing GenStore EM and NM using 65 nanometer technology node and find that for an eight channel SSD, the area of GenStore is 0 0.2 millimeter square and the power is 26.6 uh, milliwatts. By scaling uh, the area to lower technology nodes, we observe that the area overhead of GenStore is uh, 0.006% of an Intel processor and less than 9.5% of three ARM cores in a SATA SSD controller. So in more advanced SSD controllers, uh, this uh, ratio would be even smaller because uh, those SSDs have more complex uh, units to perform uh, maintenance tasks of the SSD. 
Uh, so I will quickly go over other results that are in the paper before concluding this talk. So these are, we analyze the effect of different read set features such as database data set sizes and filter ratio. Uh, we show performance benefits of implementation of GenStore outside the SSD. So in some cases, the performance benefits are uh, it provides performance benefits because of more efficient streaming accesses, uh, but also provides significantly lower benefit compared to GenStore implemented inside the SSD. And we also provide more detailed characterization of non-matching reads across different read mapping use cases and species. So to conclude my talk, I go over its summary. Uh, there's been significant effort into improving read mapping performance, but these approaches address a computation overhead or data movement overhead in different parts of the system, but not data movement overhead uh, from the storage. And our goal is to improve performance of genome sequence analysis by effectively reducing unnecessary data movement overhead from the storage system. And our idea is to filter reads that do not require expensive aligning computation in the storage to fundamentally reduce data movement overhead throughout the system. And the challenges we had to address were the different behavior across read mapping workloads and the limited available hardware resources inside the SSD. And GenStore, um, our proposal is the first in storage processing system designed for genome sequence analysis to reduce the computation and data movement overhead. And we show that GenStore provides a large performance and energy benefits at low cost. So um, that was uh, my talk. I am happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Nika, for the sure. talk. Sure. Okay, any questions in the room? Okay, John has a question, so yeah. Hi, Nika. Hi, John. Uh, so, okay, let me take the other microphone as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, so you were mentioning the the mechanism of uh, GenStore uh, exact matching EM, and you mentioned the I guess the strong hash values over there. I guess they mm -hmm. are still like let's say not they are not perfect hash values, so the collisions may still happen. I guess right. So could you briefly talk about like what are the potential concerns or issues when such a collision happens in the exact matching uh, scenario? Uh, plus. I guess right now we're storing the read length, let's say exact, uh, basically yeah, we're storing the read length uh, 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 sequences. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say a short read is uh, 100 uh, bases, we're storing them in the hash table or their hash values. Uh, can we increase that length basically further, assuming that the long reads are going to be perhaps like as accurate as the short reads? Uh, if we cannot increase the length, what, what are the main limitations? Uh, doing so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. Uh, so I addressed the first one first uh, regarding uh, collisions. So we use the um, cryptographic MD5 hash functions in this case. So the collision rate uh, in our experiments in uh, large read sets were uh, very low. So the exact numbers are um, in the paper I don't have in mind, but uh, so they were uh, really negligible. However, uh, definitely not absolute zero. Uh, and we believe that this is tolerable because of uh, because uh, usually when we sequence, uh, we'll have like higher coverage. And uh, the fact that the location, let's say base pair location um, in uh, that genome be covered by several reads, uh, there's a high probability for that. So even if a uh, small number of Collisions happen for one read uh, covering that uh, specific base pair in that location, uh, there is high chance that other reads would cover that base pair um, in um, uh, the read data set. So um, that's the answer to the first one. So the second question uh, regarding uh, increasing the length, assuming that the long reads would be as accurate, as short reads, I think that this uh, challenge that you mentioned uh, would become even more serious. So that requires more analysis to see at until which uh, read length uh, this can be feasible. Uh, but the number of unique uh, read length k-mers also would increase significantly, meaning the index size uh, would also significantly increase. So that is a second challenge. 
that would arise um, when significantly increasing the read length. Um, I think these need to be looked into, but I uh, uh, think that more advanced uh, designs need to be developed uh, to handle such cases um, separately and directly leveraging just or EM's current design would not be efficient because of uh, the two challenges I discussed. But I think that that would be um, an interesting question to look into going into future, given that the quality of uh, long reads are improving. Yeah, great, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nika. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Nika. I think we're over time. Okay, so uh, I stop sharing. So much. Yeah, so, uh, we'll see you later. I think we'll start in one hour, 10 minutes, right? Yeah, at 1, 1.45. Yeah, at 1.45 p.m. Istanbul time for the next session. And who's going to present first? Damla. Yeah, Damla is going to present first. And then we have four talks. Okay, see ya. We'll see everyone then.
Are it? This is not working. Uh, it's working. It's working. Okay. Okay. It's better. Okay. I don't want to delay it longer. It's already five minutes late. Okay. Let's get started. Okay. Welcome to the afternoon session of BioArch Workshop. Uh, now we have a lot of talks. Uh, we're going to start with what I foreshadowed, uh, Damla's talks. Damla Chenol Chale uh, received her PhD from CMU, from my group. Uh, and now she's working at BioNano Genomics. And she's going to talk about uh, some works that she has done during her PhD on accelerating genome sequence analysis with the efficient hardware software, hardware algorithm co-design. And then she's going to have another talk later on on the work she's doing, doing at BioNano Genomics. Tamla, please go ahead. Yeah, she did her PhD at CMU and she received a bunch of awards <laughs> for SRC uh, presentations and also Recom ReComSeq right. poster, poster in 2018, 19, one of those years. <laughs> yeah. 18. 18, I in, think, yeah. In cars. Yeah, best yeah. poster. Yeah, yes. it was, yeah, she got the best poster award at that time. With an early version of Ginaz. Yeah, at that time, Ginaz was not published, but now it's published and she's going to talk about that yeah. and some other work. Yep. Okay, go ahead, Tamla. Thank you so much for the introduction, Tono. Sure. So, hi everyone. It's a great pleasure to be back in Recomp again, now with a different title at Bionano. But today, as owner introduced, I will be talking about my PhD work and two of our published works, uh, Genasm and Seagram. So let's start. Okay. So today you heard a lot about genome sequencing. Thing, so I won't introduce it again, but I just want to go over the workflow, like end-to-end -end workflow for genome sequencing. It starts with sample collection. It can be blood, saliva, or bone marrow tissue, and that contains the DNA, but it's in that sample, so we need to extract it with a wet lab um, operations, like a series of wet lab operations, and with that, the DNA molecule is isolated. And we need that in order to perform the sequencing, which will happen as part of an instrument. And uh, the issue with that, again, you heard it about it multiple times today, we don't have an intact large DNA molecule. It's chopped DNA fragments because of the wet lab process that's happening. It's chopping it. And then those chopped DNA fragments are being loaded into instruments. And in this context, it's sequencing instruments. You heard a lot of companies like Bio, uh, not Bio, no, no. Pac Bio, Illumina, uh, and o Oxford Nanapore, those are all the top like sequencing companies. So they have all several different types of instruments, which you can load your sample and get the sequence reads, which are composed of ACGTs. But as I mentioned, they are in chopped fragments and they don't directly uh, give us the information we are looking for out of this genome analysis, so we need to perform some computational analysis in order to extract the information that we are seeking for. And for that, we need genome sequence analysis, which is performed with algorithms, software programs, and the computers. So, Jalkan um, hates this, but I need to use this to motivate <laughs> this work. So, um, one thing to highlight is we are hearing a lot of like news from these genomics companies. So they are releasing new instruments, upgrading them and making them more and more performant every year, meaning the throughput coming out of the instruments or the um, like the, the cost of analysis, like, co like the instruments uh, cost and what, how many like samples you can gather out of them is getting improved. So the cost from the sequencing side and the throughput is getting better. But as we know, Moore's law, which we need for the better like uh, performance on the compute side is not keeping up with that. Because of that, we are observing computation as the bottleneck for the end-to-end -end sequencing um, or genome analysis workflow. And because of that, in my uh, PhD work, we as a group had a one goal, accelerating genome sequence analysis, and it's an ongoing goal for all of us, by efficient hardware algorithm co-design. So what, we, what I mean by hardware algorithm co-design is it's not just finding a hardware and directly mapping it or 
changing the algorithms and hoping that our like convenient our like conventional compute platforms will directly solve our issue. That's why we need co-design. And that's the core of my PhD work. And our approach for uh, this goal was first analyzing the multiple steps and their associated tools in the pipeline, genome analysis pipeline. And then with the um, goal of exposing the bottlenecks, our trade-offs between accuracy, performance, scalability, memory usage, and those kind of metrics. And eventually by using those trade-offs as our guide, we are coming up with uh, co-designs, as I mentioned, which are composed of fast and efficient algorithms along with, along with scalable and energy efficient customized hardware accelerators. Why power efficiency is important? Because when you think about these like instrument platforms where we are performing the work, they are lab places. And again, power is associated with cost as well. So we need not just performance, but also power efficiency as well. Otherwise, we can throw a lot of compute units and expect the end to end time to drop, but it doesn't help directly. So um, here are the research contributions which shape my PhD thesis. But today I will be talking about Genism, which uh, is published in Micro in uh, 2020, and also Sigram, which is a more recent work, which was published in ISCA last year. Mm -hmm. But before that, this is the first work I which shaped my um, PhD thesis, like dissertation basically. And I won't go into details and the tools we analyze in this paper is now out of date because five years old now, we have newer tools. But what this paper shaped, uh, how, how it shaped my PhD work is by finding these three key goals, which we need to get the maximum like, advantage out of this evolving sequencing instruments, which is high performance and low power, memory efficiency and scalability and high parallelism. So that's what we need to achieve all together in the tool side to be able to exploit all the advantages we are getting and keep getting in the instrument or sequencing side. So let's start with Genasm. And um, Again, I won't go into details about the pipeline because we, I, get, I assume we know all these, but just to give an idea uh, and as a refresher. So the typical read mapping pipeline is composed of four main stages. Starts with indexing. We need this because the reference genome is for human, for example, it's too big. So we cannot, for each of those read fragments, we cannot traverse it over and over, but we index it and have a more compact and efficient data structure to represent the, um, our reference genome. And then we use our um, reads in order to query this uh, index, the pre-processed index, to find the candidates for uh, mapping. And then optionally, but it's not really optional anymore, we perform pre-alignment filtering in order to discard the dissimilar sequences that we are 100% sure they won't lead us with the um, best alignment. And Finally, the core and the most expensive step of the pipeline read alignment, where we perform like dynamic programming based algorithms and find the optimal alignment with a traceback uh, step at the end. So um, why read mapping? Because we all know it's first key, one of the first key steps in genome sequence analysis. And um, the important part here is multiple steps of this pipeline I showed you is um, requiring approximate string matching or ASM. And um, that based on our analysis, we revealed that this like ASM part of the pipeline is a bottleneck by the computational power and memory bandwidth limitations of existing compute systems. And again, I will just show this briefly, which will motivate the, the algorithm we use uh, when we look at the approximate string matching, we need it because of the genetic variations and the sequencing errors that the sequencing devices are introducing to the sequenced genome. So we are not expecting exact matches. That's why we need approximate string matching. And when we say, when we look at the possible uh, error types, we are talking about deletions, substitutions, or insertions. And um, basically approximate string matching is detecting those differences and matches. And as I mentioned, usually in genomics, it's this stage is implemented as a dynamic programming based algorithm. 
But in this work, we um, like um, use, utilize an algorithm from 90s, early 90s, which is called BITAP, and exploited its um, very fast and simple bitwise operations, which makes it amenable for hardware acceleration. And we base our genasm on top of BITAP because of this reason. And um, it's doing what you expect from an approximate ring matching algorithm, which is finding the number of differences or the edit distance between a text, which is a reference genome, and read fragments, which are the uh, fragments of the sequence mm -hmm. genome. And it's composed of two main stages. First, the pre-processing step, which you perform per pattern or per read. And you basically convert your ACGT-based reads into a pattern bit mask, which is composed of ones and zeros. And the second step, which is the core, is the actual edit distance calculation or searching stage where you um, compare all characters of the text with the pattern using the pattern bit mask that we generated and the status bit vectors and other like, inter like another um, uh, data structure that hold the partial match information in again bits and the bitwise operations. So I won't be going over the all details, but I want to highlight the limitations of this algorithm. So first of all, when we um, look at the uh, body of the algorithm, we are dealing with two level data dependency. And on top of that, we are dealing with large number of operations, like iterations. The outermost loop is iterating over each text character. And as I mentioned, the reference genome is huge and that's your what you're traversing over. And in the innermost loop, you, we are iterating over each possible edit distance. And when we have long reads, we are talking about noisy reads, right? So the number of errors are huge, meaning the innermost loops number of iterations is large as well. And on top of that, there is data dependency for both of those loops, both like the outermost loop and the innermost loop. And the second uh, limitation of BITAP is um, it does not perform optimal alignment identification, which is traced back. So we are generating as part of the inner loop those four bit vectors for each possible case, like deletion, insertion, substitution, or match. But uh, the baseline algorithm do not store those or have a mechanism to like consume them in order to reveal the optimal alignment. And on top of this, there's a third limitation, which is no support for long reads. So in BITAP, each uh, bit vector has a length equal to read, meaning when we have long reads, we are talking about thousands or millions these days. So the like compute system does not have direct support to consume those kind of large bit vectors. And these are the algorithmic limitations of BITAP. And even if we solve these issues, we reveal that we cannot have direct uh, like performance out of it because first of all, for example, let's say the parallelism issue or data dependency issue, we chop the um, like the text, the reference genome into overlapping regions and perform the like the um, BITAP algorithm on each of these regions in parallel. We are limited by the number of compute units on the CPU side because we have number like limited number of cores. Let's say we switch to GPUs because they have thousands of cores, but in that scenario, we reveal that the memory bandwidth issues are causing us like um, less performance. And these are the um, hardware level limitations of BITAP. So um, these limitations motivate us to like accelerate ASM, like approximate string matching by designing both fast and flexible like framework, which is composed of like fixing the issues on the hardware, on the software side and mapping those with an efficient hardware. To this end, we are um, proposing Genasm, which is the first ASM acceleration framework for genome sequence analysis. And um, for ASM part, like approximate string matching, we base Genasm upon BITAP. And um, how we overcome these five limitations I listed. Uh, first, we modified an extended ASM algorithm so it can uh, um, support long reads, it provides traceback stage, and uh, the like it, it provides parallelism. And on top of that, we um, 
map these algorithms to efficient hardware so that uh, we will end up with a better performance uh, design. And these are listing our software and hardware level contributions. So let's briefly look at the Genasm hardware design. So um, our design is um, attached to host CPU for read uh, like transfer. And then we have a main memory, which we store the text or the reference genome. And we have two main components, Genasm DC to perform the bit vector generation and perform edit distance calculation. DC is coming from there. And Genasm TP in order to perform the traceback algorithm, the novel traceback algorithm we are proposing as part of Genasm. And when we um, look at the, like the memory hierarchy, we have DC SRAM as part of the Genasm DC design, which is holding the pattern bit masks or any intermediate uh, data that DC operation needs. And also TB SRAMs to hold the intermediate bit vectors that DC is generating and TB is consuming, which is needed for traceback operation. And let's look at the um, Genasm execution, how it works. So uh, the execution starts when the um, host CPU transfers the read into to our Genasm DC accelerator. So it um, transfers the reference and the query locations. And then Genasm DC takes the actual like um, portions of the read and the uh, reference text and writes it to DC SRAM. And in uh, Genasm, we are following a divide and conquer approach because as I mentioned, we are talking about large um, strings. So what we are doing is a heuristics where we divide the both text and pattern into windows and perform the TB, DC and TB operations on those windows. And then uh, finally uh, like attach like all of them together. But there are overlapping regions between them to like not to have suboptimal uh, alignments. Because of that, here as a third step, instead of performing DC on the full text and pattern, we gather like we get the subtext and sub pattern for the window for the current window, generate the bit vectors, write those to the TBS RAMs, and when we generate all bit vectors for the current window, then we uh, TB starts its execution, starts reading them the bit vectors from TBS RAM performs a traceback operation and um, uh, and send it like go back to the step three until all windows are consumed. So this specialized uh, design with um, like specialized compute units and on-chip SRAMs help us to balance, like match the rate of computation with memory capacity and bandwidth, and also achieve high performance and power efficiency. And finally scale linearly in performance with the number of parallel compute units we add to the system. When you look at the uh, Genasm DC hardware design, so we are, uh, we have a linear cyclic systolic array based accelerator and we uh, design it this way to maximize parallelism and also minimize memory bandwidth and memory footprint. And processing core is the like um, the core unit which performs all those inner loops um, bitwise operations. And when we add the flip-flop based um, memory units around this uh, core, we got a processing element. And when we concatenate multiple processing elements, we get a processing block. And one DC SRAM is attached per processing block to manage the that like text and pattern and other intermediate data transfers, read and write. And also we have TB SRAMs, which are also uh, attached to our Genasm TB unit, which I will show next, for uh, like intermediate bit vector read and write operations. And as I mentioned here, we have the Genasm TB hardware design. As you see, we have the TB SRAMs connected to a one TB unit. And in this unit, we have a very simple logic, which first reads the bit vectors from one of the TB SRAMs using the computed address then performs the um, bitwise operations. Like we are basically reversing the operations we did in the DC part to, gen to find the optimal alignment with TB here. And finally computes the next TB address based on the, um, like the current 
cigar string we find for the current iteration and it goes this way until we consume all um, locations. And one, once we generate the full string, we send the output back to the main memory. So um, we demonstrate the efficiency of genasm with uh, describing and test, like evaluating three use cases, read alignments for both long and short reads, pre-alignment filtering for short reads, and also edit distance calculation for arbitrary length any two sequences. But on top of that, we also discuss several other possible use cases, including generic text search. So I won't go into details because of the time, limited time for evaluation methodology, but I put the slides here and you can find more details in the paper as well. And we can talk offline as well. Okay, let's look at our key results, starting with area and power. So we synthesized our Genasm DC and TB accelerator data paths using a Synopsys Design Compiler at one gigahertz. And we revealed that um, for one like Genasm unit, which is composed of 64 processing elements on the DC side, we are only consuming 1% of a Xeon CPU core for both area and power, meaning Genasm has low area and power overheads. And when we look at our performance results and power consumption results for three use cases, for all of them, we uh, find that Genasm is more performant, like providing more throughput and better throughput per um, better power per throughput, throughput per power for all three use cases. And as part of this, we compared not just by software baselines, but also hardware baselines, if exists. And here are the list of additional details in the paper. And um, there are a lot of further evaluation and more algorithmic analysis available if you're interested. And to summarize, in this work, as I mentioned, we focus on approximate string matching because it is one of the major bottlenecks of the uh, read mapping pipeline. And we um, propose Genasm, which is based upon BITAP algorithm. And we modified it and extended it so that uh, like algorithmically it will not, it will address the limitations that BITAP has and can be used as a part of the uh, genome analysis pipeline. And we, um, um, yeah, and we uh, analyze like uh, Genasm for three different use cases. And for all of them, we find that it is significantly more uh, efficient for all the three use cases compared to state-of-the-art software and hardware baselines. And here you can find the paper and the talk, um, like it was an online talk because it, because it was in the middle of COVID. And also our software implementation uh, of uh, Genasm DC and TB is available in GitHub. So before I move on to Sigram, is there any question? <coughs> okay. So um, let's move on to, let's move on to Sigram. So Sigram, as I mentioned, we published it last year and we proposed it as an universal genomic mapping accelerator because it is not just su supporting uh, the traditional read mapping, which is the linear, or in this work, I refer it as sequence to sequence mapping. It also supports sequence to graph mapping, which is relatively newer problem. And I think in the actual program, there are a few papers on this topic as well. Not acceleration, but on the algorithm side. Okay, so um, I, I won't go over what read mapping is again, but this is how I explained like, or how we are used to like familiar with when we say read mapping. So we have a linear reference, we have a read, we are mapping that read against that linear reference. But the issue here is there, there are alternative sequences like references in the population, which are still references, but we are ignoring them when we are performing sequence to sequence mapping. So the trend is switching to a graph representation to use as a reference, which is including this information we have in terms of like the genetic variations that exist in the population. So this is the way to exploit it. And, um, 
when we have a linear single reference, we are introducing reference bias because there's only one. But when we incorporate those genetic variations that exist in the population, then we are removing that reference bias, which is important. And um, with that, with that uh, changes, we uh, we observe um, not like noticeable quality improvements in the mapping. So, like, so the output we are getting. But as you can imagine, because of the graph representation, it's a more difficult problem, like computationally. And there is there was no prior hardware design for this problem. OK, so um, I introduced genome graphs, but I want to give you an example. So let's say this is our first sequence. So it is basically a single node, which we are kind of using in sequence to sequence mapping. But let's say in the population, we also have observe a typical like mutation, uh, if you will, on the fourth um, position where T is, which would like substituted with a G. So how we can represent this in a graph, we separate the common parts. We have one path for the first sequence and we have another path for the second sequence. Let's say we have another sequence where there's an additional like inserted T, then we can have an like inner another path possible uh, with where we have this T as a, another node. And let's say that um, T on the fourth position is deleted altogether in it's like a subsequence of the uh, like the genomes in the population, then we can have a direct path from the first and last nodes to represent that. And as a reference, we can use this genome, like this representation of the genome to perform our uh, mapping. But the pipeline I introduced you as part of genasm, as you know, is handling only like linear sequences as references. So we need an adjusted pipeline. What it means is, as part of the pre-processing steps, before performing the indexing, first we need to generate this graph, uh, genome graph. So we need to construct it using a starting reference genome and known variations. And then we index that uh, genome graphs nodes and come up with our hash table based index or any type of index. And then seeding is like similar to what we observed. and. Again, pre-alignment filtering with the same goal, but there, the of course, because we are dealing with a graph, the uh, how we do it can differ. And finally, again, the alignment here is the last and expensive step, but this time, again, the difference is we are not aligning sequence to sequence, but we are aligning a sequence to a graph. And um, why this is important, why I'm emphasizing the alignment, because in the sequence to sequence alignment, we were even if, like with that less complexity, it was expensive. And what we were dealing with in the sequence to sequence alignments, so think about this as a dynamic programming matrix, and we were just in using the three adjacent cells to compute the current cell. And we knew what are those, like the indexes of those three cells. But when we switched to sequence to graph alignments, yes, those three um, adjacent ones are still there, but also there might be other like non-neighbor uh, edges coming in as like in uh, edges to the current node, which I call as hopes. So um, we, and they are irregular. So there's no regularity amount. So it, from any of the nodes, those uh, hopes could exist. So that the complexity is adding on top of sequence to sequence alignment because of that irregularity. So um, in order to further understand the issues with the um, sequence to graph alignment or sequence to graph mapping, we analyzed two state-of-the-art tools, Graph Aligner and VG, and we revealed um, that we have several observations. First, the alignment step is still the bottleneck, but as I mentioned, it's in worse, it's in a worse shape. Second, when we focus on alignment itself, because there are a lot of intermediate data that we are generating and consuming, we are suffering from high cache miss rates. And when we look at the seeding stage, it is suffering from, as expected, because we have irregular memory accesses to like uh, query the hash table or the index sitting in the memory. So DRAM latency is becoming the bottleneck. And um, none of these baseline tools are scaling linear. So um, these are the software-based limitations we observed. So we also talked about, okay, we have a lot of soft sequence to, um, 
sequence alignment accelerators out there? Can we utilize them for this problem? Not directly, because as you can imagine, sequence to sequence alignment is a like sub problem of sequence to graph alignment, and you cannot directly employ those accelerators for this problem. And for we also looked for there are tons of graph accelerators out there as well. We thought about whether we can utilize them for the seeding part. Yes, for the seeding part, maybe. But as I mentioned, as part of my first observation, seeding is not directly the actual bottleneck of the pipeline. So they could be helpful, but they are unable to handle the sequence to graph alignment problem because it's not a traversal problem, graph traversal problem. To this end, uh, as you can imagine, we need a completely fresh design for this uh, to address these problems and come up with an efficient accelerator. To this end, we propose SIGRAM. And um, SIGRAM is the first algorithm hardware co-designed genomic mapping accelerator, which can support both sequence to graph mapping and sequence to sequence, to sequence, to sequence mapping for both short and long reads. And uh, it is also the first algorithm hardware co-design or accelerator for sequence to graph mapping problem. And we uh, base SIGRAM upon a minimizer-based seeding problem, which is very commonly known, like as part of Minimap2, for example, and also novel bit vector-based alignment uh, algorithm, which is like which uh, is built on top of GNASM. And uh, for both algorithms, we co-design. Um, uh, high performance, scalable, and also efficient hardware accelerators. And this lists the hardware contribution of SIGRAM. <coughs> Sorry. So when we look at the SIGRAM hardware design, it's composed of two main components. The first one is MinSeed, which is responsible for the seeding part, and beta line, which is responsible for the um, sequence to graph alignment problem. And MinSeed is the first hardware accelerator for the minimizer-based seeding. And BitAlign is the first hardware accelerator for sequence graph alignment problem. And um, let's look at the um, execution for execution flow for SIGRAM. So we have a main memory attached to a full SIGRAM accelerator design. And in this one, we have the pre-processed graph structure and the index already like, because they are static structures, we can generate them once per genome and load them, preload them and utilize them. And the whole CPU is responsible for uh, streaming the query read into the um, CGRAM accelerator. So it starts with that uh, streaming process for the query read. Then uh, we write it to our, um, on chip scratch pad, which we call as read scratch pad because it's holding the query read. And then we find all the K length substrings, K MERS for the read, and find the minimizers out of that full set, which is the minimum representative set of those K MERS. And then write those to our on chip minimizer scratch pad. And for each minimizer, we visit the index structure sitting in the memory and uh, get their frequencies and filter them out based on the. Um, based on the each minimizer's frequency so that we are using the least frequent minimizers as part of our uh, further execution for minimizing compute needs. And after filtering the minimizers, we are getting the subset of the minimizers. And for each of those, we are writing them to seed scratch pad and then finding the regions surrounding each of those seeds in the uh, genome graph. And that's the uh, input along with the query read to our beta line accelerator. So beta line accelerator is, as I mentioned, built upon genism. So that's why it has a very similar structure except one major difference. And that one is when we generate the bit vectors, we don't write them just to the um, bit vector scratch path, which is TBS trams in the genism. Uh, language, we also write them to hop queues in order to handle the hops that we have um, within the graph structure. So we cannot just write the bit vector scratch path because they only contain the like the most recent set. But in order to handle hops, we need to hold the history, a at least a portion of the history. So that's why we have hop queues as part of the bit align design. And the rest is very similar. We write them to bit vector scratch pad. And now when it's done, we perform traceback and um, 
find the like the cigar string or the trace back output for the current um, inputs and then send the optimal alignment information back to the host CPU. So uh, when we look at the min state hardware design specifically, I, we kind of like went over it because we have three computational modules which we perform those three uh, simple logic operations. And then we have on-chip scratch pads to hold the, those intermediate data we need for the min state operation. And also the important parts, like the new part here is new information here is we uh, have high bandwidth memory, HBM as our main memory in order to have low latency and highly parallel memory accesses. And for bit align, again, it is very similar to Genasm. It follows a systolic array based um, accelerator design but uh, like it has PE, like processing elements, bit vector scratch pad. But as I mentioned, it has hop queues, like hop queue registers, basically shifting registers to hold the like most X many recent bit vectors to be able to handle hops. So let's look at the overall system design of Sigram. Um, as I mentioned, we have the host to stream the queries and get the output information. And we have a high bandwidth memory. And within one HPM stack, we have eight channels. And for each channel, we have one Seagram accelerator, which is composed of one min state and one beta line accelerators. And since we have eight channels, we have eight mini accelerators per stack. And within our design, we have four mini stacks, meaning we have four mini Seagram modules, in total 32 Seagram accelerators. So when we look at the use cases of Seagram, sequence graph mapping, which we already went over, one min seed, one bit LI. But the good thing about this design is they can be used separately as well, meaning sequ uh, sequence graph alignment or sequence to sequence alignment are our use cases as well, because bit LI can be used as a standalone and can be coupled with any seeding accelerator. And same for this uh, min seed, it can be used standalone and can be um, like used with any alignment accelerator. So same reason, I won't go into details of our methodology, but you can refer to our paper. And when we look at our results, starting with Ariane Power, we uh, observed that, um, that like this is our total power and area, including the HBM, but I want to highlight two things here. So uh, the cost of being able to support both sequence to graph and sequence sequence problems is the uh, hop cues, right? The new addition to our design. And they are, of course, costing us area and power, which is the main contributor of the total area and power of Sigram. So that's the one of the highlights here. And when we look at the um, performance and power consumption results for all these three use cases, we reveal that again, based on, compared to state-of-the-art software, for um, both of these sequence to graph mapping and sequence to graph alignment problems, Seagram is providing better performance and lower power consumption. And for sequence to sequence alignment, because we already have accelerators exist for this problem, we compared the throughput. But as I mentioned, because of the additions to support graph alignment or graph mapping in terms of like area or power, we are not better of course, for uh, compared to these sequence to sequence alignment accelerators. But in terms of performance, we are even better than Genasm because of some uh, tweaks we did to the beta line design. But on top of that, um, we are, uh, Sigram is better compared to the other hardware baselines as well. And here are the additional details that you can find in the paper. And to conclude, uh, in this work, we propose Sigram, which is the first hardware accelerator for sequence to graph mapping and alignment problems. And um, we are, uh, we, as I showed, we, uh, Sigram supports multiple use cases. And for all of those, it is more efficient and outperforms state of the art software and hardware solutions. And similar to Sigram, the um, Paper is online, you can find it uh, easily. And also the actual talk on, that I gave in ISCA last year is available. And also we released our uh, source code for Beteline and also the data sets, data sets that we analyzed or generated like the graphs, for example, they are available as well. Thank you.
Questions for Damla? Anyone? Maybe I'll ask a question sure. on Seagram. Is there a trade-off between performance and accuracy? Yeah, sure. So unfortunately, yes. As I mentioned, those hope Q registers is what enables us to per, like perform sequence graph alignment. And in that, in order to save some space like area or power, we have to limit the size of those um, registers. So that's that's the cost we are paying. So and we limit it in this work and uh, you can limit further or you can expand it to have like and the trade off is there like between perform not just performance area and power as well. Sure, yeah. But when we shrink it, of course, we are losing some edges that's already there. Some mm -hmm. variation formation, which is costing us accuracy. OK, and you analyze it in the paper. Yes. So there's some analysis. Yes. Is it oh there is a question okay in the back yeah. yeah I was going to ask is it possible to uh, like how much hardware cost do you need to get rid of that inaccuracy so as I mentioned it's pretty irregular it really mm -hmm. depends on the data yeah. set mm -hmm. you have so it's kind of inevitable because the edges can be common coming from like many many nodes away and it's not really and you are wasting a lot in between because you are saving a lot so it's kind of inevitable but maybe some people will come up with better yeah. design better algorithms some like... virtualization yeah into the software can help sure. i think sure. yeah because hopefully it's not going to happen often exactly maybe you call yeah. software when needed exactly yeah. yes exactly. i think that's possible yeah okay mohammed so can you adapt uh, other uh, can you adapt some other sequence aligners to or, fix the accuracy issue, for example, um, like GWFA or any of those for graph based? Models? Yeah, some ideas maybe possibly. So in this work, we try to, so it's, I cannot say it's perfect. It is, for example, missing the uh, filtering part as well. There's no filtering happening. So there's a lot of opportunities available in Instagram and of course, getting inspired by other existing software is definitely an option. What we did in this work is inspired by Genasm, but there are other algorithms or better versions of Genasm like Joel, for example, proved with Sucrooge is possible. Yeah, sure. I see, but you already have great speed up even without filtering, yes. right? Yes, so... that's, that's true, but it can be even better. That's exactly, do you think you can still have end-to-end -end speed up even with replacing Genasm with something else or uh, the alignment part of uh, Seagram with? Possibly, like another hardware design. I don't believe with software it's that easy because as you know, we tweak with all the uh, like components exist, like on-chip SRAMs, on-chip scratch pads, everything like memory. So we designed in a very balanced way, but yeah. So in other hardware designs with other uh, software available out there, it's possible. So it's a moving uh, domain. So. Yeah, perfect. Um, thanks. Thank you. Okay, no more questions. Okay, we're running 15 minutes late anyway. So let's thank Damla. I knew this would happen. Thank you, Damla. We started late. So <laughs> Joel will put us on track. Yes, I can. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah exactly. Now you don't need to go into genism in detail. That's the good part. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Joel Lindeger. Joel is a PhD student at ETH Zurich, uh, and he's been working on bioinformatics acceleration and algorithms during his master's thesis as well as PhD. He's going to present what he has finished in his master's thesis, which is going to build on Damla's talk. It's going to be what's wrong with genism and how we can really fix it. <laughs> also, Damla is, of course, involved in this work, too. So now you'll hear uh, what's better than genism. And Joel actually gave this talk also at Seek a couple of hours ago, and he received a lot of questions over there, which were quite good. And he handled them well. Thanks, very exciting. Okay, now it's yours. Once your slides get ready, I guess. The microphone good? 
this one I think you need. <laughs> Right. Okay. Right. Great, great. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Joel. I'm a second year PhD student these days, and I'm presenting to our work Scrooge, fast memory frugal genomic sequence aligner for CPUs, GPUs, and ASICs. So let's start with a high level overview. Oh, slides are also in the problem over here, apparently. But um, so uh, this pairwise genomic sequence alignment, I guess Dama just introduced it, she introduced it in the context of read mapping. It's of course occurs in uh, all the genomics workloads as well, um, including the novel assembly, and it's of the bottleneck in these pipelines. Um, so Genasm, as you just saw, is a prior work and it's uh, doing this, it builds this dynamic programming table out of bit vectors. Uh, top down and then it does some kind of traceback operation. Um, and we want to work with JASM in this work because it uses only bitwise operations and those can be particularly efficient in hardware. Now, our goals in this work on top of JASM is to build a practical and efficient implementation of the JASM algorithm for multiple computing platforms first. And second, uh, we want to compete with state-of-the-art parallel sequence aligners like EDLIB, KSW2, and PyWFA. This end, we propose Scrooge, which includes three novel algorithmic improvements which address uh, inefficiencies in the genasm algorithm that we will identify shortly. And um, we want to have efficient open source implementation for CPUs and GPUs, which yeah, we provide in Scrooge. And um, we observed that uh, Scrooge consistently outperforms Genasm, such as by 2.1x on CPU, 5.9x on GPU, and if implemented as an ASIC, it has a 3.6x better area efficiency. We also observed that Scooch consistently outperforms state-of-the-art CPU and GPU baselines, including uh, KSW2, EDLib, and PyWFA. Okay. Uh, I guess we can go fairly quickly through the background. So this pairwise sequence alignment, I want to introduce it in a bit more detail than, Gen than Damla just did. Um, the reason is that we need to look at traceback later. Um, so parallel sequence alignment should compare a pair of strings while allowing edits, so substitutions, insertions, and deletions. Substitutions means individual characters get replaced. Um, insertions means one letter is missing in one of the strings. And the deletion is the opposite. It's just the odd string that's missing the character. Um, now we want to report exactly how a pair of strings differs. Um, so we've represented with something like this. So see, um, we, want to re 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 we want to represent this as a set of edit instructions. So how do you transform, for example, for example, Safari into Salami? Well, you take two characters exactly like they were, two equals, you substitute one character, one X, you make another character equal, and you substitute another one and so on. Then an insertion you would report like this. You have two equal characters, then one I on insertion, and so on. Delete to the Z. Um, we call this a cigar string, and that's the main output from sequence alignment that we're interested in. Typically, we compute this with arithmetic dynamic programming, which uh, takes three neighbor nodes, fills the dynamic programming table with numbers using arithmetic operations. And uh, that's how many well-known algorithms like Needleman Wunsch, Smith Watchman, or Wavefront work. Um, and as Dama showed, the key differences in Genasm is that it uses these bitwise operations to build a table of bit vectors instead. And the bitwise operations are particularly interesting because they can be particularly efficient in hardware. This can be bitwise ands, bitwise ors, and so on. Um, now, here we're getting to the uh, extra introduction, let's say, on top of Dama's talk, I think. So what's really important for, for Scooch is exactly how this table is used afterwards. So after the table is built by actually the forward computation, which is called Genasm DC, um, we look in the leftmost column, the table for the topmost zero. 
but this is marked pink in this table, and that indicates the edit distance. So the first zero is in the second row, which stands for one edit distance. And uh, from there, we start trace back to obtain the cigar string. Trace back um, tries to reverse engineer where that zero came from. So through which bitwise opera operations that zero was propagated from the beginning somewhere in the top right. That's how we obtain the cigar string. Okay, so that was my extended introduction on the genasm algorithm. Now the uh, genasm algorithm was already very efficiently implemented as an accelerator in Damba's work. A6 stands for application specific integrated circuit. I guess I don't need to explain this again, um, but the question for Scrooge was, well, can we do even better at implementing uh, the algorithm as an ASIC? Uh, and for commodity hardware, such as CPUs and GPUs, of course are very different, okay. Um, can we uh, make it suitable for commodity hardware like CPUs and GPUs? Um, maybe it already works, and if it doesn't work, uh, can we make it work? So to answer these questions, uh, we first looked at memory bandwidth. So we did a roof line analysis and we wanted to know does commodity hardware, state-of-the-art commodity hardware have enough off-chip memory bandwidth. So we got from the data sheet of a state-of-the-art CPU and the state-of-the-art GPU, we got their off-chip memory bandwidth and compute throughputs. And then we calculated the operational intensity of the genasm algorithm. So the y-axis uh, is throughput, higher is better. The x-axis is operational intensity. Um, and ideally, we'd always like to have our algorithms operate up here. So the intersection point between the algorithm and the peak compute throughput of the respective hardware. Now, what the roofline model shows us is that um, in reality, we can at best operate at the intersection point between the operational intensity and the memory bandwidth, the object memory bandwidth in this case. And as you can see here, there's a large gap between the desired and the actual operating point. So this translates to lost performance. Um, and the lost performance comes from limited off-chip memory bandwidth. So that's the first inefficiency we observe in GNASM if we were to implement it in commodity hardware, simply has too much data movement. Second, we analyze the memory footprint of GNASM. The idea here is that if there's enough on-chip memory in commodity hardware, maybe the off-chip bandwidth is not such an issue because the on-chip memory of commodity hardware has really high bandwidth, much higher than off-chip. So if we can fit everything in on-chip memory, then the earlier point is maybe not so bad. So we took from the, the numbers from the data sheet of these uh, two state-of-the-art CPU and GPU architectures, um, and we calculated the memory footprint of GNASM. As you can already see, um, the L1 cache of the CPU uh, already cannot fit the memory footprint of GNASM. And in the GPU case, uh, this works barely. It fits barely one instance of the GNASM algorithm per core. But as soon as we start to introduce simultaneous multi-threading, it's called hyper-threading in Intel terminology, um, the picture changes. So uh, using multi-threading or uh, simultaneous multi-threading or hyper-threading means you want to have multiple threads uh, per hardware core. So the hardware can alternate between executing the threads and fully use all the compute resources in that core. However, to have two threads to execute on, we need to have two instances of GNASM in memory at the same time, which here in this case doubles our memory footprint. And on the GPU, the picture looks much worse because GPUs really uh, are intended to have much more intense simultaneous multi-threading with many instances and many threads per core. This could be, for example, three, four, five, six uh, instances in memory at the same time per core. And then the GPU on-chip memory also is nowhere near sufficient. So that's the second inefficiency in GNASM that you observe. Um, there's a large memory footprint and it's especially bad when there are multiple instances in memory due to simultaneous multi-threading. A third part you observe um, is that actually there's some amount of work in GNASM that's unnecessary. So recall GNASM builds this table top down, then does this trace back from left to right. Let me show the animation again. It builds a table top down and then builds a uh, 
uh, cigar string from the left to right. And what you might have observed there is that there's a large area of the table that's never looked at by traceback. This large area is nevertheless computed by genasm, even though traceback does never use it, and we can call that unnecessary work. So why compute it if you never look at it again? Uh, that's the third inefficiency that we identify. So let me summarize again these three inefficiencies. Uh, it has a large memory bandwidth. It requires uh, a lot of memory footprint, and it does some unnecessary work. Now, in the Scooch algorithm, we aim to address these inefficiencies in three algorithmic improvements. They consist of two memory improvements and an efficiency improvement. The memory improvements that we propose uh, reduce both the memory footprint and data movement. Well, the efficiency, okay, uh, yeah, we call them Sena and Dent, and the efficiency improvement eliminates the unnecessary work. I call this early termination or ET. Let's look at these improvements one by one. So Sena stands for store entries, not edges. It comes from the observation that what Genasm actually stores is not just the table, but rather for each entry the table, it stores three ingoing edges. It's quite a natural thing to do, actually, if you need to do this orange trace back and follow this origin of the zero uh, over here to the right, then you need to somehow traverse these edges backwards. And then, okay, the first solution that you arrive is clearly remembering the edges and seeing where it came from. Um, however, that costs us somehow more memory than just storing the entry itself. And we observe in Scrooge that it's sufficient to just store the entry itself. And the edges that are needed can be regenerated during trace traceback if they are needed and when they are needed. Um, and that immediately gives us a 3x reduction in memory footprint and data movement. So storing entries instead of edges. The second optimization we propose is called DENT. So DENT stands for discard entries not used by traceback. And uh, it comes from the observation that traceback is confined to a small area of the DP table due to Genasm's windowing heuristic that Damla introduced earlier. So in particular, it means that a large part of the DP table, although it does need to be computed due to data dependencies, uh, it does not need to be stored because traceback does not reach it later. So by simply discarding these bits after the data dependencies are resolved, uh, leads to a forex reduction in memory footprint and data movement. Okay, so those were our memory improvements. Now for the efficiency improvement, we propose early termination. The early termination, uh, simply the insight that we can check for that zero in the leftmost column here marked in purple in real time. So as soon as we find that zero in the leftmost column, that will indicate the edit distance and start traceback. Uh, we stop populating the table and we start traceback from right there. Um, recall again that traceback cannot reach anything below that zero, any row that's lower than the edit distance. So it's entirely fine to just wait for that zero to show up over there and stop immediately. Since the unnecessary work was that we had computed uh, this area below here, we just eliminated <laughs> all of it. We calculate actually that um, this amount of unnecessary work down here that we save, um, that's at least 25% in expectation can be more. So if there are very similar sequence pairs, it can be much more than just 25%. Okay, so uh, those are the three optimizations in Scrooge. Um, we provide open source implementations uh, of everything for both CPUs and GPUs, an easy to use library interface. Um, okay, we target recent NVIDIA GPUs, we include multi threading in our CPU version. And yeah, you can find all source code and evaluation scripts on our GitHub repository. Um, but uh, let's dive into some evaluation here. So we evaluate on two data sets. First, a long read data set, we simulate it using PVSIM2 from the human reference genome, and then obtain uh, candidate locations uh, of a realistic read mapping style evaluation um, using Minimap2. 
And then we get a real Illumina data set and follow again the methodology with Minimap 2 to obtain candidate pairs. We uh, evaluate on a re recent Intel CPU, it's a Xeon Gold 5118 with plenty of RAM and then an NVIDIA RTX A6000. For the ASIC evaluation, we use the 28 nanometer logic synthesis from the prior work and we get SRAM numbers from CAC test 7. On the long read evaluation, so we plot here on the axis align, uh, alignments per second, higher is better. Um, and we observe that on CPU, Scrooge outperforms all baselines, uh, including Genasm, but also these uh, yeah, different variants of WFA. Uh, and again, on GPU, Scrooge in blue outperforms all baselines. In particular, Scrooge outperforms Genasm by 2.1x in the CPU and 5.9x for GPU for long reads. Um, for short reads, we do the same evaluation. The y-axis is alignments per second, higher is better. Uh, and again, for CPU, Scrooge outperforms all baselines, and also for the GPU, Scrooge outperforms all baselines. Particular for short reads, uh, Scrooge outperforms just max 2.8x or 2.4x on GPU. Um, we also do an ASIC evaluation, as I said, and you observe that, first of all, the improvements in Scrooge, they really don't cause any computational overhead. Um, that's because yeah, they're computationally simple. There's, for example, an um, indent means to simply mask out some bits when writing back, back to a scratch pad. Um, however, uh, Scrooge's on-chip memory becomes much, much cheaper thanks to our algorithmic improvements. So in particular, because both the memory footprint and bandwidth requirement is much lower with Scrooge's algorithmic improvements, at the scratch pad memory, the on-chip memory becomes much, much cheaper, just 18x um, for this specific memory component. For the entire chip, uh, Scrooge uses 3.6x less chip area and 2.1x less chip power than an uh, equivalent genome ASIC. Um, so, yeah, we do much more in-depth evaluation in our paper, including throughput sensitivity of each algorithmic improvement, uh, threat scaling results, rigorous accuracy analysis, more sensitivity analysis for the windowing parameters on throughput and accuracy, and then a breakdown of the exact ASIC components that we improved. Um, here's our paper in bioinformatics, and our uh, paper is also an archive that we keep updating this version with new results as we have them. And of course, our GitHub uh, release with all source code and evaluation scripts um, is also available. Let me conclude with a short summary. Um, so we observed that pairwise sequence alignment is computationally costly and a common step in bioinformatics pipelines. Genasm is a promising candidate to address this issue. Our goals were to build a practical and efficient implementation of Genasm for multiple computing platforms and computer state-of-the-art pairwise sequence aligners like EDLIP, KSW2, and BiWFA. To this end, we proposed Scrooge, which includes three novel algorithmic improvements that address inefficiencies in the Genasm algorithm, which we identified. And Scrooge includes efficient open source CPU and GPU implementations of the improved algorithm. We observed that Scrooge consistently outperforms Genasm, such as by 2.1x on CPU, 5.9x on GPU, and there's a 3.6x better area efficiency when implemented as an ASIC. Finally, Scrooge consistently outperforms state-of-the-art CPU and GPU baselines, including KSW2, EDLIB, and BiWFA. We conclude that Scrooge efficiently and effectively accelerates pairwise sequence alignment using multiple computing platforms. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks Joel for the talk. Any questions? No questions? Domna must have some questions. There you go. So this is, as you mentioned, based on genasm, but do you think besides, so there's one implementation here, we got inspired in Seagram, but can we do the other way? You think what else we can do on top of Scrooge to make it efficient for the new problem of graph alignment, for example? Um, 
great question. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think uh, both early termination and uh, dent will also be to some extent applicable to graph alignment. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes a bit more challenging uh, to ad adapt them to graph alignment, I think, because of all the irregularity that happens during traceback over them. Uh, but for sure, these ones will be uh, adaptable at mm -hmm. least mm -hmm. graph alignment. Yeah, but I think it's a good maybe discussion on brainstorming topic. Like, because what you did in Scrooge is ex find the, especially the memory issues on the genasm side and like make it much better. And as we observed in Seagram, it has even worse issues on the memory side, which is up for better solutions. So put for thought. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, sounds great. And I agree. Thanks. Any other questions? Maybe I'll ask a question related to WFA and by WFA. Why, why does this perform so much better than, let's say, all of those WFA variants? Um, well, uh, so uh, first of all, mm. you observe that WFA performs very, very well uh, when sequence pairs are similar. In fact, um, one version of WFA can almost reach Scrooge's throughput when they get short reads with low diversions. But mm. the picture looks quite different um, when we have a data set with a bit more divergence in the sequence pairs. And in that case, all WFA variants uh, start to struggle. Mm. So I think, first of all, Scrooge, Genasm handle highly divergent, or, or at least data sets where part of the sequences are highly divergent very well. Um, and then second, uh, Scrooge benefits from the windowing approach in Genasm, mm -hmm. uh, which makes everything very efficient. Mm -hmm. um, we have predictable sizes of dynamic programming tables, which should give us uh, efficient implementations going through. So this divergent, um, this, this lack of good performance when you have divergent input sets, was this, well, was this known when WFA was developed? Uh, is this fundamental to how WFA works? Essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, WFA gets slower uh, the more diversion the sequence pair is. Um, that's known. Yeah. Okay. Okay. With more brainstorming. <laughs> Maybe also the functionality of the goal is good. So you have a bit more like stage that's true. I mean, so one, one thing in particular is that Scooch, of course, works over edit distance. Um, we evaluate it against a by WFA edit distance. So that is also an edit distance formulation of WFA. And that's why it's actually fastest variant of WFA, mm. um, because it's a slightly easier problem for sure. Um, and then, of course, the other key difference is that WFA does guarantee exact results mm -hmm. um, while Scooch does not give an optimality guarantee, um, although we show that in practice um, it gives in, in over 99% of cases, it gives the exact alignment, optimal alignment. I think this is still very useful. For example, ISAT 2 doesn't use alignment at all. In fact, we're training that the heuristic solution to do graph based alignment. So I think if you kind of have a graph based alignment with Scooch, would be still very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so this is tested on more complex regions of the genome. Uh, because I know that for most tools, they usually leave out those complex regions and just give, give you results for maybe like easier parts of the genome. And, uh, and when you're comparing your screws with the others, uh, you really don't have a chance to actually test it out on those complex areas. But um, has this been the case for um, so we, we uh, test the scooch on a, it's a great question, by the way, it's, uh, the, the, the answer is a bit uh, long, unfortunately, but um, let me make it short. So we test the scooch on a range of uh, different data sets with different divergence. Um, 
So we did uh, short reads, we did uh, long reads, which yeah, are chained. So many candidate pairs are actually four candidate locations, so they have high divergence. Um, Scrooge performs still good performance wise. Um, and Scrooge performs well accuracy wise when, um, when the actual, uh, let's say, for example, in the read mapping, the desired output are the pairs that have relatively low divergence. Right? And those Scrooge does very well in terms of accuracy. Um, but we observe that uh, when we get to these complex or repetitive regions, that uh, the windowing heuristic can lead to these wrong results. Um, so we have a yeah, bit of a longer discussion about that in our supplementary materials, um, where we go into exactly under which circumstances we would see that behavior. Okay, I think I'll have to cut off the questions at this point. You can ask more to Joel later. Thanks, Joel. Thanks a lot. Now we'll move to the next talk. It's Banu. Uh, Banu is going to talk about... Uh, are you going to use your computer? Or... Oh, okay, okay, if it works. Okay, Banu is uh, doing her master's at ETH, and she's going to talk about target call, which introduces the idea of pre-based calling filtering. And this work was also presented in an earlier session at Recom Seek. So she's going to repeat the talk and do it even better. <laughs> uh, what else? <laughs> okay, you need to set up the microphone. That's right. Microphones, since we have two set up. And we're running 15 plus minutes late, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> bon is going to speak fast. <laughs> Are you going to speak fast, Bono? <laughs> make it make it exciting. <laughs> and then the last one is Damla. <laughs> oh yeah, we can we can leave Damla's talk then. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, we started late, but yeah, Damla put us later, and then I asked people to ask questions to Joel. So. <laughs> That introduction as much as that's right, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we should get started without more delay. Can I hide the cables? Yes, yeah, okay. go ahead. Uh, what you want to take the perfect picture of you with your name? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, as Onru said, I'm Banu, and I will present Target Call, which was done at ETH Zurich by the Safari Research Group. And our motivation in this work is that base calling can consume up to 84.2% of the total execution time, and it becomes a major computational head for the pipeline. And what we, what we observe is that this, much of this computation is wasted because majority of the base call reads are discarded after base calling. And our goal is to eliminate this wasted computation in base calling with high accuracy, scalability, and adaptability. For this, we have the idea of proposing the pre-base calling filter that would filter out user suites before base calling. And we propose target call as a new pre-base calling filter that, that achieves this task in two steps. First, it uses a, a light call, which is like lightweight base color to perform noisy base calling on the raw electrical signals. Then it compares these noisy electrical signals to the reference enough to predict if the read is going to be useful. Our evaluation shows that we can improve the base calling and to end base calling performance by 3.3x by filtering out majority of the user suites. And when we compare it against the targeted sequencing approaches, we show that it achieves better recall, precision, throughput, and performance than the uh, prior targeted sequencing approaches that are repurposed as pre-based calling filters. Let's start with background and motivation. Genome sequencing enables us to determine the, the content of one organ, organism's genome, and it's important for areas such as in precision medicine, outbreak tracing, and understanding of evolution. And nanopore sequencing is a specific sequencing technology that we can use for genome sequencing uh, that's widely used, and that produces long arrays of tens of kilobase pair length with high throughput and low cost. 
the traditional pipeline for nanopore sequence analysis starts with genome sequencing, where the DNA fragments are converted to raw electrical signals when they are passing through the pore. Then these raw electrical signals are converted to a set of bases called as reads during base calling. And the common next step is to perform read mapping, which is explained a lot in this presentation already, where we match the read to the reference genome to determine if the read is going to be mapped or unmapped. And prior studies show that just base calling step takes uh, up to 84.2% of the total execution time, whereas the remaining downstream analysis takes less than 16%. And we conclude that base calling is a really a major computational head for the nanopore se traditional nanopore sequence analysis pipeline. And our observation in this work is that what worsens this situation for many applications is majority of this computation is wasted because we discard many reads after base calling. One such application is SARS-CoV-2 genome assembly, where less than 1% of the reads are useful, meaning not discarded after base calling, even though the entire data set is processed fully during base calling. And the typical reason why you have 99% of the reads is, as users is that they do not match the reference genome you know, that is of interest by the application you are targeting. So the key to take away is the user's reads based significant amount of base calling computation in the traditional pipeline. And we have an alternative for this, which is targeted sequencing. Instead of traditional pipeline, where we sequence all the reads and send them to the next step, in targeted sequencing, we perform sequencing selectively only on the useful reads. This is enabled by a functionality of the nanopore sequencer, where you can stop sequencing some certain reads with a reject command. And in targeted sequencing, the rejected DNA fragments are dis discarded from the sequencer, and the accepted ones are fully sequenced and sent to the base calling step. But this requires, us to, uh, this requires targeted sequencing to identify or have a method that would identify which reads are useful with reliable and high accuracy. And we have identified some limitations of these methods. They are not really increasing uh, limitations of targeted sequencing, but we identified that all of such methods uh, that perform targeted sequencing suffer from at least one of these three things. First, they have low sensitivity and they falsely reject many useful reads, or they have poor scalability in the sense that their performance and accuracy will drop significantly with increasing reference genome sizes or they have lack of adaptability to different use cases. So you cannot use all of them as is for any use case that you have. You might need another pre-processing step. And this is because many of them use, or some of them use neural network classifiers um, to classify if the read is useful and uses. And this classifier needs to be trained for each read set and reference genome we have. And that's why targeted sequencing approaches are not robust solutions for eliminating the basic computation in base calling. And our goal is to eliminate the basis of computation, but unlike other approaches, we want to maintain high sensitivity in keeping high sensitivity in keeping useful reads. We want to be scalable to large reference genomes, and we want to maintain adaptable to the different use cases. For this, we have target pro, which is a pre-based calling filter. I need to explain what's a pre-based calling filter, but before that, let's remember our approaches. Our first approach is traditional pipeline sequence and base call everything. Our second approach is targeted sequencing, where we selectively sequence some things and we show some limitations of these approaches. And what we propose is to a base calling filtering that performs selectively, that performs base calling selectively on, use, on the useful reads. And this is different from traditional pipeline because we don't base call everything. And this is different from targeted sequencing because we perform sequencing fully, but uh, we perform selection on the base calling step. And it's the opposite in actually targeted sequencing where you do selectively sequence things and you base call everything that is sequenced by the filter. And the, when we do that, we are actually converting the problem to an offline problem where you're just starting your filtering after you're completely done with sequencing and you have the, raw, the full signal data coming from the sequencer to be able to classify your reads. And what we do is, is we just at a filter step between sequencing and base calling step, and this filter needs to reliably identify whether a read is useful and users using the entire raw signal. And then the filter should stop the analysis of users' reads and should forward the useful reads to the base calling step. So the high level goal of target call is to really predict if the read is going to be useful for base calling. And it does so with two steps. First, light call completely base calls the raw signal that is coming from the nanopore sequencing in a noisy way. And then similarity check compares this noise read to the reference genome we have. And if the read is users, the analysis of that read is stopped at this point. 
Otherwise, the read is forward to the base, forward to the base color so that we maintain the base coloring accuracy for the useful reads fully. And target class high sensitivity because we use a highly accurate similarity check component, has good scalability because the performance of light color model is independent of the reference genome that we have or the size of the reference genome we have and is adaptable to any use case without any changes because light call model is generic across use cases and it doesn't require any retraining of the neural network model that we have. And that's why TIGPL is a robust solution for eliminating the base of computation based calling. Let's check our components. And our first component is, component is light call, which is a lightweight base color with a simpler neural network model that performs base calling in a noisy way. These reads are still highly accurate for us to be able to perform filtering, but not accurate enough, uh, not as accurate as we would have in full base calling. And we, um, we designed light call architecture by simplifying the state of the art base color bonito. And we performed the simplification in a way that we improved the performance significantly while maintaining most of the accuracy benefits of the complex neural network model we have. Mm -hmm. And we used three steps for doing this. First, we reduced the channel size of the convolution layers. Second, we removed the skip connections. And finally, we reduced the number of basic convolution blocks we have in the model. The final light for architecture, the series of or like repeated convolutional blocks with um, each one has, where each one has one or two units that include group convolution point wise convolution based normalization and regulators. And the second component is similarity check that tries to find if noisy read coming from light call and the reference genome that is determined based on the application that we are targeting is similar to each other. And depending on the answer, it labels the read as useful or useless. And this problem is very similar to read mapping problem. And we use the state of the art read mapper min map two for this pro problem. And let me show that if we combine light call and similarity check, so if we use the noise reads coming from light call module uh, in the minimap tool implementation, we can still get very high sensitivity up to 99.45% for keeping useful reads. And we show later in the paper that this is good enough because the loss of 0.5% of the useful reads can be tolerated with high sequencing depth of coverage. We have three use cases where we show the type pro is really scalable to large reference genomes and adaptable to any use case. The first one is SARS-CoV-2 detection, where we have the COVID as the reference genome that we have as a small reference genome. And we are trying to identify the COVID trees among the COVID and human sample, so that basically anything that is similar to our reference genome is labeled as useful for this use case. And we have a next, um, we have a similar use case where we have bacterial and viral samples where we try to identify the viral reads. But this time our reference genome contains multiple viral species, so it's a complex reference genome compared to the first one. And the last use case is targeting sepsis detection, where we have a large reference genome to show that we can actually really scale target code to large reference genome as well. And this use case is different because in this use case, our sample has bacterial and human reads, but we want to base call every bacterial thing. Since we don't know what you have as the bacteria in your, um, in your sample, we just deplete every human thing. And that's why in this use case, if your read is similar to the reference genome, you label, it, you label that as useless instead of useful. This is very different than the other ones. And it's going to be important for the results. Uh, to show the benefits of target call, we have two experiments. The first experiment is to show how much base calling speed up we can get with, uh, with target call. And we do so by comparing Bonito alone with Bonito preceded by target call to eliminate the feed, to filter out the user's feeds before base calling. And next, we compare target call against targeted sequencing approaches on call and sigma. Um, and our methodology was to use the labeling mechanisms of these targeted sequencing approaches as pre base calling filters and applying full base calling on the useful reads. And we compared the execution time recall and precision of these tools. Our data sets contained uh, a lot of things. Read set five different pieces from various organisms. Four of them are real and sampled from prior work. One of them simulated using deep simulator, but we open source everything so our results can be reproduced. And our reference genomes, we have four of them with uh, various reference genome lengths and ratio of useful reads in our samples. We used a system with NVIDIA M100 and Titan Me GPUs for the light call component of target call and an AMD CPU with 0.2 terabyte main memory for the similarity check component. But for SIGMAP and UNCALLED, we have a system with one terabyte main memory because SIGMAP and UNCALLED requires more memory than we have in the first system for large reference genomes. 
And our first result is to compare or to show how much base code speed out we can get with target call. And, one and the target call execution time includes both the filtering time and the base calling time of the useful reads that are identified by target call, not the ground truth. And we show that on average, we can achieve 3.3x base calling speed up with target call. And if you compare uh, the performance of different tools or different target sequencing tools with ta the target call, we see that on average, uh, target call performs up to 9.7x better uh, than prior tools. And more importantly, the speed up is actually, uh, or the, the performance improvement is more significant for large reference genomes, where we show that target call is 13.3x uh, better than sigma for the large reference genome. And we cannot even compare it to uncalled because uncalled cannot even generate the index for the human reference genome we have in this specific configuration, even though we have a system with one terabyte main memory. And we got a memory error during indexing for this tool. Next, we compare the recall, which refers to the ratio of useful reads that pass the filter among all the useful reads. And we show that target call achieves more than 99% recall on average. And target call can achieve up to 23% better recall than prior tools on average. Similar to performance, the recall improvements are going to be more significant for larger reference genomes as well, but on average, we are 15% better than the prior tools. But one thing that is important is that Sepsis use case doesn't really measure uh, the recall for finding human reads in the human sample. And we were curious if we really apply for a use case on call and SIGMAP as well as target call where we have a large reference genome and the what would be the recall for finding reads that are coming from that large, uh, large reference genome. And we measured the recall of these tools for finding human reads in the uh, in, in the sample and recall and SIGMAP, sorry, SIGMAP and on call only had recalls between 40 to 53 percent, where uncalled showed more than 96 percent recall. And our conclusion was that target call consistently provides high recall for all reference genome sizes that we tested and for all types of experiments we tested. Finally, we compared the precisions of these tools, and here precision refers to the ratio of useful reads that pass among the among the all reads that pass the filter, and on average our precision is more than 92 percent. And it's significantly better than prior tools, approximately 60% better on average than prior tools. We have more details in the paper about targeted sequencing, different light call designs we have, and more details on our evaluation methodology, more evaluation results, such as the base calling speed up and recall and precision provided by different light call architectures and how we finalize the target call design and to an accuracy and performance analysis across the entire genome sequence analysis pipeline, including variant calling, our throughput comparison to sigma pen arm call, where we have more than 1100x better throughput than these tools, which suggests that you can actually use target call as a real-time analysis tool as well, and the peak memory comparison of target call against that of sigma pen arm call. Please check our paper for more details. And we also open source our implementation, our evaluation scripts, and our data sets in our GitHub page. Let me conclude. So we propose a target call, which is an accurate, scalable, and adaptable pre-based calling filter that works in two steps. First, it uses a lightweight base color to perform noisy base calling on the raw electrical signals. And then it computes the similarity of the read to the reference genome to predict if the read is going to be useful for base calling. Our evaluations show that we can achieve significant base calling speed ups by filtering up majority of the useless reads with target call with high sensitivity. And we show that when, if you Repurpose targeted sequencing approaches as pre based calling filters, target college is better, recall, precision, performance, and throughput than these tools. Okay. I guess I'm fast enough, and do you have any questions? Okay, great. Thanks, Wanda. Any questions? Okay, one is a question. Maybe you can pass this. I have a question. So, um... You explain what are the issues with the target target sequencing, right? Uh, but it's uh, kind of based on a similar tool, right? Because they are also using neural network there. So my question is: after you have trained your pre uh, um, pre base call. calling filter, uh, the, the um, how is it uh, light. light light call? Yes. Could you use it inside the sequencing machine to get rid of those? Uh, reads yeah, online. Yes, you can use it, but the, the difference is that in targeted sequencing, you are doing this problem online. So you are trying to determine if the read is going to be useful while the read is being sequenced, so you mm -hmm. don't have the raw electrical signal. 
And that's why you need to um, tune your similarity check components such that it only checks the initial parts and it uses a noisy read that is coming uh, from the from light call and tries to predict in that way. And doing that accurately is, is harder than doing uh, the previous calling filtering accurately. But in terms of throughput, yes, light call matches the throughput of uh, and actually exceeds uh, like significantly the throughput of the sequencing in machines. So there is no reason why if you have a correct similarity check module, there's no reason why you cannot use light call for real time analysis. Mm -hmm. But that would in in summary would save time, right? Also from the Exactly. Mm -hmm. so but you cannot try that. I didn't try that, but we can try. You can try? Okay. Uh, so yeah. Because that, that is really different. So you cannot, I mean, you can try it as is as well, but it will have the limitations of prior tools as well. I don't think we would be able to achieve very high sensitivity in keeping useful risk at the, as high as we achieve now for the pre based coin mm -hmm. problem. But as I said, we could optimize the module for, for this particular problem. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. So you gave the sepsis example and from my such low performance for the sepsis case is because you actually require the precision to be higher in that case. Am I right? Exactly. Okay. So it makes target calls so much better at precision, precision than those tools in all cases. Okay. So basically... I think the answer is different for the tools that we compare. For SIGMAP, for example, they have a very complex index that uses KD trees, and the, the, the tree size becomes very huge as you increase, and also the depth and the, the number of branches you have becomes very huge as you increase the reference genome size, and you have to traverse all of them. And what they do is they never convert the raw signals to bases. And they have to do approximate matching of the signal values because nanopore sequencing doesn't produce exact floating point numbers with a very complex tree and their performance will drops significantly for filtering time and their precision is also not good because they I think limit the uh, the, the, the tree length or to the tree size somehow so that you have much more like candidate locations yeah. or so and then they perform they check just a, like one part and then they don't check the rest so they um, come exactly, up with a, or maybe a lot they more just say, "Oh, it's possible." We just say it as useful, and then they don't. They, their precision is not that high. For uncode, it's actually different. Um, it's actually still quite fast because their index structure is, is optimized. The filtering time is fast, but then the, the what they do is um, so once they have the raw signal, they try to generate many possible match locations. And when your reference is large, the many of them are like too much. And even though they are not matching in, in the base pair, it's uh, your, the likelihood of matching them in the raw signal domain is very high. So you have many more options. And because your reference genome size is large mm -hmm. and they don't want to lose uh, recall. So that's why they have their precision is both too low. But in, 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 in target call, what we do is we do base calling, but we just do it fast. Mm -hmm. And our accuracy is still good enough. So, for example, for the for the most complex model we tested, it's sixteen is smaller than the base than four percent, and that's still be very high precision and recall. So, uh, can we say that target call is currently the only um, the only tool doing what it does? Uh, that uses basically. neural network, yeah. Uh, so for the pre-based calling filter, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's the, actually the first tool that says it explicitly. Mm -hmm. But there are neural network-based classifiers. People have used neural networks for this type of problems, for targeted Sequencing, mm -hmm. but I don't know any base color that is designed specifically for being fast. By I mean, there there are base doesn't have that much accuracy, but it's all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? And we're still fifteen minutes late. Okay. <laughs> Domless talk will be only fifteen minutes, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Hopefully not. Okay, you need to change the multiples. Okay, next speaker is Damla. Well, we've already heard from her. 
But she's going to talk about uh, the work she's been doing at Bionanogenomics in this talk. No, it's okay. Yes, so if there are people joining now, Damla uh, was a PhD student in my group at CMU. She was the last student to graduate at CMU, from CMU, let's say. And uh, she already presented uh, the work that she had done uh, a part of the work that she had done for her PhD thesis. And then after that, she joined uh, Bionana Genomics as a staff software engineer in hardware acceleration, as you can see, kind of an interesting, let's say title, <laughs> software engineering and hardware acceleration group. <laughs> but we're gonna learn more about that right now, I guess. Domla, please go ahead. Thank you so much for the introduction, Allah. Perfect. Hello again. So um, this will be a different taste of presentation now. And as Honor covered, this will cover what I'm doing right now at BioNNL. And um, in BioNNL, our like goal is like a vision is transforming how the world sees the genome. And the reason is that we are hearing a lot about sequencing, right? Um, what we are doing at Bionano is not sequencing, it's a different type of genome analysis. And that's how we are wanting to transform. So, and let's start. So this is um, our genome variant continuum, if you will. And here we are seeing um, on the left-hand side, like starting from a whole chromosome up until one base pair as a continuum, as you can see it. And these are the, coloring is not great, but I hope it's visible. So, and uh, we are dealing with a lot of genomic, a lot of types of genomic variants out there. And as you can see from the spectrum, there's no single um, like technology, if you will, that can address all of it. So on the left-hand side, we are looking at karyotyping or fish or arrays to look at like more chromosome level changes or variations that we can observe. But on, and this part is called cytogenetics because it is looking at the chromosome level. And on the right-hand side, which we are extremely familiar with, we have sequencing, but as you can see from the spectrum, it's like range is pretty limited. So, and when we look at the cytogenetics, all of these um, like almost 50 years old operations, like the techniques that's out there have their own limitations. For example, fish is targeted that you can only look at one variant, one type of variant or in one location or in arrays, you are only able, so this like the resolution is high, as you can see, it's spinning a lot, but we can only look at gains or losses like more uh, GUS kind of analysis. And when you look at karyotyping, it's extremely labor intensive and uh, people really don't want to do it anymore. And it's very, as I said, it's, there's not really automated system as we are observing in, uh, for example, sequencing. So uh, as the title mentions, there's a gap between and to fulfill the full, like the complete of this genome you know, continuum because in order to reveal the answers, we need to be able to like, observe or reveal all types of genomic variants, which can start from one BP like a SNP or small indels or large structural variants. And uh, in order to close that gap to serve that unmet, uh, unmet need, um, we are hearing a lot of um, like improvements happening in the sequencing world for almost two decades. And um, recently, so not recently, but all of these companies are introducing either improved machines or newer machines in order to like, as I said, fill that gap. And, but uh, is, let me go back. We can see in the long reads, even in the long read world, we are pretty limited in terms of the continuum. And um, another issue is, again, highlighted here, the length of the read is a problem. So even if we have perfect sequencing with less like errors and those kind of things, there's this amount of gap 
available still need to be addressed with efficient workflows to be uh, able to answer all the questions. And we are not there yet. And um, we in genomics or bioinformatics, we love analogies. So I will introduce a new one here and that will motivate us why optical genome mapping is needed. So this is think about a, like a book and all the papers are shredded and we don't know this and we don't have any idea about what this is about and we have all these words. So when you look at just the words, we can like catch some of those spelling errors, like, like the synapses, you can think about them or something else maybe. But for example, we have this word, we have no idea without knowing the context, whether it is desert, desert, or if it is desert, is it a verb, is it a noun? So we have no idea without having any idea about the context. So that's what optical genome mapping that Bionano is focusing on is proposing here. It's providing a different perspective. It is providing a, like a different angle view to the genome. It's providing the context basically. It doesn't have the resolution of sequencing. We cannot go as low as one base pair level, but we are looking at the chromosome, maybe a full arm of chromosome in an automated way. So we, we have an end-to-end -end workflow to do that. That's what optical genome mapping or OGM is putting to the table. And as you can see here, um, what we believe is OGM with BioNNL is closing that gap. So it is covering all the cytogenetics approaches that's out there, which is a status quo basically that we are trying to replace. And also it's covering the missing piece from the sequencing world as well. And um, as you can like understood, understand from my title as well, the um, one of the goals is transforming the genomic analysis as well. But as you can see from here, the um, approach we are um, following is OGM has this piece well. So OGM plus NGS, like short read sequencing, is the way to perform the uh, like transform how genomic analysis is being performed. And in order to do that, uh, in the last several years, we, in, as like within the company, there are several acquisitions happening. For example, uh, I will match this figure with one of my figures from my first talk. So if you remember, we are starting with a sample prep and we go through a wet lab operation and then we get the DNA, which is exactly similar, like not, ex not exactly same, but similar enough in OGM workflow as well. And afterwards you can, Put that, um, of course, how you prepare the, like the um, DNA is, or the sample differs between technologies. They have their own techniques, but from a sample, you can gather something that is suitable for OGM, like our sapphire system and the sequencing. And one of the acquisitions was for the initial wet lab part, for example. And the one, another acquisition was for the last part data analysis and exclinical from biodiscovery. So our goal is kind of like filling the cytogenetics gap with OGM and coupling it with NGS so that we can have an end-to-end workflow that covers um, the missing pieces from each. And, pro and as I said, the important thing is revealing all types of variants, not just several types of them. So um, I will go over the OGM workflow to give you an idea, especially the last part, which is of interest to the group, the analysis part. But um, some details are important in the initial parts as well. So I will go through end to end. Starting with uh, isolating the um, ultra high molecular weight DNA, the next step is labeling it with um, and staining specific sequences. So there is a specific sequence with this, um, and we call it DLS. We stain the isolated DNA with that specific, specific length, specific characters, and which means that when we label it within the DNA, whenever that sequence appears, we have a label out there. So as I mentioned, reminder, we don't, we don't look at the genome in the base pair level. We are looking at a higher resolution, like larger view. And 
after we label it, stain it, we transfer the labeled DNA into the um, chip and we load this chip into the instrument. And you can think it uh, like that. So this is how we label it, stain specific parts. And within the instrument, what's happening is that DNA is being linearized and it's going through nanochannels to achieve that. And then the um, labels like are being imaged. So we are taking snapshots basically and with in, within repeated cycles. And then we gather these kind of Im images out of the instrument. And at that point, the analysis starts. And this is basically the primary analysis, if you would want to call it that way. What's happening is we get these images and convert them into like um, molecules in Bionana vocabulary. And they are basically the digital maps, what we achieve. So they are basically saying in this relative position, so we are talking about positions and they are floating points, which is important to understand the complexity of the secondary analysis that we are dealing with. And um, we are getting those molecules out of these images, which contains the relative positional information out of the um, original genome, basically. And those molecules are the inputs to our analysis pipelines. And when we um, think about the pipeline, it's pretty similar in terms of major stages we are performing, but what we are dealing with, again, not ACGTs, but these locations, relative locations of these um, labels. And then what we do is we align again these molecules to reference maps and then we construct a consensus genome map and by using that and comparing it with reference maps we are visualizing and revealing structural variations basically and this is one of our like famous plots called surface plots it's another final vocabulary so this is the and yeah go ahead the location the label itself, the label that you remember that specific land specific label, the locations of those labels. So we know that sequence. And if we see a label in one position of those images, it means that that, lab that sequence appears in that specific region, like location. Okay. Does it make sense? Okay. I have several more questions. If I can drop it no, no, go ahead. Um, so on the same line of question, actually, but sure. as how is measured? Is it? I guess it's not base pairs, and so you're not looking at base pairs. So it's centimeters. It's kind of base pairs, starting with zero, but we cannot be exact. That's that's the problem. That's why it's floating point. Okay. So we have a molecule, right? We know it, and it's ha it's so we have relative position based on that. Like this is a zero. This is, however, the number of labels we have, and this is the relative position in it. Does it make okay. sense? Yeah. Then, um, it's kind of in base pairs because that's the metric, right? But we cannot be exact. That's why it's floating points. Okay. <coughs> then and you said you would linearize, you take what you label it, and at some point in the sequence, it gets linearized and it flows to a nanopause essentially. No, no channel. I said. Nano, nano channel. <laughs> um, it sounds an awful lot like nanopores. Um, why does this? It sounds. It also sounds like it doesn't. Only present a bit in his introduction. As it cuts um, the wool balls, or uh, you know, the balls of of, of DNA. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that happening here also? And if not, what's the magic sauce? Yeah, it's it's happening, but it's not. So we have way larger molecules. So it's more. It's more intact than you would see in the sequencing world because of the wet lab operation. We are having extremely large molecules, sometimes even an arm length, our chromosome arm length. So, and we don't have like, we are not using electric current like nanopore is using, and we are using nanochannels to linearize the DNA. We are purely doing imaging. So we label fluorescently the DNA and to linearize it because it's like this, right? Yeah. And in order to linearize it within the instruments, we are using our channels. And when, after it's linearized, because so let me do this. 
So I have a video showing it. Maybe it will ease things a little bit. So, so is um, is it sharing the full screen, Jan, or just the presentation? Is it directly showing this one, right? The, uh, that's showing the, that's the is Sapphire okay. from Bio Nano Genomics. With it, you can directly image the genome in high resolution and detect variations such as deletions, duplications, translocations, and versions known as structural variations. Where sensitivity is higher than nine percent. The process is simple and automated to enable routine use in disease research. Structural variation commonly occurs in a broad range of diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases, intellectual disabilities. Okay. And various types of cancer. First, native ultra high molecular weight DNA, multi megabase pairs and length, is also there. Doesn't go down. Fluorescent labels are enzymatically attached to these ultra long molecules of DNA at a specific sequence that occurs throughout the genome. The resulting label patterns are unique for each section of the genome. The full length of the DNA remains intact during isolation well, and labeling. Here. Just observing the architecture for the next step, okay. imaging the genome. The labeled DNA is pipetted into the sapphire chip and placed in the sapphire instrument. In the chip, the DNA is uncoiled. Okay. This is sapphire from BioNanoGenomics. With it, you can directly image the genome in high resolution and detect variations such as deletions, duplications, translocations, and inversions, known as structural variations, whose sensitivity is high as 99%. The process is simple and automated to enable routine use in disease research. Structural variation commonly occurs in a broad range of diseases, including neurodegenerative disease, intellectual disabilities, and various types of cancer. First, native ultra-high molecular weight DNA, multi-megabase pairs in length, is isolated. Fluorescent labels are enzymatically attached to these ultra long molecules of DNA at a specific sequence motif that occurs throughout the genome. The resulting label patterns are unique for each section of the genome. The full length of the DNA remains intact during isolation and labeling, preserving the architecture for the next step, imaging the genome. The labeled DNA is pipetted into the sapphire chip and placed in the sapphire instrument. In the chip, the DNA is uncoiled or linearized across thousands of parallel nanochains and imaged, revealing its fluorescent label patterns. By capturing these images in repeated cycles across the hundreds of thousands of nanochannels in the chip, all the images necessary to assemble a map of an entire genome are captured. Algorithms extract molecules from the images, and then bio-nano algorithms construct consensus genome maps. BioNano Access software also allows easy visualization and filtering of SV calls using our built-in control SV database. From the thousands of SVs found in any human sample, you can remove variants present in controls and narrow down your SVs of interest to a handful with just a few clicks. This is all enabled due to the extremely long molecules isolated and imaged with the Sapphire system. Those make sense now. Or at least more make, makes more sense. It feels quite magic that the molecules stay uh, longer than. Uh, it's all about like the reagents, everything you are using. And as I said, we are not using nano channels to measure or detect. We are just using it for linearizing them. That's still quite a complex problem. I'm curious about how those channels work physically to be able to linearize such long. Yeah, it's the whole the, the <laughs> instrument itself. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the whole technology so itself. This is the bias. So, so I think the key problem is is it inherent to um to this approach of optic mapping that it can stay as long, or can potentially if uh, let's say some unnamed other companies uh, that do kind of uh, nanopore uh, based stuff. Um, if they had a similarly a similar library integration set of these machines, could they do all the electrical signals they do continue to touch on with? So it's fundamental to optical imaging. So what because we are doing imaging, that's what affects our wet lab operations. I don't know the details of how nanopore 
like ONT is or other companies like that is performing data wet lab or what makes it like less like more chopped fragments I don't know that but what we are doing is labeling like staining them I, I as far as I know that's not Oxford nanopore or something like that is doing they are using nanopores to measure it we are not using it to measure it all of our workflow is based on imaging so yeah I mean this is working to like almost a luminous sort of thing, right? Like, like the pair, the chemical, logical thing. Whereas the, but the other small bit, which yeah, is sure. quite good. Yeah, yeah, sure. So is the labeling here the heat concern? Not screening the molecule itself, that's why I'm Possibly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's no PCR that you can see. No. So, okay, and then, uh, so in a repeating cycle, so it's TPS kind of deal? Um, not really, like not really. So we are getting different molecules out of each imaging. So because the DNA is moving forward, mm -hmm. when it's moving forward, we are taking snapshots basically. So it's literally corresponding to other portions of the genome. So because there's been repeated cycles. Yeah, get repeated cycles because it's moving, right? Oh. The DNA is moving within the channels. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's we are taking it's like time shots, like time lapse. Does this oh, make sense? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's so interrupted. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it can lead to discussion. Okay, yeah, after. let's discuss later. Yeah. Finish the okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Um and um is this something that you may not like? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> okay, so uh, and with this workflow, um, like OGM with BioNNO can identify like all classes of structural variants, like the large ones. And uh, what we do is we are basically observing the uh, changes, changes in spacing and comparisons of order and position of the labels, basically, and comparing them. That's how the uh, analysis is. Um, taking place so um this is um uh, so again because this is like an industry talk the um information is kind of like more high level but so uh this is the pipeline and i highlighted some portions of it and this is the major stages of the analysis pipeline and it's based on assembly so it's of course includes alignment as well but it's it eventually the goal is to assemble the genome from the molecules and the reason is that we are in clinical research and dealing with like revealing the structural variants it means that it may not exist in the reference genome we are trying to reveal those as well so we cannot rely purely on alignment based uh things so instead we are like constructing the genome from scratch or in the guided assembly um, scenario, using the reference as a reference, but not solely relying on that eventually because we assemble anyways. So we look when we look at the um, major stages, and this will give you a taste of the uh, computation happening. So first we filter and sort the input molecules, basic, like nothing compute heavy there. Afterwards, uh, optionally, we can estimate molecule error parameters. So, you can see it. But okay. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Oh, okay, it's a different screen. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, it says the NOAA and guided assembly pipeline, pipelines with OGM data in the title. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the other, the next stage is after filtering the molecules and sorting them is trying to estimate the error parameters. What we mean by error parameters is, for example, the um, label like distances between them could be rescaled because there might be some errors about the estimation out there or the positional like information about the labels. That's the second step. And then, depending on whether we do this de novo or guided using a reference, the path is kind of um, diverges, as you can imagine. So if it is de novo, it means we don't have any reference or we don't want to use it. In that scenario, similar to 
uh, overlapped layout consensus that we know from sequencing to perform assembly. What we do is perform pairwise alignment and use that between the molecules and use that information to construct a draft genome. So uh, we call them draft consensus maps. And if we want to use a reference, then we don't do these two steps. We use the reference maps as our draft starting draft consensus maps. And then they start like uh, the stages merge again at that point. And what we do, we have a draft map. We have a set of molecules. But we, what we can do, we align those molecules to those draft maps, and then we refine the maps. Basically, by using that alignment information, we improve the quality of the consensus, consensus maps. And then the next step is, after we have a one set of uh, refinements, the maps could change, right? And let's say we have this map and this map, and maybe they have an overlap between them, so they can be merged. That's what extend and merge stages are doing. We have several iterations of those. So we map the, like pairwise map the um, consensus maps, or um, that's how we do the merging step. And for extend, we use the molecules, map the molecules to the edges of the draft, like the consensus maps, try to lengthen them. And after lengthening them, trying to merge several consensus maps together. So the goal is to make them larger and larger so that we have like we have better coverage. And that's step, that's step six, which happens multiple times. And then we have one final refinement stage with the extended and merge consensus maps. And that become after doing that again, map the, map the molecules to the consensus maps, improve them again. And that makes our final set of um, maps, consensus maps. And we use those consensus maps against a, a set of reference maps to detect the SVs, basically what is different with the, within this generated um, set of maps, basically. So this is very high level, I know. But why I highlighted summers, because you can imagine we have an idea about the sequencing world, what is computationally expensive. So alignment, refinement, all these things which involve like, like uh, operations are expensive in the context of OGM analysis as well, which makes it even worse is one, the floating point operations. We are not dealing with ACGTs. It is not that way. And the, um, the flavor of the algorithm is very similar to what we see in Smith-Waterman but it has a way larger, like deeper recurrence. And the innermost loop is extremely heavy with a lot of floating based points, floating point based operations. So that's what's making this problem different than sequencing. And to be honest, much more complex, like, and um, expensive. Do you have a name for the algorithm? Uh, it's called Refaliner, but as you can imagine, it's not open source. So we have the binary out there, I guess. But uh, no, it should be because whatever we are shipping in terms of compute solution, the binary is there, but it's not reverse engineerable. So I mean, and your sister is going to huh? the dynamic time was in No, no. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, but from what I understand, you said on step seven, uh, six and seven, mm -hmm. you uh, consistently use previous outputs to generate newer inputs. Correct. So I feel like this would also increase, uh, multiply the amount of errors you had in the previous step. So what do you do to prevent that? So basically you are trying to eliminate them with that. So you are trying to get rid of, because you have coverage, right? You don't, similar idea, like similar explanation what we have in sequencing. So multiple molecules per region. So by using that information, we are trying to basically converge. And at one point the maps don't change anymore. And that's the point where you say, okay, uh, this is what we have. So does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question? So this is where we are right now. And where we are going is what motivate, what is motivating what I'm doing at Binana, basically. So these are four um, like evolution points that we as Binana are like aiming towards. And what is 
relevance here is the first and third things. And third thing is what I'm doing basically, but it's related with the first one, which is enhancing throughput. So um, it's a public information. We are like working on a new like Sapphire instrument, which is high throughput. And when I say, and I kind of glimpsed over this in my first talk as well, like the in, like genomics companies are improving their instruments a lot. And as part of that, in Biana, we are also coming up with a new instrument, which is extremely higher throughput than the current Sapphire system. And as you can all imagine, that comes up. So even in the current um, analysis pipeline, we are dealing with 16 hours, 24 hours per sample pipeline time, which is a lot. So, and with this, the throughput will be increasing significantly. So it is impossible to keep up with that. So this is very like familiar to all of us. We knew this, and this is a, uh, this is a motivation for um, what I'm doing at BioNNO because we need to improve our analysis pipeline in some way so that it can keep up with this, not just this new machine, but the existing one is pro, like we are releasing new software, we are re releasing new reagents, we are upgrading our software, even with that, the existing instrument is getting better as well. But analysis pipeline needs to keep up with that. And that's what motivates um, my work at BioNNO. And that's the hardware acceleration part in my title. So, and um, I and it's it's a common uh, goal for all genomics companies as we have to decrease the cost. And the goal is that the reason is that is so that a lot of people can access what we are providing here in the rural areas in Europe because these machines are not cheap. So uh, so the number of samples you are getting out of it and the Analysis time, analysis cost, all those kind of things build up on that. So we have to decrease everything, not just the instrument. And that's the goal of um, my work, which is the, uh, I don't know why it's not visible, but the next generation compute solution we are working on. And um, and the goal is here is, the goal is, as you can imagine, significantly reducing the time and cost per like sample. And with that, well, what we are marching towards is decreasing the pipeline processing time end to end by roughly eight times, which will drop it roughly to two hour per sample so that it can kind of keep up with the um, high throughput system. And um, so give you some overview of how it looks like. So this is the instrument. It has a controller next to it, which is controlling the instrument basically and gathering the data. In the current system, we have a cluster of servers, which is sitting in the customer's IT rooms, which is causing a lot of issues as you can imagine. So the goal in this project is not just uh, providing like better costs, like better um, um, throughput, but also like removing that burden on the customer. So that's why we are coming up with a workstation kind of single machine that can scale in the future if needed, but can ne sit next to the instrument, which, pro which is come up, coming up with another constraint because it will sit next to the instrument, next to the, everyone like working on the lab. So it should be efficient enough in terms of power, noise, all those kinds of things that you can imagine. And um, why it is like, as you can imagine, again, because of the, um, so we tested several different hardware accelerators and we revealed that Amiga GPUs are the best fit for current, our current uh, solutions. And we are um, working on a CUDA optimized pipeline that is specifically working on those stages I highlighted, alignment, refinement, and SV detection. And uh, I kind of like, uh, highlighted why NVIDIA GPUs while I, I was explaining the pipeline, but to be specific, we are also using the new generation of uh, NVIDIA's RTX 6000 ADA generation cards for this um, work. Um, so to summarize, with this new solution, we are um, aiming to accelerate the analysis for fast time to results. And uh, as you can imagine, this is the, the main goal is to support higher throughput. And 
um, again, this is, we can call it as hardware software uh, like co-design approach because yes, it is GPU mapping, but we all know that we cannot directly map. So it's a completely different hardware. So that uh, requires new algorithms or new approaches from our side as well. And the goal in our goal is to drop the highly complex cancer analysis less than two hours so that we can keep up with the instrument. And again, uh, we are aiming to have a workflow that can sit in a lab environment. So um, for this specific project to work with me, we have an opening, like job opening, specifically for GPU engineers. Right now, if there anyone is interested in, you can talk with me. And um, if you, so we presented this as part of a workshop recently. So it's a very similar um, presentation for my side, but for some more inspiration on how like this is really used in the clinical space. I would recommend looking at that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Alma. Yeah. Any questions? Too many. Yeah, now that we have <laughs> no more break. <laughs> oh, you canceled the break. <laughs> yeah. Six more calls. <laughs> so what makes it unique to SV detection? Um, so several things. One thing is, as I mentioned, we are trying to have an end-to-end -end workflow that has very limited like manpower needs, which is not there yet. Like in the outside, in the status quo basically approaches, there's a lot of human involvement. We are trying to replace that and have an automated end-to-end -end workflow. That's one. The second one is I show you the spectrum. The resolution that we are providing is pretty huge. So um, that's another big perk, basically. But uh, is that makes it strictly for a speed detection or can support other applications regardless of the Dell, SNAPs? So SNAPs and small Dells are not supported because of the limitations of the technology. That's why like you look coarse grain within the genome. Yeah, program. yeah, yeah. So, but more strong, like larger, like higher than five, 500 pp, as I showed in the spectrum. That's the target space. That's why, like, I, as I also showed, it's, it's not a replacement for sequencing or NGS. It's a complement for that. So, OGM. I yeah. see. Yeah. And none of the analysis tools are open source. No. None. None. Not even development version. No. Okay. No. Are data available in any way? There are the available data, yes. Yeah, but if you don't have yeah. analysis, then you cannot do much. You can do analysis, but you cannot reveal much from the. Um, but we never but, can compete with but, the original tool. But um, I am not sure about this, but one thing is while doing my work we in order to get support from several other like several different hardware accelerator not hardware accelerator, but hardware companies we signed ndas work with them so it's always a possibility which i also want to like um push maybe okay so yeah. you are open for that i am we can always bring it yeah but I, I i i'm someone coming from academia i really believe the um connections with academia, I really believe in that. And I'm trying to uh, vocalize that as well, but we cannot know without trying. So Sounds good. Yeah, that's why I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think the rest can be taken offline. Sure. Thanks, Amla. Thank for you. Nice overview of what you're doing. Yep. Now we're gonna move to Mohammed, I believe. <laughs> no, he doesn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> An impromptu talk. I mean, we can have a two-minute break if you want. Yeah, All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, because we have six more talks after this. Without yeah. Any break. yeah, without any break. Not that you guys really use the break for other purposes. <laughs> okay, let's have a. I think three, three to four minute break. Just give me all those talks. <laughs> well, you'll see. I guess. <laughs> well, one of them is up here. Okay, after three to four minutes, we can come back.
Okay. So are you ready for this one? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, where do I put my okay here? Okay, let's get started. So this is our last session in the BioArch workshop. And it's, we're starting with Mohammed Alther again. Mohammed, this is Mohammed's second talk over here. Earlier, he talked about genome on diet, sparsifying genomics. And this time he's gonna talk about what I mentioned uh, in a bit of detail, basically a pre-alignment filtering. This was part of Mohammed's PhD thesis. At Bill Kent, uh, quite wise, 2018 IEEE Turkey best dissertation, best PhD dissertation award yeah. for this work. Plus gatekeeper. Okay, Mohammed, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Uh -oh. I think something bad is going on with the machine. So overheating. Uh, oh, is that that machine? Okay, let's see. Okay, let's start. Hopefully we won't have a problem with the projector. All right, let's see how it goes. So thanks everyone for watching this uh, talk, hopefully on YouTube, and you can watch the recording later. If you follow my lectures at ETH Zurich, so you probably be familiar with the content over here. So we are focusing on what we call pairwise sequence alignment. And this is a very important step and most of the genomic analyses uh, that try to do a uh, comparison between genomic uh, sequences. And the goal of this step basically is to try to find the best arrangement of matches and edit operation or the differences between the genomic sequences. And those uh, edit operation could be insertion, deletions, or substitutions. And we do that so that we can do fine grain comparison between the genomic sequences. So try to find what are the causes for a disease, for example, by comparing a sequence coming from unhealthy cell compared to a sequence coming from healthy cell. And usually we do that using what we call dynamic programming approach, which is not something unique to genomics, but could, could be used in many other domains. And what we, the way we compute this is basically we have a table, as you can infer from the name, we have a cells, and each of those cells represent a data that uh, represent the comparison between corresponding characters from one sequence to the other sequences. And the way we compute this has to follow a certain uh, approach or certain order how you can compute one cell before the other and so on, which makes it uh, very complex in terms of uh, accelerating it. So for example, you cannot compute this portion before computing that portion and so on. And the, the, the last thing you would see over here is the trace pack, which is done at the end after you compute the entire table, you would like to track which of those entries provide the best arrangement as we define it in our problem. And by following the direction, then you can infer which are the edit operation or the matches. For example, if you go in this diagonal, there is no, it seems, insertion or deletions causing that diagonal to be inverted to the other uh, diagonals in the table. The problem becoming more severe when we talk about long sequences. So once we move to 30,000 long sequences, then the, D, the DP table could reach about one gig of uh, data. And once we move to 300 gig, which is normal, which is really the norm these days. It's not surprising to have this much uh, of a sequences. We could have up to 2 million so far with ONT devices. And you can reach something that you cannot, um, you, you cannot really handle in, to do, in today machines. The good thing that there are several algorithms recently try to have some heuristics so that we can reduce the number of cells that we compute. For example, edilib, which is a uh, very famous library these days for the distance calculation that follow banded implementation. So you fill only this area of the table. So you can think about that this is a complete table over here, but because of these, uh, this space, 
um, optimization. So all of them are compact in this direction, but each of those is really separate dynamic programming table. And moving uh, forward to this year, we have, for example, this, and by WFA, you can see the exact number of entries to be computed over there, which is very minimal. It's scattered around only the main diagonal uh, of the, the dynamic programming table. This is something great, yes. It optimizes the number of entries need to be calculated for the table, so you don't have to worry about the size. However, this is still really expensive to compute for large number of frees. And you can see this breakdown analysis. Uh, um, I think you already saw it with on our presentation where the sequence alignment or pairwise sequence alignment takes about 60%, which is including chaining and KSW2. Both of them are performing uh, dynamic programming uh, calculation over there. So our goal is to accelerate any sequence aligner, basically. We, we are not focusing on certain uh, sequence alignment algorithm. And how we achieve our goal, we would like to have something can consider as a black box that reduces the need for dynamic programming algorithms. How is that possible? Let's see this. So we define genom genomic strings as similar or dissimilar to each other. And we define the similarity here based on a threshold. For example, you can set the threshold to 5% of the read length as differences. And anything exceeding that 5%, we consider it as dissimilar. Otherwise, we consider it as similar strings. And probably things over there are interesting to us to look further and see these differences. The problem is when we have these dissimilar sequences, which is highly divergent sequences, and there are a lot of differences between the two sequences, making them not really interesting for us. And the thing will be expensive because those will be excluded from further uh, end results. So anything you do in this direction directly will be a waste because we are not going to use the end results. So we are proposing this, what we call pre-alignment filter, uh, which, which will be placed somewhere between the step that calculate the mapping location and the step that calculate the sequence alignment. And we define three main factors that we need to respect in such a step. The first one, we should filter out most of the incorrect mappings or the dissimilar sequences. And the second factor, we need to really preserve all the correct ones. So anything similar to each other, we should keep that because we define that, uh, that they are really interesting to us. The third factor, we need to do that quickly because that is the ultimate goal for us is to accelerate the end-to-end -end application. So if this causing any overhead to the sequence aligner, then we are not uh, getting anything. There's no benefits of using it. So I'm going through the state of the art um, pre-alignment filter that we propose, but there are many other filters from our group and other groups. However, this is still the fastest and the most accurate one to the best of our knowledge. And the key idea behind Sneaky Snake is we observe that, as you can see, this is what we call a dot plot matrix where there's, there's a sequence here, another sequence over there, and we do corresponding comparison. And every time we get a match, you can have a red uh, dot in the, this matrix, for example. And when the two sequences are similar to each other, you will see a line scattered around the diagonal. And this is true even for by WFA or A star and so on. So most of those algorithm, when the sequences are similar to each other, you barely compute only this region and the matrix. So we leveraged this information to propose Sneaky Snake. And we said correct alignment is a sequence of non-overlapping long matches. And our goal is to find these long matches. So what we do basically, we said, because I have an, a background in electric engineering, so I was familiar with BLSI design. So we said, okay, let's map it to this problem. But you can think about this as um, shortest path finding problem or any other similar problem with the exact same uh, description of the problem. But what, what we are aiming for here, we have this BLSI chip. If you dissect through it, you'll see components. And while you are designing, you try to place this component in optimal way where you place it maybe next to the IO pad, for example, in this side, this side, this side, or here, based on some constraint. 
And the constraint that we are using here that we have a single net routing uh, problem where we have this single net, which is a connection from this side to that side in any of those IO pad. And we would like to pass through the minimum number of components through the chip itself. So let's go into detail of that. And uh, now we have the, the, the equation uh, in the paper, how we build this data structure. It's really simple if you go through this uh, equation uh, where we compare one character from the one of the sequences to the another character from the other sequence based on some of those uh, indices. And we got this shape, which we call it a maze, a maze a matrix or maze table or chip maze, basically. So we have one and zeros because either similar to each other, the character, or they are dissimilar. So whenever the two characters we are comparing are equal to each other, we have a zero. Otherwise, we have a one. This is very important. Why? Because the one and zero have really important meaning to us that we are going to leverage here to convert this into this. Now, what's the difference between this and that? We just consider the ones as a black box. It means uh, you cannot cross through and the zero as available, available path where you can cross through from this side to the forward direction. Now to solve the problem, we have E equal three. What does it mean? This is edit distance. So the edit distance three means um, we can tolerate up to three operations three differences between the two sequences that we use to build this table. And we would like to reach from this point to that destination within the three edit operation. And the edit operation for us in this sense are the black boxes. So how many times we can cross over these black boxes. So we have three times at most to cross these black boxes. And now what we do, we consider this is the the entrance, this is where we should focus to choose which one of those rows, and that is the exit of the table. So we go through row by row because we always allowed to go horizontally, but not uh, in this way or the other way around. So we, we check the first row, we see how many steps we can move forward, and we find there are zero steps to choose. The second path, zero step, third path, zero step, and the fourth one allows us to move four further steps to reach this point. And now because we are looking for minimizing the number of obstacles that we are crossing, we are always looking for the path that can send us as further as possible uh, in that direction. So we greedily choose that path where we have four steps to reach that obstacle over there. And then we continue with the other iteration of the algorithm. So we reduce now the number of obstacles because we cross one of them. So we have now only two instead of three and we reiterate over that. As you can see, we just keep checking um, sequentially line by line or row by row and see how many uh, white boxes we have in each row. So over here we have four, which is the largest number. So we greedily choose that and we reduce the number of available obstacles from two to one. And then we continue with the last iteration as long as we are not reaching zero allowed obstacles over here. If this is still above one, we keep iterating until we reach the destination over here. Now in the last iteration, we got multiple paths that has the same number of uh, obstacles. So you are allowed to choose any of them because we don't penalize the vertical, um, the vertical movement. So moving from this to that, that is perfectly fine. You can still do that uh, because if we try to do anything in that direction, then we are trying to mimic the behavior we have in dynamic programming table, which is dependencies between cells. And we try to avoid that so that we can maintain the very fast performance in sequence alignment as this is our goal. And now once we choose that path, just agreedly, we could choose this one as well, this one, as long as it all leads to exact same reduction in the allowed number of obstacles. However, one important aspect of the algorithm, if you compare this, this is really what we calculate in terms of the maze. Um, why is that? Because every time we 
uh, face an obstacle, we stop calculating that row and we move next to the next row. We find an obstacle, don't calculate, go next, next. Here, no obstacle, keep calculating until you reach that obstacle. So you can see how it's really building the, the table in a very efficient way with minimal number of entries instead of building something huge for the uh, sequences. Now, coming to the evaluation results, but if you have any comment, any question, I can take them now before we move to the results of Sneak Snake. All right. Hopefully no questions on YouTube. Um, we, as I mentioned before, there are many others, uh, many other uh, pre-alignment filters in the literature, but we compare with some of them, especially the good ones. And you can see Sneaky Snake is still the most accurate one, which is the black uh, plot over there and the red one as well. And uh, it also scales nicely with the edit distance threshold. And this is for uh, short reads, but we have a similar behavior for the long reads as well. And when we check the execution time saving that we did with the sneaky snake, you can see here, this is um, the, the sequence aligner alone, those bars, the gray ones, and the yellow combined with the green one represent sneaky snake first, and then performing sequence alignment on the remaining uh, pairs only. So you can see the saving uh, all the way up to here, where we reach 1.4x of speed up end to end. Why is that? Because you can see in the other y axis that the number of accepted pairs uh, start to um, start to increase. So what does it mean? It means most of the sequences here are correct, so they should be accepted. Until we reach here, all of them will be accepted because the edit distance threshold here is very high. Probably most of the sequences that we are using, they have less edit compared to that threshold. So all of them will be accepted over here. And in, the, in these scenarios where we have something uh, above 50%, pre-alignment filters are not performing good because their goal is basically to filter most of the things. So if you don't have much to filter, then we don't expect you to gain something. That's why by WFA, for example, and those sequences or those aligners perform really well for similar sequences. But if they are operating on dissimilar sequences, then we start to see the slowdown compared to Sneaky Snake, for example. And we have results for that. Here, Sneaky Snake com combined with a Wavefront algorithm and the similar behavior you will see with by WFA as well. So this is short reads, 100, 250, this is 1,000 and 10,000 sequences. And that is WFA. And this is Sneaky Snake combined with WFA. And then you can see huge speed up just because of adding pre-alignment filtering to the um, WFA algorithm. We have other results in the paper, so you can check them out where we, comp where we compare ourselves with the hardware accelerators as well as software accelerators for different purposes, such as EDLib and Parasail for calculating um, edit distance and sequence alignment. Now, the last two works I would like to present very quickly, which is uh, reducing the data movement and pre-alignment filtering. And I think Gagan already explained this work where we try to implement Sneaky Snake on the modern FPGA devices that provide HPM memories next to the FPGA logic where we have high bandwidth uh, memories within the same chip, tightly coupled with the FPGA logic. Um, so I think I can skip that since already Gagang mentioned most of the things in the morning. And the last one is another pre-alignment filter, just to give you different flavors of how you can develop algorithms that can fit the hardware that you are using. This is from Jeremy, um, who proposed the Gram filter. Gram filter so far supporting only short reads, but the idea behind it is really interesting. And maybe someone can work on it, develop it, uh, developing uh, something for long reads as well. So the idea starting with the, the release of those uh, uh, 3D stacked memories where we have a logic layer over there and DRAM layers, several of them, and you can access the banks of each of them. Uh, and then you can fetch the data in horizontal fashion where you have the bit line over here and you can access it, open the entire row, get the data, move on to the next row and so on. 
So at that time, we were thinking that we would like to design something that's very friendly with this data structure where we place vectors vertically, and then we access all bets of all those vectors at the same time so that we can do uh, filtering for all those vectors uh, with very high throughput. So we said we have a reference genome, and normally we try to detect the mapping location that reference genome so that we can fetch a portion of it and then we compare it to a read, for example. And exactly the same thing we will do here, but we, we, we don't want to care about the mapping location, but instead we would like to fetch all the overlapping subsequences from that and represent it using a bit vector that I was mentioning. So what does the bit vector do? We have a bit vector of length that is equal to uh, four to the power five in this example, but you can increase that number as well. Why four? Because we have only A or C or G or T in each character, and we have we are representing each bit in the bit vector by five characters over there. Now we enumerate all possible tamers of length five from AAA all the way to five T's over here. And whenever I encounter any of those k-mers in the, in the chunk that we extracted from the genome, then we place one in that bet vector. And then we use this bet vector only moving forward, and we don't care about the k-mers anymore. So only that one will be stored in that matrix in the DRAM uh, bank. And then whenever we got a read sequence, we build another bit vector for the read sequence, and then we can easily match this with that since both of them are already sorted representation of the k-mers. So we can easily compare the one over here with the one over there. It means both of these k-mers exist in the read and in that reference genome. And that is very nice abstraction to the problem. So we deal now with bit vectors instead of the k-mers or the entire sequences. And the length of the bit vector will be fixed regardless the sequence length that you are using, which is going to reduce the problem a lot and makes it uh, viable to save all those pet vectors within a minimal uh, foot memory footprint. Uh, I think I can skip those, um, but one thing to mention is the results, the, 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 the performance that we got, we got out of gram filter that we achieved 5.6x to 6x a lower falsely accepted pairs compared to fast hatch, which using adjacency filtering that try to get the k-mers from the sequences and check whether those k-mers are existing in the neighbor in, in neighborhood uh, k-mers or not. And in terms of speed up, you can see over here, it's a limited speed up, yes, but the data movement is already uh, reduced a lot. I think we didn't quantify it in the paper, but um, moving forward, you can think about the, the, the reduction we did in terms of the data by not moving a lot of pairs, a lot of dissimilar sequences from the memory device all the way to the host CPU. And as I mentioned, this is limited to short uh, reads, uh, but the, most of the other filters that we have from our group and other groups can support both short and long reads. So I think it's very useful paradigm to use a filtering before any sequence aligner as I show in the results. It's even beneficial for WFA and all those uh, recent sequence aligners. I don't want to take more time, but I think most of the speed up that we observe here that the parallelism enabled by novel hardware acceleration plus the algorithm. So we always need to develop an algorithm that is friendly with the hardware that we are using. Some of the uh, authors of those papers, I would like to acknowledge all of them and many more from a Safari Research Group over many years with different papers on pre-alignment filtering. So that's the end. And any question can take it now. Else. Any questions? I think it looks like Joel has a question. No, okay. you can ask. He needs the microphone. So uh, you're, you've shown all these approaches to pre-alignment filtering uh, to re replace um, or re rather reduce the pressure on uh, pairwise sequence alignment. And do you any see any opportunity to use 
the filters themselves to perform the alignment? That's a very good direction, I guess, and very good question, because most of the work in the recent years try to focus on heuristics, regardless if they provide optimal results for some cases or not, but they cannot provide optimal results all the time, for example, or they, can, they don't want to do that. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's really difficult to optimize dynamic programming beyond the, the quadratic time complexity. And um, I think I think it's very useful to use those pre-alignment filters in cases such that you don't care about the every base level details of the alignment. For example, you're comparing the similarities or you're trying to measure the genomic distances between sequences and so on. So you could use that as very last step instead of pre-alignment filter. In those cases, you really don't need to perform these expensive operations. I mean, this is one example, which has been used for many of the existing applications as very last step of alignment. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ruel. All right, I think we can move. Okay, I think we can move to the next talk. Uh, we can do a reordering of the talks. I see. Yeah, do you want to ask him? Maybe he, if he's ready. Oh, hey, hello, Luke. Uh, so we may do some reordering if you are ready now, like you can either start presenting now or after um, one more talk. What do you think? Um, I, I I could do it now if, if you want to. Um, yeah. Sure, yeah, let me then prepare. Maybe in the meantime, you can start uh, sharing your screen. And we should also thank Mohammed. We forgot to thank Mohammed. <laughs> for, for multiple reasons. For also getting us back closer to the track. Can you see that? Uh, yes, you see your, I guess, now in, now in full screen, yes. If, if you have your camera also, like, it would be nice if you could uh, turn it on if you're, of course, uh, available for that. Let me try to do this. Great. Okay, while you're getting ready, I guess, making the screen full, I'm going to introduce you. Uh, so our next talk is uh, SRAM-based uh, MIMD-AI accelerators for sequence alignment. Uh, Luke is going to present this work. Uh, so, um, sorry. so Luke uh, holds a Master of Science in Computer Science uh, computer science from the uh, Technical University of Berlin. Uh, Luke is a, a similar PhD research fellow at the University of Oslo, working at the similar high performance department. Um, previously, he worked at Google and Kubernetes in cloud computing and now focuses on solving computational difficult problems that cannot be solved with con conventional hardware. Luke is working with the GraphCore IPU and Cerebras wafer scale engine to accelerate sparse computations such as SPMV, graph, and bioinformatics algorithms. So look, uh, you can take it away. All right, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Okay, um, today I wanted to talk a bit about uh, AI accelerators, uh, AI accelerators that are um, already available on the market and which we wanted to make a bit more um, broadly useful for, for different applications. So let me try to lead with, with an example. Um, Back in the days, GPU started off as a device, well, purely for gamers. You could play computer games with them, but um, later on, people found out that you can actually use them very well for different applications. So, for example, you can use them for scientific applications, uh, weather simulations, tasks that are very computationally uh, demanding, um, or machine learning. And nowadays, uh, as machine learning gets bigger, people start to build 
hardware that is really custom fit and custom tailored for machine learning. So the domain is not um, computer games anymore, but the domain here is um, uh, machine learning workloads. And we wanted to figure out if you can retell the story going from a gaming device to scientific computation, but instead going from uh, machine learning to uh, other applications. Um, so specifically, we are in uh, HPC and we are interested in HPC workloads. So can we do something like weather simulations, um, uh, finite element methods, or can we do um, bioinformatics, which nowadays also becomes part of uh, HPC? Um, so as, an, as one architecture that we are currently looking at is, is the GraphCore IPU, which is well, chip that is really built for machine uh, machine uh, uh, working uh, for machine learning workloads, and this architecture is a MIMD processor. So instead of using uh, SIMD and SIMT, uh, which GPUs use, uh, they use a lot of tiny individual cores, and they also spend a lot of their uh, silicon budget on um, SRAM cache um, as or like uh, SRAM. Uh, memory, uh, which is uh, which has similar latency to to cache on on a CPU, um, so you can do, for example, you can do uh, for each of these cores in one cycle, you can load 128 bit, which gives you a combined bandwidth of roughly uh, 52 terabytes a second, and when you want to communicate between these uh, individual cores, you can do this with an interconnect bandwidth of eight terabytes a second. So this is really interesting uh, also for sequence alignment because it's uh, well fundamentally limited by uh, by the memory bandwidth. And we so this is why we are really interested in this. So taking a further look on the graph core um, uh, on the IPU, um, you can see that all of the all of these uh, tiny tiles are connected through an exchange network. We cannot really say right now too much to this exchange network, but it uh, connects all of the tiles. This, this is enough for now. And uh, a single tile contains a core with six threads and 624 kilobytes of tile local memory. This is really important because you can only exchange data by communication. You cannot access um, uh, memory of a different tile. And you have one cycle to load and store values. So you can do a 128-bit load and 64-bit store. And there's no cache hierarchy because you only have this local memory available. Um, there also is um, external memory, which you can use. However, we will see uh, in, in the next slide that this is not really practical for us. In general, um, for, for single core, this, uh, this architecture breaks down to um, uh, Having two pipelines, you have an integer pipeline or the main pipeline, which is responsible for the control flow, and you have an auxiliary pipeline, which is responsible for floating point operations. Uh, and it's really uh, tailored to AI and ML workloads. So you have this XP operation, which is um, is, is difficult to use for other things when dense matrix multiplies. Um, so the the whole processor is is a barrel processor. It's time multiplex. Um, they don't give you any uh, synchronization methods, so there are no mutis, mutices or uh, atomic operations, which are really fast. So we, we see them more as individual threads, which kind of share um, a memory domain. And you can also see that to the main memory, there's this exchange connected. However, however, the, there's no explicit API uh, exposed, and we have to use it through the software side on an implicit way. Um, in, in general, we can say that exchange can be done uh, from any tile to any tile, and we are not really restricted by uh, the location here. So we can just send a small data packet from one tile to, to another tile, and uh, we, we only need to know um, a global ID. Um, and we can also send it to multiple tiles. So uh, broadcast native broadcast operations are supported, and we can also do multiple communications from tile to multiple tiles uh, at the same time. So there can be multiple communication pairs uh, exchanging at the same time. Um, looking at the uh, memory bandwidth and at the memory uh, layout a bit more, um, we going from a tile local memory to, to the registers, we have these 54 terabytes a second. 
Um, and then going from tile to tile, uh, doing the exchanges, we have a aggregated bandwidth. So all of these are aggregated bandwidths over roughly 1,500 cores. We have an aggregated bandwidth of eight terabytes. Um, and then when we go off chip uh, to the DRAM, we it, it's quite slow. So this is why we try to avoid it. This is roughly six six point six uh, gigabytes a second, um, which is not really that much for um, for most use cases. So you have to uh, think really think about when you uh, when you do this. Um, so communication cannot happen at the same time as uh, communication is happening. And for this, the hardware in hardware implements the implements a BSP pattern where you uh, separate compute exchange and then a global synchronization phase, and you group all of that into a super step. So this is like one unit you can schedule. It's one super step, and you do uh, uh, computations, exchanges, and then a global synchronization to end this um, to end this super step. And this is really important because you, like this, you can avoid race conditions uh, very nicely. Also, all the communication pairs and sizes need to be known at compile time. So we cannot really do this dynamically. So that's also one thing we need to think about. On the software side, uh, programming this chip uh, follows, if, if you're familiar with machine learning workloads, uh, follows like a TensorFlow ish model. So you program a data graph where you have your states and you have your computes as vertices, <clears throat> uh, where you have your computes as vertices. Mm. And then the state transitions from one state layer into another state layer. And you can do this over these vertices, which just compute something. Um, and then you group this into a super step, which in the end will introduce a global barrier. And after the super step is done, you know that the next state is completely well uh, clean. So there's uh, nothing can write in the state anymore. And you, can, you know you can read it without race conditions. So going from left to right, we have synchronization and we have adjacent uh, state and compute layers. Uh, and going up, adding more vertices adds parallelization. So each vertex is only uh, executed on a single tile and, oh, sorry, uh, is always executed on a single tile. So adding more vertices increases the parallelization. And you need to map to to make the communication work. You need to map everything uh, to a specific location. You need to map everything to a tile. So here, looking at your your tensors, you can subslice your tensors, and you can say that this subslice or a certain subslice lives on one tile. Uh, looking up the of at the top left tensor here, we say parts of this live on tile. Uh, T0 and parts of this is owned by tile T2. And then for the com computation phase, which happens on tile number three, we copy over the values that are required for T3. So we copy over the subslice of X and Y and put it on uh, tile number three. Then we do the uh, computation and then we communicate it to the subslice that is owned by tile number zero. Uh, it sounds quite uh, uh, inefficient. However, we have this eight terabytes a second uh, tile to tile interconnect, which makes this seem quite fast. So uh, on the program side, we can first define our, our tensors. We also have to give it uh, a location, but we don't, we omit this here for simplicity. And then we have to re reference uh, a kernel we have written in a different file. Uh, so this is the add kernel. And then we have to set uh, the location of this and connect the tensors to our vertex so to our computation and then this is the code for the kernel this is this will then be run on the ipu itself the previous code was setup code which is used to compile code for the ipu and here we can see that we have our inputs a and b and score and these will be moved by the by the uh, compiler so it generates exchange code for this and we, we don't have to do this. Uh, and then at runtime, when this compute function is called, A and B are available and score will be copied over after we exit out of this compute function. Yeah. So looking at which algorithm we wanted to accelerate uh, for, for, sequen uh, for sequence alignment uh, use case, 
we had the choice of uh, heuristics or exact algorithms, and we chose the Swift Waterman implementations as it is uh, often found, um, or versions of it are also uh, often found in uh, many real world pipelines. And uh, a lot of research also has been done on this algorithm. So there are different ways of uh, using SIMD instructions to uh, speed up a Swift Waterman. There are different trade or trade offs you can choose. Uh, to make it more memory efficient, to make it um, uh, faster. Um, and then there are also uh, uh, specialized hardware implementations. So for a pipeline, we chose a many-to-many -many, um, protein clustering pipeline, um, where in the alignment step, uh, a, lot of, a lot of time uh, is spent uh, comparing many sequences to many sequences and this uses swift uh, the swift waterman algorithm and we wanted to exchange this algorithm with uh, one of our implementations so uh in general uh about the swift waterman algorithm we can say that uh, we do not know the start and end positions so sequences can be completely uh, aligned uh can can be self-contained in each other can only overlap at, at the end positions and we uh wants to have uh, gap penalties because or a thin gap penalties because um one large gap is more likely than many uh, um, adjacent gaps and we want to be able to use similarity matrices which encode the likely like likelihood that um uh, certain amino acids uh or how likely it is that you can match up to uh, amino acids so Looking at the Swift Waterman algorithm, we can see that it's quite regular. So we build up a dynamic programming matrix, which you can see down here. And this dynamic programming matrix uses partial results that we previously computed to compute new results and then uh, give us our final result. Uh, here you can see an example. So to fill one cell, we need the top, top left and uh, left cell values, and then we can fill fill up the whole matrix and then get our final result and one can also see here that this will grow in um in quadratic space um sorry so uh for implementation here we chose um uh, a column wise implementation because we are uh, because uh, growing a large matrix uh is, is very difficult if you only have uh, 624 kilobytes um, we used the columnar version of this algorithm. We didn't use the stripes with Waterman version because this is only really useful for SIMD instructions, which we don't really have access to. And uh, in our implementation, we uh, took careful consideration of how we encode our data types so we can use the integer and floating point pipeline at the same time. So we can use this dual issuing on two pipelines to make use of most of what the hardware uh, can offer. One thing is that we couldn't really go over uh, with this approach for Swift Bottom, we couldn't really go over a certain size because uh, O of N is still quite large and we also couldn't parallelize it more. So if we have one sequence, which is really large because the runtime is always pretty close to uh, uh, the length of the A sequence times the length of the B sequence, this comparison uh, really can can cause problems for other ties because we have this global synchronization step and we we have to wait so we also introduced a, a small load balancing uh, step which is similar to k partitioning um uh, which we solved heuristically uh, to then balance the the workload um and and this worked quite well so uh, on pastas compared to to uh, a modern xeon we could see a five five times speed up of the overall pipeline and we could also see only in the alignment step, which is the only thing we changed, we could see an 11 times speed up. Uh, compared to their GPU implementation, we could see a 20, 24.9 speed up in the GPU kernel. Uh, one thing to note is that CPUs are still quite fast for this workload. Um, this is why we, um, this is why CPU and uh, GPU implementations are, are actually quite close for this. Um, and for one 
uh, IPU to one GPU implementation, we had a speed up of 2.8x. And we could also see that uh, adding more IPUs generally helps. However, at some point, our partitioning or uh, preparation of the data uh, be becomes uh, becomes a problem, and uh, the the data set we could run for this pipeline wasn't also large enough so that we could uh, do uh, long like very good strong scaling in this case because the the data like we we, we solved it in in a second and then preparation just uh, took too much time. Um, so the, the paper on this is currently in review, but it contains uh, more in-depth results. Um, you can look at this slide later. Um, contains more in-depth results, uh, looks at uh, more specific uh, uh, CPU and GPU implementation, which we compare us to, has uh, weak and strong scaling results, and also discusses different load uh, balancing algorithms. The second thing we try to do, because at a certain point, uh, this, um, this quadratic runtime really is a problem, especially for very large sequences, is uh, to, to reduce the search space and to make the computations we do um, um, more, well, let's say, meaningful. So what, what you can do is you can either restrict the search space uh, statically uh, with a banded implementation, or you can use a heuristic called XDROP, which tries to uh, focus more on the, uh, more uh, tries to focus more on the valuable uh, paths which are um, uh, which probably lead to a good result. So this is a heuristic, but uh, it's still quite close to this with water implementations. And um, a key challenge here was that the the memory requirements are in O n. But I mean O n sounds good. However, when you have sequences that are very large and you have six threads, so you need to have uh, a scratch space for this algorithm three times times six, uh, we run out of memory very, very fast. Um, and we can't really run this on an IPU. So the one thing we had to overcome was the memory requirement. And what we did for this is we op uh, we saw that in this XDROP algorithm, it is possible. Uh, so so when it, it sorry, um, what you can see in this XDROP algorithm is that you have a valid search space or a space in this matrix, which you actually operate on, which is the gray area here. And in this gray area, only there you do computations and you, you take your results from and you write into it. So what we can do is we can actually restrict the memory reallocate to only use this uh, certain search space. And for, uh, for, for the real world data sets we tested, and for synthetic data sets, we could see that we had a 55x reduction in the in the memory usage compared to what previous algorithms used. And this made it possible to run it on the on the IPU, on the tiles. And we could see uh, good speed ups, uh, even compared to, to a state-of-the-art Milan processor. We could see a 4.x speed up on uh, to compared to SIG one, which is quite uh, quite challenging. And we also tested it on a, a de novo long read assembly pipeline uh, using a hi-fi data set. And we again tested it on pastas for uh, protein sequences. So this is a quite general implementation. Um, the final work uh, contains more results. It also gives um, a further optimization, which uh, helps with many-to-many -many sequence alignments to reduce the amount of data we actually have to send to the IPU because sending data is quite slow, and this uh, reduces the, the amount of data we send by three to four x. So in the end, uh, I wanted to say that it's quite possible uh, to use and, and beneficial to use these new AI accelerators for, uh, for sequence alignment workloads but there are some things that need to change to really make this hardware useful. And the, the biggest problem we encountered probably is the restriction on the BSP pattern, which we believe can be weakened at some point, but uh, it currently is the, the main obstacle we, we need to overcome when programming for the IPU and managing the, the amount of available data. Um, Thank you very much. Um, if there are questions.
Um, I think everyone is muted. Hi. Okay. Um, I guess you're on mute now. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. So I was wondering for your extra optimization, you remove a lot of the dynamic programming table from your effective memory footprint. Yeah. My understanding is um, that that area that you actually do compute is dynamic in XDROP. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering how can you allocate just the right area in memory? Do you need like malloc or? Um, so everything is really static uh, with this architecture. So you have to know before runtime how much memory you want to allocate. So in a, in a sense, you do your own memory allocation. So you have a memory area you want you you give it in the beginning of a um of of the compilation and then you have this memory available and you have to for so for 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 this uh, optimization here you have to you have to choose a um a, a certain size which will be uh equal or larger than the the longest width of, of this area you compute um but it usually is quite small, um, which we have tested empirically. Okay, so you're okay. I can see that, that you need to allocate the total capacity, but also how do you allocate the individual rows that can change in size? I think that's the other issue I have in mind. The different rows, um, I, I, sorry, I'm kidding. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not like a nice regular table at this point, right? So it's not, yeah. two -dimensional, it's not like just a two-dimensional array that you index into. Uh, uh, yes, it, it's not. Uh, we do, so we have um, a certain sized array for, for this. So on, on the lower part, on the memory restricted version, we, we, we allocate uh, in memory only, only um, an array of this length, and then we do a lot of address translation to always shift the searchable area in inside of inside of this array. So uh, you can see here we as a fixed point for for this computation we we chose uh, the lower end um, of of the enter diagonal, and we always fix it um, to to this part. Uh, of of the search space and can only grow uh, in each iteration. It can only grow by one. Uh, so we know if we set, uh, offset it by one, have have it, uh, a fixed space uh, allocated, and then do some address translation. We we always try to shift the view of the memory um, around so that we uh, so so it, so it doesn't look like it is yeah. It's, I think I can kind of see that based on that explanation. Thanks. Okay, Luke, uh, I another question with your permission. Yeah. Leonid. So uh I mean, first of all, that's 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 very interesting. I mean, uh using IPU for this kind of application, that's uh inspiring. So, but my question is more general. I mean, how does it compare in terms of performance with GPU, for example? Because, you know, for me, uh, I'm just, you know, looking at the commercial angle, obviously IPU must be very expensive solutions. So just interesting. I mean, if you can share any results. So it, it really depends also on, on the data, um, uh, on the data you have. So well, you know, right 30X now, human genome standard thing. Yeah, so we focused on this many-to-many uh, -many sequence alignment on and on de novo pipelines. We cannot do mapping well at the moment. Um, so to to the so so to the overall performance, uh, it's it probably would be best to to look at the more in-depth analysis. Um, you can write me an email or. Our work is currently uh, in submission, but I could right. send you a manuscript. Um, in the beginning of the talk, there uh, there was my email. Uh, just 
drop me a mail now i can uh, send you the manuscript and uh, if uh, yeah right okay thank you great thanks thanks again then and let's maybe congratulate luca again one more time yes I guess now we can uh, move to the next talk. I guess we're going to continue with Moz. Uh, Moz, are you available? Uh, yes, I am. Great. Uh, let me over there. Okay, I'm Great. going to share my screen if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, of course. And while you're doing it, I think. I'm going to introduce him. All right. Uh, so yeah, let me introduce Moz. Uh, first, uh, uh, his talk is titled Accelerating Irregular Bioinformatics Algorithms on uh, GPUs. Uh, Moz is an application performance spe specialist at NERSC. His expertise include uh, bioinformatics software development, GPU porting, optimization, and performance analysis. Currently, he is associated with the Exabiome project, where he contributes as a GPU application developer uh, in the metagenomics analysis software pipelines. Previously, he has worked as a postdoc scholar at NERSC and LBNL, uh, and, and as a GPU application developer at EMSL, PNNL, um, Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, he received his PhD in computer science from Western Michigan University under the super supervision of uh, Professor Fahad Saad in uh, 2019. His doctoral thesis explored high-performance computing strategies for uh, LCMS, MS-based uh, prote proteomics workflows. So, uh, Moz, you can, I guess, um, start whenever you're ready. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Ken, for the introduction and for, for giving me the opportunity to present our work. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, um, as Ken described, uh, my name is Moaz. I work at NERSC, uh, a division of Berkeley Lab, and uh, I'll, I'll be sharing the, the some of the work that I have been doing with the Exobiome project in offloading some of the uh, irregular bioinformatics algorithms uh, to GPUs. Uh, so uh, first, a quick outline. Uh, the uh, first, I'll go uh, give a brief intro of what Exobiome project is. Uh, then I'll move on to ADEPT, which is a GPU accelerated sequence al aligner that we developed and give a bit of uh, information about that. Uh, and then I'll move on to the, the GPU local assembly. This is one of our recent work and I'll, I'll give more in-depth uh, details of this. Uh, <clears throat> so Exabine project is, uh, is one of the projects of the, the Exascale initiative of US Department of Energy. And uh, uh, we at NERSC have been working with some of the teams of ECP project in, uh, in preparing these applications for, for our GPU system, that is Perlmutter. And this has worked nicely because most of the exascale systems that DOE is procuring are GPU-based systems. So the it's NESAP or the NERSC's uh, collaboration with ECP teams is kind of a direct extension of uh, uh, that. So the Exabiome project is, is kind of a subset of that. And uh, the, the challenge here is that we are trying to develop uh, software solutions that can run on exascale architectures. And our problem domain is uh, uh, microbiome analysis. And for that, we, we can categorize the software tools that we're developing in roughly in three categories, uh, the metagenome assembly, protein clustering, and, and annotation, and comparative analysis. For the scope of this talk, I'll, I'll limit my discussion to the first two columns, metagenome assembly and uh, protein clustering. Uh, if you look at the bottom uh, row uh, of the first two, or in fact, all of these columns, then you'll see that the computing techniques that are being used in uh, across these softwares that we're developing, uh, there's kind of a commonality there. For example, hash tables, alignments, and camera counting are some of the software or algorithmic motifs that are kind of common there. So, which allows us to generalize our approaches and implementations that we do uh, to work across all of these softwares. And again, I'll further narrow down uh, my uh, discussion for this talk uh, to 
these three types of problems, the short read assembly, the long read assembly, and the protein similarity and clustering. Now, if you think about these problems, th there are three types of uh, algorithms that are common. The, the dynamic programming alignments uh, are common across all these three domains, the distributed and local graph traversals and constructions using hash tables. Here, when I say graphs, it's, it's mostly to bring graphs. That is also common across the first two. Uh, while across the last two, the uh, the sparse matrix multiplication is another motif that appears. Now, uh, I'll be more uh, in in details. I'll be talking about the dynamic programming algorithm, uh, mostly adapt and the district and the local hash tables uh, and local assembly uh, in detail. Now, before we get into that, let's talk about why these problems are challenging for GPUs. Now, if you are a GPU developer, think about what works well for a GPU. And you would realize that it's better if you have localized and predict, uh, predictable memory accesses uh, because on GPUs, uh, it's better, like the optimal way it is to uh, best utilize the memory bandwidth that you have avail available because you have so much compute that you are limited by the memory bandwidth. So it's, uh, it's good if you have localized or at least predictable memory accesses so that you can uh, restructure your memory uh, uh, accesses according to what your algorithm is trying to do. Uh, and then it's expected that a GPU will get more computations for each memory access. Uh, and the distribution of work across the threads of a GPU is almost ideal uh, because the, uh, then you will have these warp stalling if there is a load imbalance. But if you look at these algorithms, the sequence alignment and the hash table uh, graph traversal, then we everything we have is just opposite to that. For example, uh, for graph traversals, the memory access pattern is completely random because you're mostly using hash table for that. Uh, for sequence alignment, your memory accesses are along diagonals, while typically you will have uh, the APIs that you have, they, they have like the column major or the row major indexing, and that's, that's, some, that's somewhat easier to do because that's more common. And in bioinformatics, or in particular these algorithms, the computations that we, that we are doing is mostly integer only. And the computations per memory access are quite low if you compare that to a physics or a chemistry simulation, where you have a lot of floating point computations per every memory access. And thirdly, the, the amount of work uh, across every thread is non-deterministic. If you're doing a, a brain graph traversal, you never know how long a certain walk is going to be. Uh, and that can cause problems because you have these lockstep uh, threads in a warp uh, and if you have one thread doing more work, then you will have a warp, the, the complete warp will be stalled. Uh, and finally, we have limited, uh, we have varying or limited amount of parallelism because uh, when you're doing a bring graph traversal, there's only so much parallelism that you can do. And then if you look at the this, this figure on the right, which basically shows a Smith-Waterman or a dynamic programming alignment progression, you'll see that in the yellow region, you have a diagonal or the amount of work that you can do in parallel that's increasing with every step. When you enter the orange region, it's constant. And when you enter the red region, the diagonal is shrinking. So the amount of work that you can do in parallel is decreasing, <clears throat> which is just not what you want for a GPU. So as, as our first solution, we implemented ADAPT, which is a GPU accelerated sequence alignment library. And, uh, and as I mentioned before, we wanted something that was generic uh, across DNA and proteins. Uh, and uh, some, something special about, about ADAPT is that it does not use typical domain specific optimizations like uh, bit manipulation, where you compress uh, uh, your, uh, your four bases of DNA to be represented using two bits. Here we uh, use complete, we, we just use uh, shorts. Uh, but we do not do any compression because we want uh, this to work for protein alignment as well. Uh, what we do is we rely heavily on hardware optimization. For example, we make sure that most of our communication between threads resides within a warp where we can make use of warp intrinsics to do and do the inter-thread communication. And when we have to do inter-warp communication, we utilize shared memory and we try to minimize that. And uh, the, the biggest challenge arises when we are storing these, uh, when we are doing a trace pack and we are storing these matrices for trace pack. First, these trace pack matr matrices can be large. The other thing, the bigger challenge was that when you have uh, a diagonal major indexing where you, are ex where you have to access uh, two elements of a diagonal, uh, you basically, if your matrix is laid out column major or a row, a row major wise, then the two consecutive elements of a diagonal will be placed length of a sequence apart. 
And that really makes caching difficult and causes non-call asset memory accesses on a GPU, which basically means that you're, you're doing one separate memory transaction for every thread of a war. So what we did was we restructured the way our DP matrix was laid out. We made sure that the elements of a diagonal were close by. And we do this by computing two indices on the fly. One index tells you the index of the diagonal. The other tells you the offset of element within the diagonal. And as far as the uh, the the size of the, uh, the matrices is, con uh, is concerned, one of our PhD students recently implemented a compression strategy that allowed us to use one single bit to uh, uh, three three bits to basically uh, reflect the direction of the pointer, the up, left, and to the diagonal. Uh, and that really allowed us to save about four x memory in memory. You know, got four x memory reduction. That work is still uh, uh, being you know in the process of being right, uh, written. It will be out there soon, uh, but yeah, I don't really have anything, any picture for that. Uh, but, and then we did this comparison against some of the popular CPU libraries, which have been vectorized and optimized much for CPUs. Uh, the analysis here is that we are trying to do a comparison between nodes, a CPU node and a, and a node that has GPUs and uh, ADAPT outperforms the, the CPU libraries by about 8X uh, up to 8X. And uh, the fun part is that we get consistent performance across uh, protein alignments as well. Typically, if you look at uh, the, some of the state of art libraries for sequence alignment out there, you'll see that they're highly optimized for DNA. And when they switch to protein, either they don't work or they do, uh, they, they see a significant performance drop. Uh, finally, we integrated ADAPT in MetaHypmer. MetaHypmer is our metagenome assembly pipeline. I would suggest that you just focus on this right side of the figure and do not be inundated by all the other information. So MetaHypmer is the uh, is implemented using UPC++, uh, which means that, uh, so we are trying to optimize uh, the utilization of a node by launching as many ranks as we can. So typically, let's say if you have a Perlmutter supercomputer on each node, we try to launch 128 ranks. And we also have four GPUs, so all the ranks will be sharing the GPU. So there's a lot of GPU sharing going on. And ADAPT makes it easy because we provide the software wrapper or as we call it driver. You basically make, it's basically like you make a call to it. It will detect all the GPUs that you have available and distribute uh, the work across across all the GPUs. It's kind of a drop in replacement for a Stripe Smith Waterman library, the SSW library or the CCAN library that you have. So you can basically replace your API calls with the ADAPT call and it will take care of that. Uh, this is some of the performance uh, comparison. Uh, just focus on the on the on the plots within the uh, on the skyscrapers within the red box, and you can see that uh, if we have small number of nodes, for example, the red bar shows an eight node run with eleven GB meta genome data set. Uh, we are getting about nine point four x performance improvement in the alignment stage. Uh, now, being on that alignment stage is not just the alignment kernel. There is a lot of other uh, code there as well, but Overall, it gave us 9.4 uh, performance improvement for eight node one. But as we increase the number of nodes, the amount of work that is available to do for a GPU goes drastically down. So we go up to 2x performance improvement when we are using 256 nodes and are processing 813 gigs uh, data set. These performance numbers are from Summit Supercomputer where each node has six V100 GPUs. Uh, we also integrated ADAPT in PASTIS. Uh, PASTIS has a larger, uh, spends a larger percentage, percentage of time in sequence alignments. So we got a much bigger performance improvement here. And uh, uh, for example, here we got about 5X performance improvement when we moved from Cori CPU nodes to, to Summit Supercomputer. Uh, also uh, uh, the, this work, uh, PASTIS using uh, ADAPT uh, was also finalist of the Gordon Bell, for the Gordon Bell Award last year. And uh, the most of the computation uh, were being done using the ADAPT sequence alignment library there. So next is the more exciting part, the, the local assembly. And so this is a time uh, uh, pie chart for meta uh, metagenome assembler when doing a 64 node run on Summit system. So after we had offloaded the, the alignment uh, parts to the GPU, this thin orange line shows you the alignment kernel that almost disappeared. And uh, the thing, thing that stood out was the local assembly part. It was, it was taking about 34% of the time 
uh, in a 64 node run. So that was naturally our next target. Now, before we get into details, what is local assembly? So local assembly is the part of metagenome assembler where we try to extend context further locally by using the reads that align to each of its ends. For example, this green line is a contig and we have these reads that align to each of its ends. So in the first step, we break down all the reads into chemers and we try to build a De Bruyne graph. And then we take the ends of the contig and try to do a De Bruyne graph traversal or a walk and try to extend the contigs in both the directions. Now this algorithm is implemented using two steps. First is to build the De Bruyne graph using chemer hash tables. And let's say that we have these reads and we have this context. So we break down the reads into chemers and the chemer is a key and the extent, uh, the value is the extension. For example, for this particular chemer, ATGC, the extension is A. So ATGC acts as the, uh, the key and the value is the extension A. So we build hash table in this way. And once the hash table is complete, we do DNA walks or the green graph traversal. We take a slice from the end of the context uh, uh, which is TGCA, we look that up in the camera hash table, we find the extension and append it to the right of the contig. Uh, we get the next camera, we find the next extension G and append it to the contig. We repeat the process over and over again till we get an acceptable walk. If the walk is not acceptable, we discard it, we go back, we rebuild the hash table with a different camera size and we repeat the process. Now, th now that I have described you the algorithm, think about it what the challenges you will face when you're trying to implement this on a GPU. Uh, GPU, you do not have, first is you do not have dynamic memory allocations on GPUs and hash table is a dynamic memory structure, uh, uh, is, a dynamic, uh, is a dynamic memory structure and you, so here obviously we'll be using the static memory allocations. Uh, the other challenges, challenging thing is the length of walk is non-deterministic and for GPUs you really want uh, it to be well balanced. Uh, this is an overview of the GPU local assembly. Uh, the blue parts are on CPU, the green parts are on GPU. So the first step that we do is contact binning. This is something that brings us a certain degree of load balance across the GPU threads. Uh, how do we obtain that? Uh, because it's very difficult to know how long a certain walk will be. So what we do is we try to find, uh, we try to bucket or bin the contacts with similar number of reads together because if you have larger number of reads, you can expect you will have a larger hash table and you will have a longer walk. Now, this is just a heuristic. We are not sure, uh, we were never sure how it was gonna work, but it worked really beautifully for us. The next step is to uh, estimate the hash table sizes. Now, if you go with the largest hash table size, you can only offload a handful of local assemblies uh, to GPU. But if you measure accurate number of, uh, if you measure accurate hash table sizes for each local assembly and then allocate that specific amount to the GPU, you're able to inundate GPU with just enough work so that this very difficult looking algorithm for GPU will give you some performance. After that, we make the batches, we initialize the GPU, we offload the right extension kernel, uh, offload the left extension kernel. So this is basically the same kernel, just the data is different. We repeat till all the batches are done and then on the, G on the CPU side, we copy data, all the data back and we append the extensions to the context to the right and to the left side. This is what the, the local assembly kernel looks like from inside. Uh, the unit of parallelism that we use here is warp and we do one local assembly per warp. The reason we use warp is because it's just the nice and right size. If you use a block, it's too much resources for a small amount of work. If you use anything less, uh, you will have uh, you will have these issues uh, that you will have less number of threads. Now, it works nicely because within a warp communication is optimal. You can just use the warp intrinsics and it's the fastest. If you have to do interwarp, then you have to go through shared memory or global memory and that really slows things down. So using a warp, we construct a hash table. Uh, that's the camera hash table. And then using just one thread of the warp, we do the graph traversal uh, because there's only so much parallelism there. So we just use one thread there. Next, we do a broadcast of how the walk went because only one thread knows if the walk was successful or it was a failure because if it's success, then you go through. If, it's fa it, if it has failed, then you go back and rebuild the hash table with all the other threads together. Uh, that's why the broadcast is important. And um, uh, yeah, if you don't, then uh, some of the threads will go through and one thread will be going back. So here we use the warp intrinsics to do the broadcast. Uh, there were a lot of uh, 
interesting things when we were implementing this, but here I'll try, I'll, I'll just mention one, the thing that I found most interesting, that was the type of collisions that we ran into. One was the hash collisions. Hash collisions are the typical hash collisions that you have the same hash uh, for two insertions. So here you uh, we, we resolved using the linear probing approach. The other thing was thread collision. That was more interesting. A thread collision is when you have two threads uh, that end up having same camera. For example, here thread one and four have the same camera, so they will be accessing the same memory in the hash table. On the on the CPU, you would have these nice atomic regions that are exclusive regions that you will have, and you can do this thing sequentially. But on GPUs, since we have lockstep execution, it, it becomes very difficult. So uh, what we did was we used CUDA's uh, uh, intrinsics like uh, atomic cast compare and swap function and paired it with the match any sync operator. So what match any sync does is it tells you uh, if a uh, how, uh, if if a pointer is sharing the same value across uh, across multiple threads in a warp. For example, you have 32 threads in a warp. If two threads are sharing the same pointer value in the warp, it will give you the bits uh, of those in the form of a mask. And that tells you which of the two threads are running into this thread collision. And then you can uh, use uh, atomic cast in a very targeted manner and resolve this. This basically mimics an atomic region, but in a very performant way. Uh, the difference between you, uh, you know, not using this and doing a typical lock uh, thing, it was about 20x performance difference. Uh, finally, we integrated a local assembly into MetaHipmer in a very similar way we did with the uh, with Adapt. But since local assembly kernel is slower than the sequence alignment kernel, uh, there, it was taking uh, you know spends a lot of time on GPU. So we also introduced CPU stealing, where we have a queue of work, GPU takes a chunk, and CPU starts stealing work from there while GPU is busy. So it really gave, gave us best of, best of the both, both worlds. Uh, finally, this is the um, final view uh, of 64 node run that I showed you in, in the beginning. You can see that we reduced the local assembly part to just 6.3% of the total uh, runtime of meta genome uh, assembler. And this is a strong scaling plot. Uh, you can see that as we increase the number of nodes, the amount of work that is available per GPU goes down. So the speed up uh, suffers, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it works. It still it works nicely. It's not what we expected, but if you think about the type of algorithm it is, it, it's really doing uh, doing a good job for us. Uh, this was uh, this was a eight GB dataset run on Summit nodes. And uh, uh, one thing that you can see here is that local assembly uh, gives more consistent performance uh, consistent performance improvement if we do a type of weak scaling. But if you look at the alignment code, uh, the weak scaling wasn't really good because. Uh, there was less work to do. I wouldn't really say less work to do per GPU, but the alignment kernel is way faster than the local assembly kernel is uh, given you know, the same amount of data uh, input. Uh, but uh, yeah, we did get decent amount of performance improvement. Now, uh, everything that we implemented so far was in CUDA. And if you have been keeping up with the US uh, HPC infrastructure, uh, you'll know that uh, all the exascale, the, the current and the upcoming exascale supercomputers are do not have NVIDIA devices. They have uh, AMD or Intel GPUs. And uh, so that means we have a lot of work to do. So for Frontier, we are currently, we have a HIP port. HIP is a, a kind of an analog to CUDA, very similar. If you know CUDA, you know HIP, you can easily port your code to uh, HIP. But the challenges that we faced here was that some of the intrinsics, in fact, a lot of intrinsics that we were using in CUDA are not completely supported in HIP. So sometimes we had to implement something on our own, or sometimes we had to uh, implement, you know, a completely different algorithmic approach. For example, the match any sync example that I showed, you can't do that on HIP or on AMD devices. You have to do something different. And uh, the other thing that we're considering is that within the DOE circle, there is uh, uh, a lot of effort going on in, in supporting multiple backends and runtimes. Uh, for example, if your GPU supports a uh, Spear V, uh, then there is something known as HIP SPV, and that allows your CUDA and HIP codes to run on Intel GPUs. Uh, so yeah, we are, we're looking into some solutions of those style uh, because we really don't want to maintain a third type of port that is of sickle code. We already have a CUDA and a HIP code, uh, having sickle, which sickle is slightly more different than HIP and CUDA, so it will require more require more effort. Uh, maybe at another talk, at another venue, I can talk more about our porting efforts. 
and performance and portability efforts that we, are, we have for the same problems. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my team at Exabiome at NERSC and the, the funding agencies and the institutes. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. I hope I finished in time. Yeah, great. Thanks. So I guess we have some time for questions. Uh, yeah, one question. Hello, Muaz. Thank you very much for the great talk and very interesting works. I would like to ask you something about ADEPT, uh, the way that you paralyzed. Um, if I if I got it correct, I mean, uh, you explained that you kind of rotate the dynamic programming matrix by 45 degrees, right? In order to have coalesced memory accesses. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you partition the different sections, different parts of the matrix uh, over different warps. Um, so what is not clear to me is uh, how do you transition from anti-diagonal to anti-diagonal? Is that you just terminate a kernel and launch a new kernel or you synchronize using some atomic operations or something? I'm curious about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that that's a good question. Maybe yeah, I, I was not clear enough. I think here. So the thing is that we use one uh, one thread to compute one column of the of the matrix, uh, and uh, typically, if you have any, you know, because uh, you will be needing information from two other threads. So let's say if you're computing this particular cell, you will be needing information from the thread on your left. So that communication is done using warp. So basically, there is no uh, synchronization uh, explicitly. Okay, so you communicate using shuffle instructions, yeah. I guess. That's right. But if you have communication over here, like between two warps, then that happens through a shared memory. And sometimes when you enter these red regions where the thread on your left may have phased out because it completed its, its column, then before it goes out of phase, it uh, leaks its uh, uh, registers or spills its registers to shared, shared memory. Uh -huh. Okay, I understand. And then, so then it's one alignment per thread block, I guess. Oh, okay, What's yeah, that, that's right. So there's one alignment per thread block, that, that's correct. So yeah, we have uh, a lot of alignments happening in parallel, yeah, as many pro uh, blocks that we can launch given the resources. Okay, okay, yeah, understood. Thank you very much. Good work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Moaz. Uh, this is Mohammed Alsar, ETH. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the three-bit uh, optimization you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. is it similar to CDEX from Micro 2020, or uh, this is something else? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with, with the reference that you mentioned. I can maybe tell a bit about it. So. Three bits, it's a problem for alignment. So typically we are using four bits, but by three bits, uh, you know, one points in the up direction, one points to the left, one to the diagonal. So to keep track of uh, your traceback matrices, uh, so uh, she, uh, like our PhD student, Leanne, she is using those three bits, uh, you know, building a matrix where, yeah, you can keep track of that pointers. I see, I see, mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, hopefully you'll see that work, you know, somewhere soon. Yeah, she's in the process of publishing it. Yeah, that will be great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Right. So maybe I have like uh, one more question, but like this is more or less like a reviewer two type question. Uh, mm -hmm. So you mentioned like the, the I guess you worked on De Bruyne graphs. Uh, and like naturally, you also observe that there's probably like uh, potentially a less parallelism over there, at least like the, by the nature of the algorithm, or at least like compared to string graphs. I guess Aiden also worked on uh, on the distributed memory using string graphs to construct assembly with Julia and others. Uh, I was wondering whether there was an insight uh, behind using the Bruin graphs uh, rather than string graphs, let's say, which I guess provides a better parallelism for GPUs? Or did you just want to extend this, uh, extend the GPUs for this application particularly? So yeah, uh, so I think you just answered the question, yeah. So basically, Meta Genome Assembler is like kind of 
an established application. It is being used by community. And our effort here was to not to mess with the algorithms or you know try to change that. We would just wanted to get it working on something that has GPUs and utilize that. So uh, I think somebody who developed a meta genome assembler or you know initially or who thought about you know when making this decision of either to use a spring graph or the brain graph, maybe Dick, they would be in a better position to answer that. Uh, yeah. I, I I remember having that discussion with them, but I don't really recall what the reasoning was. But yeah, I, I agree there there can be better solutions to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. Then let's thank Moz again and then then move to our next topic. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you Moz. very much. Okay, our next talk will be from uh, Ritu Parna Das. Ritu, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Great to see you remotely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can start sharing your screen while I introduce you. Sure. Uh, yeah, Ritu is going to talk about systems for precision health, as you can see. Uh, she's an associate professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She got her PhD from Penn State, and we've done a bunch of work together with Rita also uh, <laughs> for over years. And she's been doing work on uh, bioinformatics acceleration, genomics acceleration uh, in the past several years, as well as in-memory computation. Uh, and uh, she's going to talk about some exciting things <laughs> that they're doing in this. And uh, you, may, you may also know our squiggle filter work that was published recently. I think last year, right? Or 2021. Yeah. 2021, yeah. that's right, yeah. Yes. Okay, Rita, Great. please go ahead. Sure, thanks for the nice introduction, Honor. And as it, it was so so fun to collaborate with you, you know, I think we should restart that for this topic. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm not going to be presenting Squiggle Filter today because it's just a 20 minute talk, but let's, let's see what we have. So I'm going to, you know, I just wanted to give a little bit of a broad, um, feeling about what really precision health is and what are the system requirements if you want to support that kind of thing. So uh, with precision health uh, or personalized medicine, also they call it, it's like having a unique uh, treatment, um, unique treatment plan for every patient, right? And um, kind of uh, goes back to this seminal way of doing blood um, transfer uh, between patients and imagine if we didn't know the blood type and how could we do a blood transfusion so that was a big step in um, in medicine and i think precision health where we can take individual variability in the genes and uh, environment and lifestyle would be equally phenomenal as as we make progress in research and make that work so um one size does not fit all we uh, we all know that and but you know how to make it more customized um beyond that description is what the challenge is so so this concept is known but to implement it in practice is really difficult so let's see um, what we as computer scientists can do for this um, lofty goal. Um, the way I think about it is um, it starts at the data sources. So you have uh, uh, heterogeneity and diversity in the data sources. So there's electronic health records, which is today existing, right? So they're already used today for making a lot of decisions. But then there's your uh, genome data, epigenomes, like how these genomes are actually manifesting, microbiome data, which is, you know, a lot of, you know, we have trillions of microbiomes in our body and they really shape how the genes manifest and how the chemical and biological processes in our body manifest. And metabolomes, which are small molecules like lipids and amino acids, and they also make a huge difference to how our body reacts to different um, uh, bugs and germs and also how we kind of age and so on. So these are the various data sources. And then there should be some way of converting all this uh, uh, most of it is analog, actually, like the genomic data, biological, there should be some way to digitize it, right? That's when we can actually um, uh, build a system around it. So there has to be a digitization process, which is where sequencing comes in. Sequencing is a way to digitize genome and even epigenomic data like RNA. 
And uh, then we have decision support tools which use this digitized information and then uh, do analysis on it. And lots, this lot of data which is generated in this, um, you know, if we try to collect all this cumulative data, just to give a perspective, you know, Facebook pro probably collects a gigabyte per user, but then a human genome is 300 gigabytes. And if you do liquid biopsy, that's a terabyte of data. So the scale of data is very huge here. So how do we make meaningful anal analytics on it is, is a computational problem as well. And then once you do the um, analysis, then you know you can do diagnosis, you can do prevention, you can do treatment and management. So one thing I would like to emphasize here is it's not just only in a clinical set setting as a doctor's office where these platforms are useful, but they can be offline too, um, you know, at the customer um, for a user, for a specific user and do personalized decisions outside the hospital. So uh, that, that's a precision health platform. And um, if we think about different problems here, one thing which I'm excited about is efficiency. And I'm gonna talk about that, but outside efficiency, security and privacy is also a huge problem. You know, we, we need to, we are sharing very personal information and how do we share that with like the uh, precision health platforms is an important problem and form factor. You know, we want to make these small so that they can be at the point of care, at the user, um, you know, uh, for consumer um, products. So form factor is also very important. So I think uh, these three problems are uh, very interesting as well as very important to solve for precision health platforms. So as I was talking before, you know, we I'm going to focus on efficiency. And one of the things which I love focus on is digitizing these analog signals uh, using sequencing. So sequencing is a very key ingredient here of precision health, right? That is at the interface of biological data and uh, digital data, which we need to analyze. And also it's a very important form of signal which we can provide for precision health. So let's take a look at um, you know how sequencing has evolved and uh, so on. And I'm sure there have been a lot of talks uh, today morning going over this stuff. So I'll, I'll you know just build a little context and rush through these. But um, we have come a long way since the first genome was sequenced. And you know actually a thousand genomes were sequenced not too far away, probably 15 years back, right? But it's growing exponentially since then. Uh, we have moved on from uh, second generation to third generation uh, sequencing, which is, you know, even like has reduced form factor. And going forward, this uh, single sequ cell sequencing is going to be even a more cooler technology because now you can actually target individual um, cells from different parts of your tissue or organ systems and make meaningful that specific diagnosis of that specific organ system or that specific organ, right? So I think that's a very powerful technology. And you know, good and bad, it's computationally very intensive. So that's also there. And there's a huge, um, huge uh, momentum towards sequencing every um, every citizen in many, many countries, right? So that there's a lot of genome sequencing which is gonna happen in the next um, five or 10 years uh, in, in population scale. So what is interesting is that the, as the cost of human genome is falling, because we are go going on this exponential trajectory of sequencing more and more genomes, um, and it's $1,000, I believe it can fall to $100 too, if we are, you know, it depends on what application we are looking exactly for, like how much sequencing we need to do. But um, silicon is not scaling that well, right? So we need to, there's a gap between the cost per human, human and how fast our silicon is scaling. So um, so we need to bridge that gap, and that's what that's where hardware, software, co-design, and acceleration would help. And there's exploding sequencing applications. So you know, we we and every domain will need a very custom computation pipeline, uh, hardware, software pipeline. So for instance, we you know we just went through the pandemic, and there we have to sequence um, viruses and do epidemiology epidemiology analysis and kind of it's it's a more of a classification problem along with sequencing right uh, this is where we did our work on squiggles filter then there's consumer genotyping uh, you know that's kind of a more lightweight whole genome sequencing there's cancer treatment where we want to diagnose and figure out these mutations uh, microbiome uh, sequencing your gut uh, microbiome or microbiome all over your body again that's a different problem from cancer treatment and genotyping 
Uh, and then, you know, agricultural sequencing, uh, it was a surprise to me when I first found out that the wheat genome is like much, much larger than the human genome. So, um, you know, th that's another like there's many special custom um, sort of techniques we can come up with there again, algorithmic and uh, hardware software for a different, um, you know, species and different domains. And then uh, one thing which I'm also excited about is real time sequencing. So in operating room sequencing, which we have done some work and I'm going to talk about that today so i won't go so much here and then food safety you know there's you know sometimes i mean there was the story i tell like chipotle found some uh, bugs in the in the meat that they were transporting and they had to throw off um, you know, millions worth of uh, food and fresh items. So, you know, kind of doing that kind of sequencing at the during the consumer during that uh, supply chain pipeline is also very important for food safety to save our losses. And this is the best way to, you know, this is one of the most accurate way of diagnosing any problems with food safety. And uh, liquid biopsy, this is ongoing work in my group. So we have not yet published it, but I'm very excited about that because it's, again, a needle in haystack and a very different problem from all the other uh, sequencing applications which we have seen here. Um, and, uh, you know, like portable pathogen detection is more of point of care version of epidemiology analysis or uh, figuring out new pathogens quickly and or even existing pathogens more quickly, like kind of before PCR, um, uh, PCR primers can be developed and deployed all over the world, you know, if you want to still uh, a new, if a new pandemic is emerging, how do you have these uh, portable pathogen detectors? So uh, with that, you know, I'm going to do a little deep dive into whole genome sequencing. This is where we started out in our group. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we have done here. And then I will talk about the in operating room uh, sequencing. So um, probably I'm preaching to the choir here, but still I'll repeat the steps here just for the context. You know, you, you get a sample, right? It could be um, a tissue or a plasma or a liquid sample. And then you have to do some sample preparation and then you sequence it through a sequencer. And the sequencer, basically what it does is it, it breaks down your uh, very long genome into many small fragments and it duplicates it many times over. And the reason we are duplicating it is for error correction. Although the error rates are very low with short read technology, we still need to do that to kind of, uh, you know, tease out the errors versus the actual uh, variants. And then since we have a lot of these short fragments, we have to find a um, reasonable location for them on the reference genome. And uh, that process is the read alignment. Um, and read alignment has got you know, two steps, which I'll talk about soon. And then once you um, kind of find an approximate location for these uh, reads, then we kind of remove all the duplicates. We do some sorting to make sure they're in a reasonable um, order and format for the variant caller to call the variants. And then what the variant caller essentially does is it piles up all these aligned reads together and then finds out true variants. That's the whole goal of this uh, uh, exercise is that if you have a reference genome, you want to see where in your genome the base pair is different, right? In this case, CNA. Uh, and make sure that that is a uh, systematic, uh, you know, systematic difference and the not the random uh, differences are basically pruned out because they are just from the errors. And using this variant information, then we can do diagnosis. So, um, so, so what I'm going to talk about is the read alignment step today. Uh, this, um, we kind of looked at a very, uh, well, this is maybe one or two years old, <laughs> but it took, it takes about 14 hours on a very like high end, uh, CPU with lots of cores, 32 cores to do all this, uh, thing, uh, the process. So we want to kind of reduce the time and also the energy to do that. Um, and then when we want to do this in parallel for lots of uh, genomes, we want to increase the throughput as well. So we want to reduce both the time to result as well as throughput. So uh, the first work I'll talk today about is GenX. So this focuses on once you have figured out the location on the genome where this read would approximately align to, we do an approximate string matching step. And uh, what is state of art today is, you know, uh, some variation of Bandit Smith Waterman. That's what most software um, implement with different scoring functions. And um, what we wanted to, uh, what we looked at, and we came from a very different background. We're trying to look at the Micron's automata processor initially and try to see if we, that can solve this problem. And we quickly realized that's not possible. 
but uh, we wanted to build an automator to kind of solve this problem. And uh, the couple of key insights which we had was that, you know, we wanted, if you build an automator for the entire human genome, you have to encode all these substrings in genome and slowly the automator state just explodes because there's so many different strings uh, once you break it down. So we wanted to make a string independent automata and it has to have local um, sort of scoring. It has to have a local connections so that the automata is efficient. So that's what uh, was the key insight which led to Scylla. Of course, to make it work, I think, um, you know, to find out the uh, the state transitions and the differences between the input uh, query and the reference, we had to uh, create some retro comparison codes, which which would make this very nice and uh, local and the interface, the query and the reference interface to be very clean. Um, so that's uh, that's where that's how we ended up at Genax. And um, uh, at that point, we also wanted to just not do the the string matching, but we wanted to actually figure out the optimal path. Uh, like only finding the best score was not sufficient. We have to find out the traceback path. So then we kind of augmented this uh, systolic array so that it can do uh, traceback. And uh, also supporting a fine gap scoring was not easy. It uh, really bloated up our little tiny piece. So, you know, the one which we had for edit distance was beautiful <laughs> and small, but once we had to put in all these features, then it started becoming a little bit larger, but then that's that's realistic. That's what we really needed for the high accuracy and bit exact results. Um, and we not only built the architecture for it, we also uh, fabricated a chip for this and showed its uh, utility. Although it was in 55 nanometer, it was still so much more efficient than uh, the CPUs and GPUs uh, uh, is what we measured. So that's uh, that was the Gen X um, sort of architecture. So after building Gen X, what we realized was this order of K square can be very innovative in terms of um, area. So that sort of motivated our uh, next work, which was CDEX, uh, which we went with like a, you know, a, a little bit different uh, design, but the whole um, idea was now we'll go with um, sort of a banded implementation with just a PE which can process the wave front of the, the wave front is shown here, of the uh, wave front of the optimization dynamic programming problem we are trying to solve with the alignment. Uh, but what we realized was that, you know, when you are doing this a full, so nobody does full band, right? So even in the software, they try to find the uh, fixed band, which depends on the query string sizes. So full band is not, I mean, GenX supported full band, but we quickly realized that's not efficient. Um, so the, so the, so the band in software is usually measured based on the query string size. So that's also not very optimistic. Uh, but what, you know, if you look at all these different paths, uh, which go through for the optimi uh, the, to find the optimal path, a narrow band is mostly always sufficient. And narrow band reduces, to, you know, the number of P cycles, the number of P's needed and so on. So it's more efficient. However, there is a slight chance that when you go with a narrow band, you will miss the optimal path. So, you know, as architects love speculation, what we came up with is that, you know, we wanted to get the optimal path, but at the same time, we want to make sure we catch these sort of um, sort of small, uh, you know, deviations uh, at the runtime. So we came up with a speculative method where we would execute only the narrow path optimistically, hoping that it will catch all the paths. But we computed, and, you know, this is a DP formulation with a fine gap scoring. So it's possible to compute the thresholds outside the band. So if you, if the score at any time inside the band is exceeding these threshold scores means that your path has deviated and has come out of this band, which we are computing the narrow band. So having those threshold scores, scores give us a very cheap way of doing the checks, whether of whether our speculation is going to be successful or not. And that worked very well in this region, which I've shaded. 
uh, but you know if your reference string is typically much larger than the query string so there's this bottom half of the then the dp matrix which you know which was very hard to compute a threshold for uh, so there what we uh, said is okay let's give up with the <laughs> threshold scoring of the fine gap and we created an even more optimistic edit distance space score which would help us cache that and for that we had to build a very tiny edit machines which was smaller in size than the fine gap scoring so their static threshold scores was not sufficient so a, a tiny little edit machine checker would you know compute that box here which i'm showing um let's see if i can find the pen a tiny edit machine score would compute this box and then uh if you still exceed um if the scores here are ex are not exceeding this box then we are fine so with this method, we ensured that we have 100% bit equivalent results with the software, BWMM software. And, um, you know, we, we could detect when we were successful and in a very few cases where we were not successful, um, even with these all these checks, with the edit score checks, we would throw that back to the host to, uh, to do, uh, run that alignment in the software. So that's, that's how we managed to get 100% equivalent results. Um, and then, you know, this this helped to kind of improve the efficiency of a bandit Smith Waterman um, accelerator by reducing the number of fees we required and so on. And we had a, a working, uh, you know, FPG implementation of this on the cloud so we could, you know, give it out and get, get it deployed today if we need to, because building a chip is expensive, but FPG is, you know, we can deploy our solutions there. So, um, so that was the read uh, uh, approximate string matching problem. But another thing which happens before the read alignment is finding the, so if this is the read, there could be two possible locations on two or many possible locations. But in this example, there are two possible locations where this would approximately uh, align. So instead of going and taking the string and aligning it across the whole genome, we've narrowed it down to a few spots using the seeding method. And then we, um, then we can go and, do the full expensive um, string matching for those locations and what we found was this was very memory intensive um, it's usually done using an index called fm index which is has a lot of um, you know random memory accesses and um, the memory bandwidth requirements are huge and that's where the that's where the bottleneck is so you know so this is bwm mem and bwm mem2 and this is kind of telling the size of the index which we need to fetch which is um uh, sorry size of data which we need to fetch per read and it's it's really a lot so our observation was that can we build like a more bigger data structure but with more spatial locality and um you know so the more spatial equality and more a better way of pruning off the searches through this data structure so that we can reduce the amount of data which we need to move between the memory and um, and the processor. So you know it was it was an interesting trade-off here where we are willing to make our index much larger. So I think the software folks, you know, they they went the opposite direction, right? Like so, this is a very interesting way where hardware software code design can actually make a counterintuitive different, uh, you know, take a different path because. All the research in read alignment would, was focused on making this smaller and smaller and smaller, this index so that it can fit in the memory. And when architects look at this problem, we thought, okay, we have a little bit bigger memory capacity today. So why not expand this and build a more efficient data structure from scratch? And that would give you better results. And this, uh, we built a specialized hardware accelerator for this, but you know, the software itself was uh, giving pretty good results as well. So ERT, we ended up, uh, you know, getting integrated with BWMM2. Uh, and so the software data structure itself is can be used by anyone today. It's open source and is actually, uh, there are many, uh, we have seen some traction and uh, many users for this. So uh, the next step is sorting and marking duplicate. And this is just our, uh, you know, it's, it's not intellectually very uh, exciting, but then you have to make the step work and fast so that we can get a good end-to-end -end result. So we build a little in memory, a main memory sorting method and mark duplicates. It was just some software engineering here, but um, that we could reduce it from the current Picard tools to uh, quite a bit once we hacked it out. 
the the last step was variant calling and variant calling is very similar to the dp uh, problem for read alignment although the precision requirements and the so there's some nuances and some differences here what we found while analyzing this um, this problem is that you know the entire dp matrix is rid like there's a lot of redundancy here and you can prune a lot out so the final optimal score can be obtained by um, by executing much fewer cells or uh, much narrower and it's not really a band but you know much fewer cells uh, more than 90 percent can be pruned out while doing a pair hmm algorithm so we developed a pruning algorithm and an accelerator ar architecture um, here too and here as well we had the threshold checks to make sure that we are not making any mistake and we made sure it was again bit equivalent and we taped out this chip as well uh, uh, and uh, in 40 nanometer and showed it worked on this um, specific algorithm and this specific problem and had a software counterpart as well um so you know bit equivalence was a, a huge thing for us so we had to do a lot of you know hang-ups and stuff to kind of make sure like everything was exactly identical to the software results and this is a slide from honor actually so you know the accuracy really matters i think uh, I, I love this slide from honor and you know bit equivalence is i mean we can build any number of accelerators, but if you want them to be usable and you want, um, you know, the the bioinformatics community to use, then I think that that should be an important, uh, uh, you know, important guideline at least, right? Um, so uh, this is an example of, you know, how like a variant can actually make a difference. So if you make a, you know, many times there there's like, okay, there's 1% accuracy loss, but how even like one uh, variant, which is different can make a huge difference is an example of that. So this is a CYP, uh, CYP2C gene, you know, it's used for metabolism, uh, drug metabolism of uh, blood thinners, platwigs. So here is a DNA, which is normal. And on the right is aberrant. So this is the variant we are trying to identify. So there's a G2A variations here. So if you see this G has been flipped in this. Um, so th this is our reference, which is normal. And this is the aberrant. Now let's see what happens if, you know, we, we make a mistake here, right? If there's an error and our aligner didn't, didn't catch it. So, um, you know, so, so what happens usually in transcription is that this GTAG, um, you know, pattern helps to kind of prune, like uh, cut down the non-coding region. So now we have cut it down and we get the, um, uh, you know, we get an RNA out of this DNA and that translates to a protein, which helps to metabolize the drug. On the right-hand side, if you see, because of this aberration, now we are going to splice a much longer region of the genome. And when the RNA is formed, it is actually has a 40 base pair deletion. And therefore it is an aberrant protein, which cannot metabolize this drug. So uh, even, you know, the few, you know, percent or fraction of a percent difference in the errors can make a pretty big difference. So we should, we should be careful about that when we do our accelerators. Uh, so finally, you know, um, so what we found was by accelerating these kernels, which uh, I showed you, we could get, this is on an FPGA system working on the cloud. So it's a real prototype. We could get it down to 2.5 hours. And, you know, because we, kind of try to go end to end and I'm not showing individual part speed ups, but uh, kind of showing the end to end speed up. So there's always Amdel's law, right? This black was our Amdel's law demon, right? And even when we did ASIC, you know, this thing was <laughs> killing us. So, it, and there's acceleration opportunities here, right? So we could, we could build accelerators for these uh, other stuff too. All right. So how am I doing on time? Okay. This is my second part. I'm going to try and rush through that. Uh, I just have five minutes, I guess. Um, but uh, this is one project which we were very excited about, and it took us a lot of time to get through this. So, but let, let's talk about it a bit. And this we focused on long read technology. So, uh, again, probably most of the people in the audience know about this, but we, we have moved from short read to long read now. And uh, one key winner in long read uh, technology is nanopore sequencing, where basically it um, breaks down the DNA strand, not breaks down, pulls the DNA strand through these motor proteins and then digitizes the analog signal. Signals uh, to give us the base pair length. So here the read length can be even a million bases if you do the wet lab preparation well, but the accuracy is uh, lower. So you need better error correction mechanisms. Uh, one thing which is uh, cool about this um, technology is that it is portable. 
so you can kind of take it to a point of care you can build point of care solutions around it so that's where we started that uh, and the other thing which is cool about it is it has a very nice um filtration mechanism so you can let's say you see some part of your uh, gene uh, of your dna and decide that this dna is not relevant to your analysis you can kick it back up so uh, you can eject that dna back so you can discard a lot of useless uh, uh, dna which goes through it uh, so we wanted to leverage these two features the read until and this point of care so i'm going to talk about the point of care um, thing which we did in our lab and then the kicking part, I would welcome you to read our paper, uh, Squiggle Filter. So we built, uh, you know, what we realized very quickly while we were doing all this is that if we just focus on the computation side, uh, we may not be able to, you know, make a big difference. So we had to do a co-design of um, the wet lab sequencing as well as the software and the hardware. So we went ahead, got ourselves some minions and uh, set up a lab here, a wet lab in our, uh, in EECS. And this is Jack Warden. He was a postdoc in uh, my group and he really, it's amazing how he beautifully picked all this up and then he he went on to become a postdoc in medical school now he loves to do this stuff he doesn't want to do cs anymore i think <laughs> uh, but then so the the application the point of care application which was given to us by our um, physician friends was that can we do intraoperative histology so think about it like uh, you know let's say for brain um, so for, for neurosurgery uh, when they're trying to remove uh, malicious um, tumor tissue what they need to do is they need to figure out the margins of this tissue right and brain is a very precious tissue so you want to make sure you take just enough out right otherwise there could be a lot of cognitive uh deficient you know uh, cognitive uh, issues for the patient so today how it is done is a, in a pretty primitive way they take a slice of this tissue look it on, uh, up under a microscope and then you know that's the feedback loop so we thought, could we augment that or could we replace that uh, histology with uh, sequencing uh, point of care? But the challenge was to do this at about 30 minutes, right? So the whole thing from, from tissue to uh, finding a hotspot mutation was to be under 30 minutes. But this was a very different problem from whole genome sequencing, where you have to find the variants across the whole genome. Here, you know exactly what hotspots you are looking for. So you know one or two variants is what you're looking for. Um, so uh, fortunately, you know, there's enough traction in the medical community to come up with a list of molecular parameters which can be used for this kind of diagnosis. And that was the first uh, step. And then the question is now can we do the tumor DNA in the interoperative time frame? So, um, so this is the pipeline, you know, you take a piece of tissue, you have to do DNA extraction, and then you have to do some amplification of the gene you're looking at, do library preparation, sequencing, and then we do the informatics, right? Um, so the target, so what we found was when we looked at the time taken, this target amplification was actually huge. <laughs> the, like the PCR step, you know, because, and, and, you know, naturally so, because we're thermocycling here, we're changing the temperatures back and forth, which is a very mechanical thing to do. And so that's, that's going to take up a bulk of your time. While if you can look at this, this is where we lived, right? This was really small. So uh, first, you know, a little bit of disappointment that the problem we are trying to solve is really small, uh, while the bottleneck is somewhere else. So that's what motivated us to build up uh, wet lab. But then what we realized is that to we wanted to convert this chemical problem into a computational problem. And the way to do that is there are amplification techniques which are very fast, but very error prone. So what we thought is as informaticians and as like the hardware people, we can actually build error correction and the tools to kind of analyze that amplifi amplification product, make them very fast. So we can shrink this orange quite a bit and that will make the computation time longer, but then we can accelerate that. Uh, but uh, so, 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 so the way it went was that we uh, figured out uh, the first step was to do how much What's the what's the bare minimum amount of uh, amplification you need to do uh, so that you know we can do um, just enough sequencing? So what's the optimal point between the amplification and the sequencing time? First was first step was to find that balance, and that would lead to sort of an optimal time point. So that was the next step, and by doing that and also optimizing, you know, I mean it's amazing how Jack could even optimize the library preparation time. Like he looked at it and did some primer design studies to do that. And that came down to about 52 minutes. 
but still this in spite of this optimal thing you know the we still had a bottleneck there so what we did was this uh, we used lamp and it's not a new technique but it's not used in practice because of all these ugly little uh, amplification um, sort of off targets and um, loops it makes when it amplifies the primers right so that was the downside it was very difficult to analyze this but hey analysis is our strength right as um, so we we could tackle that problem we can't change the thermocycling uh, of pcr but we can tackle this problem so then we did with loop am mediated amplification so this is why it is fast is because it's isothermal because you don't need to cycle between different uh, temperature cycles to amplify the product so uh, and then we developed like a tool called lamprey uh, which would go and polish this um, you know product and clean it up really nice and um, and and fast so that we could actually uh, get to the variants uh, we did this for one hotspot mutation and so uh, by doing this so by doing both threshold sequencing and lamp amplification we could get it down to uh, less than 30 minutes so this is the final chart which we had so we started here about 140 minutes and then slowly with all the wet lab and uh, you know uh, sequencing and developing the lamp protocol and the lamp tool analysis we brought it down to uh, 30 minutes which sets kind of the fastest time to result uh, record for this specific diagnostic so yeah that sort of wraps up this point of care um, analysis and you know we have released this genomics bench uh, benchmark so i just wanted to kind of throw this out there if, if you're interested in this field and are looking for sort of wide set of computation kernels uh, which covered a lot of pipe three pipelines we cover pathogen detection we cover uh, whole genome sequencing as well as long read polishing pipeline so uh, this is one resource which is available we are planning to release a second version of it sometime soon after we wrap up the <laughs> project i was talking about but yeah uh, so this is uh, not just my work it's it's a collaborative uh, work with a lot of very good uh, people uh, including satish david uh, jenna veens uh, robert and uh, carl so um, they are, they have been our partners in the crime and they entertained us they you know <laughs> like bob uh, used to make fun like you are becoming more like me and i'm becoming more like you so <laughs> uh, but it was a fun experience and um an awesome group of fantastic students who were willing to take up this challenge and move fields and do what it takes to do good research um thank you so much okay great right if you have any questions happy to answer those yeah, thanks a lot, Ritu, for this wonderful talk. Sure. Any questions? OK, John has a question for you. Sure. Microphone to him. Thanks. Hi. Hello, Ritu. It was a Hi. great talk and eye-opening, I would say, <laughs> in many ways. Uh, so it was interesting that when you show uh, the, the library preparation and the amplification time uh, reduces significantly, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, at the same time, the sequencing time increases slightly, I guess. So this yeah. is probably because the, the the type of application is making things harder and then uh, perhaps like the sequencing time is longer. So do you think also based on your earlier work, uh, like um, the Skugel filter, do you think mm -hmm. approaches uh, like adaptive sampling read until uh, uh, these type of works like uh, will play an important role also to decrease that sequencing time such that like we can also overlap the latency right while sequencing to do the computation such that like maybe we can do the genome analysis within minutes so how, how do you see basically yeah. the future of adaptive sampling in that scenario yeah yeah no i think adaptive sampling is a very nice feature which uh nanopore enables right with the real the read until feature so uh, definitely it has a big role to play. So in pathogen detection, especially, I think like when we are trying to get like a sample from host and then figure out like the, let's say distribution of bacteria or, you know, if a specific uh, virus is present or not there, I think it will be very helpful because a lot of um, the, the strands which would come through would belong to the host. And so we can, if we can quickly identify that we could filter them out. So that's very useful there. Now read until here uh, in, in the project, which I just showed you like the cancer hotspot mutation. So, you know, why we didn't go for read until here, we thought about trying it out. 
But the reason was that um, we're targeting specific hotspot mutations, right? So the primers with Jack built were actually very short. They were not very long. So Redentil was not giving us very a lot of benefit. Redentil is useful if your sort of strands, uh, you know, the reads which are coming out are very long. So, you know, very quickly you identify and then you eject it out. But in this case, our reads were short. And there was also the reason to keep it short was a primer design complexity was getting very tricky. So if if you make it very long, then you know you get a lot of false positives. And second, the library preparation time that was very interesting. Like if you if you can you know, if you check our paper out, the library preparation time was actually lower <laughs> for like little bit shorter reads, right? So that that's the reason we didn't go for read until in the cancer um, uh, the the real time margin detection project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Any other questions for Ito? Uh, me too. I ha I think I have one question. Uh, sure. First yeah. of all, I think it was a very nice talk. Uh, wish you could be here in person, but hopefully <laughs> next time. Next uh, time, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we could discuss more. Uh, that uh, that chart where you show the library preparation time versus yeah all of the other stuff. Uh, yeah. plus computation uh -huh. how does that change based on the type of analysis you do or type of the genome uh, yeah basically yeah. can you give us some insight into how these different portions behave based on the analysis type and genome type etc yeah no that's a great question so you know so here one thing what we are doing was like you know we we are trying to we did only one hotspot mutation, right? So we were looking at only one specific variant, which we're trying to call out and actually a SNP. So, you know, that itself was quite challenging. Uh, but if we want to look at more like a broader panel, then the computation time is going to become uh, significantly higher. And not only that, depending on the the primer design, like how, like which portions you're going to amplify, that is also going to become very tricky. So as you expand out the region of interest in the genome, then this, you know, I, I can imagine that the computation time and the sequencing time will sl slowly start becoming bigger and bigger in this, uh, in this, you know, breakdown. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. So. Sure. Um, and also LAMP is very error prone. Like, I mean, if you mm -hmm. look at the kind of product it creates, it's very ugly. So, you know, scaling that up would be a very interesting problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Cool. Okay, yeah. if there are no questions, then let's thank Ritu one more time. Sure. Thank you, Ritu. Of course. And, you know, it was a pleasure and good luck with the panel tomorrow. It's, is the panel tomorrow in the main? No, it's on the 17th. Oh, on 17th. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Still time. <laughs> yeah. All right. See you. Okay. Thanks. See you. Okay. I think we have Ayu next. Okay. Ayu, yes, are you sir. there? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I yeah. can see you and hear you. You can share your slides also. So our next talk is by Hayu Mao, who is a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich in my group. And she's going to talk about uh, a work she's presented in last year's micro, uh, which I mentioned uh, today, uh, this morning in the talk, uh, in my talk, uh, which is in memory acceleration of genome analysis via tight integration of base calling and read mapping. Okay, Hayu, go ahead. Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you, Ono, for the introduction. And uh, I'm Haiyu. And, uh, and today I'm happy to share our paper, GenePip, uh, which is in memory acceleration of genome analysis uh, via tight integration of the base calling and remapping. So, in this talk, I'll firstly uh, give you an overall uh, overview of this uh, work, and then I go details of, uh, about it. So, um, for the the genome analysis, it enables us to determine the order of DNA sequencing uh, in, a, uh, in an organism's genome. And uh, it plays an important role in the per, uh, personalized medicine, outbreak tracing, understanding the evolu uh, evolution, and so on. 
and modern genome sequencing machines extract small, smaller randomized fragments of the uh, original DNA sequence, uh, which is also as known as reads. And in this work, we focus on the Oxford nanopore sequencing technologies, which is a widely used sequencing technology uh, nowadays. And as you can see here uh, on the right side, it's a uh, like you can grab it with your hand. Uh, we focus it because it's a uh, portable. It provides portable uh, sequencing devices, and it ha has high throughput, and also it's very cheap. Uh, we found that in the uh, genome analysis in G uh, ONT, um, there are two main uh, limitations nowadays. First of all, there are multiple steps in the genome analysis, uh, which uh, uh, which cause a large data movement between the multiple steps. And also uh, it uh, introduced a lot of wasted computation done on the data that is later discovered to be useless. So we propose GenePIP. GenePIP is a fast and energy efficient in memory acceleration system for the genome analysis pipeline via tight integration of genome analysis steps. GenePIP has two key techniques. The first of all is the trunk-based pipeline, which provides a fine-grained correlation of genome analysis steps. And second is the uh, early rejection, which timely stops the execution on useless data by predicting which reads will not be useful. GMP performs uh, state-of-art software and hardware solutions using CPU, GPU, and optimi optim optimistic PIM. So uh, I'll go to um, details of, uh, about the, the genome analysis and uh, our motivation. So this is the uh, nanopore genome sequencing. After we uh, using the genome sequencing machine, we get the raw signal genomes and we store them in the storage. So we continue with the uh, first step in the ONT genome analysis. Uh, which is uh, called base calling. In the base calling, we chunk the, the uh, raw signals into chunks and go through the uh, deep neural networks and base call them into uh, chunks. And then after that, we finished in the, in the read. Here, we use the green one to represent a high quality uh, of the base calling and use the red one to represent the low quality of base calling. After we finish base calling all of the um, gene, uh, raw signal sequences and we get all of the reads and we store them in the storage. Then we continue with the next step, which is, which we, which is known as the read quality control. In the read quality control, uh, if, there's a, if the read is a low quality read, then we discard it. And the read, if the read is a high quality read, then we store in the storage and continue with the next step, which is read mapping. In the read mapping, we compare read to the reference genome and to see if if it can map it can be mapped to the ref, reference genome or not. If it can be mapped, then it's uh it's if it cannot be mapped to the reference genome, then we discard it. If it can be mapped to be reference genome, then we uh, store the mapping result to the storage. So let me go a little bit detail about the uh, first, uh, the, the three steps that I mentioned before. So in the base calling, we usually use the deep neural networks to ensure the uh, base, call, base calling accuracy. And uh, the input of the base caller is the uh, raw signal trunks. And uh, we translate the raw signal trunks to bases, which, it, which is known as the ACGT, and calculate the, each base quality at the same time. Then we assemble all of the base call trunks into a long read. So the output is a long read. For the read quality control, the input is the uh, base quality scores of a read from the base calling step. And uh, we calculate the average uh, score of uh, of the long reads and uh, compare with the uh, threshold. If it's higher than the threshold, then it's a high quality reads, and if it's lower than the threshold, then it's a low quality reads. And uh, the low quality reads are discarded. 
So the third step is read mapping. And uh, in the read mapping, we first do the indexing of the reference genome, which is done by uh, once and is done offline. So uh, the input of the read mapping is high quality long reads that we uh, generate from the um, read quality control. And uh, uh, firstly, we use the subsequencing read to query the hash table to get the possible match locations. And then we identify the candidate regions and output the chaining score. And then we ex execute the final alignment step if, it, if there is a chain. So the output is a mapping information. Um, among these, all of these uh, the steps and operations inside steps, we observe two main limitations. The first one is the large data movement. We use the human data set as an example. So uh, in this example, we observe that in the low, uh, for the raw signals, we have uh, um, nearly uh, 4,000 gigabyte data. And after base calling, we have uh, five, uh, 546 gigabyte. And after uh, the read call control, we have 437 gigabytes. And after remapping, we still have uh, 362 gigabytes. As you can see here, uh, between each step, we have large data movement between uh, genome analysis steps. The second limitation, we also use the same uh, data set as an example to uh, illustrate it. The second limitation is the waste computation. So after base calling, there are 100% of reads, let's say. And then after the read call control, however, there's only uh, less than 80% uh, are left. And uh, after the read mapping, there's only less than 70% uh, used for reads. So a consider, uh, we conclude that a considerable amount of computation on useless data due to the low quality reads or unmapped reads. Uh, so the uh, let me talk a little bit about the state of other works. So uh, the onm based PIM is an efficient te technique to reduce the data movement by processing data using onion memory. For the base calling, there's already uh, some works to using the onm based PIM, uh, which is designed for the vector matrix multiplication operations, and uh, which is a uh, dominant operation in the neural network applica applications. Therefore, it can accelerate the base calling a lot. And uh, for the read mapping, uh, there's also work for uh, using a VM-based PIM for the search and addition operation, which is the dominant operation in the uh, read, uh, read mapping step. However, um, this, uh, this PIM works reduce the data movement in a single uh, genome analysis steps and uh, exacerbate the data movement overhead between the analysis steps. And we conclude that no uh, non prior work tackle, tackles data movement between uh, analysis steps and reduce, uh, reduces useless computations. So our goal is to efficiently accelerate the entire genome analysis step pipeline while minimizing the data movement and the useless computation. And we perform a study to quantify the potential benefits uh, and the results are normalized to the performance of GPU. So we first consider the situation that we have uh, NVM based PIM accelerators for separate base calling and remapping steps. And it can achieve uh, 2.7 speed up. And second, we consider there's no data movement between these two accelerators and it can achieve uh, six times speed up. And third, we consider, we assume that there's no data movement and no useless reads in all of these uh, accelerations, which is the ideal case, which can uh, achieve nine times speed up. So uh, that's why we propose GenePip. GenePip is the first holistic in memory accelerator for genome analysis pipeline including base calling, read call control, and read mapping steps. GMPIP has two key techniques. 
uh, trunk-based pipeline and early rejection. First, let me talk a little bit about the uh, trunk-based pipeline. Trunk-based pipeline enables fine-grained pipelining of genome analysis steps. It also processes risk at trunk granularity, which is a, a, a subsequence. Usually, it's around the uh, 300 basis. Trunk-based pi pipeline increases the parism by overlapping the execution of uh, different steps uh, at the trunk, trunk granularity. Trunk-based uh, pipeline reduces the in intermediate data by computing on data as soon as the data is generated. Trunk-based pipeline also provides opportunities for the ER by analyzing a read at trunk granularity. Mm -hmm. So here we use an example that a read consists of four trunks. For the conventional pipeline, we base call all of the trunks one by one, and after base calling all of the trunks in, the, in this read, we assemble them, and then we do the quality control on the granularity mm -hmm. of, of this read. And after that, we do, uh, we do the read mapping on this read. But for our trunk-based pipeline, we do uh, the ba we base call the first trunk. Then uh, when we base call the next trunk, at the same time, we do the quality control of the first trunk and we do partial uh, computation of the uh, read mapping of the first trunk. So as you can see here, after we finish all of the computation of the uh, trunks and we do the rest of the computation of read mapping on the granularity of the read, and then um, we finish it. So you can see here um, for our base, uh, base trunk-based uh, pipeline, we can uh, save a lot of uh, computation cycles. So the second uh, technique of gene PIP is early rejection. Early rejection stops the execution on useless reads as early as possible by using a small number of trunks to predict the usefulness of a read. Early rejection predict and uh, eliminates the low quality and unmapped reads from the genome analysis pipeline as early as possible. So here uh, I give an overview of the early rejection, how we do the early rejection. We base call small number of trunks and then check the granularity of uh, these trunks, uh, to check the average uh, quality of these trunks. If it fails, then we stop analysis. If it passes, then we base call more trunks. And then we map the base called trunks so far. And then we check the mapping score. And if it fails, then we stop analysis. If it passes, then we continue base call the remaining trunks and uh, execute the remaining computation in the read mapping. So as you can see here, early rejection includes two key, uh, two sub techniques, early rejection based on the trunk quality uh, scores and early rejection based on the trunk mapping scores. So let me go uh, um, a little bit deep about these two uh, sub techniques. So the early rejection based on the trunk quality score, uh, our in, a, in this sub technique, our goal is to uh, accurately estimate the quality of the anti reads by checking a small number of uh, uh, the quality of a small number of uh, sampled trunks. So here is the example of uh, uh, the on the left side, the yellow one is uh, low quality reads, and uh, on the uh, right side, <laughs> the green one is a high quality read. And uh, here, the red line is uh, threshold uh, seven, which is recommended by the um, statistic. So <clears throat> we can we find some three observations. The, the first one is that the range of um, quality scores of the trunks extracted from the high quality reads is greatly uh, is greatly higher than that from low quality reads. And the uh, second one, uh, single trunks uh, quality score is not enough to predict the read quality score because there are many trunks uh, whose quality score are larger than seven. The third observation, we found that uh, consecutive trunks, trunk, trunks quality scores are usually close to each other, indicating that sampling consecutive trunks may not be representative enough to estimate the quality of uh, anti-reads. 
That's why we conclude that we need to sample a small number of non-consecutive chunks evenly in a read to predict the read quality. For the uh, trunk mapping, uh, ER based on trunk mapping, the key insight of uh, it is uh, a read may, can properly cannot be mapped to the reference genome if enough consecutive chunks in this read cannot be mapped to the reference genome. So uh, if we map a small number of trunks, um, a small trunks, um, it can provide uh, too many possible mapping locations. So um, we conclude, uh, we found that to map a small tr number of consecutive trunks in a read, and then we merge the small um, consecutive trunks in, into a big trunk, and then we map this big trunk to the reference genome to predict whether the read can be mapped or not. Um, it's worth to mention that uh, the CP and the ER can be in, applied on different systems such as CPU, GPU, and PIM. We implement CP and the ER using PIM since PIM is more efficient to reduce the data movement between the genome analysis steps. We also apply CP and the ER on CPU and GPU baselines and observe the speed up and the uh, uh, energy savings. So um, next, I will introduce the uh, GenePIP implementation. So GenePIP has three uh, main modules, base calling module, read mapping module, and GenePIP controller. First of all, GenePIP controller received the raw signals from the sequencing machine and stored in the EDRAM, and then um, sent a single uh, trunk to the in-memory base caller. And uh, after that, we send the base call uh, quality score in the <coughs> PIM CQS to calculate the quality score and of a trunk. Then we uh, send uh, the base quality trunk, uh, the, the base code uh, trunk along with the trunk quality score to the GenePIP controller. And after that, we send the trunk to the in memory read mapping module uh, and uh, uh, after we finish the read mapping, we send the re mapping result to the uh, storage. So uh, when there is, uh, we integrate the, the implement the early rejection uh, by sending the quality scores to the early rejection controller. And if there's early rejection, uh, then we send the base calling, uh, then we <laughs> send the signal to the base calling module to, um, and the uh, analysis of the current read. And we also send the trunk mapping scores to the ER controller. If there's some uh, uh, ER based on the trunk mapping score, then we send the uh, signal to both module and uh, to um, and the execution of the current read. So these are the... Um, units that uh, we designed, and you can find more details in our paper. And I want to mention uh, one thing in the uh, paper that we proposed in memory seeding, because uh, this <clears throat> can enable the um, very efficient uh, seeding on different uh, lenses. So basically, we uh, after we received the base code trunks from the gene PIP controller, we send it to the uh, query string generator. Here we read a substring sub from a trunk, and then we <clears throat> use a sh uh, shift register to generate a query string one by one, and uh, mm, send it to the uh, RM-based cam to search the key and uh, find the <clears throat> match uh, possible locations in the RAM based uh, RAM. Then we send the possible locations back to the EDRAM buffer and uh, uh, forward these uh, possible locations to the uh, remapping control. So it can efficiently support high, uh, highly uh, parallel seeding for long reads with variable lenses. And all of this, uh, we manage to tightly integrate the genome analysis steps and uh, to reduce the data movement and also eliminates the useless computation.
So, okay, let's go with the evaluation. Um, we uh, used the <coughs> simulation uh, and also some uh, simulators uh, to estimate that performance area and the power. And uh, the baseline we use is the CPU, GPU, and the optim optimistic integration of two team accelerators. Uh, I want to mention here because uh, we assume that for the for these two team accelerators, we don't have like the data moment. Uh, we and we assume that uh, there's no power limit. There's no area um, limit for all of this. Uh, yeah, and uh, the data sets are E. coli and uh, human. Uh, here are the results for the performance. So uh, peep can achieve uh, for 41 uh, speed up compared to CPU and uh, 84 uh, times speed up compared to GPU and 1.4 speed up compared to the optimistic P. And we conclude that uh, uh, also in more details in the paper shows that uh, both CP and ER are critical to the speed up. And for the energy efficiency, um, Gene paper provides 30 uh, times percent uh, over CPU, 20 times percent of GPU, and uh, 1.37 uh, times percent of uh, optimistic P. And more details in the paper shows that ER is, is especially critical to the energy efficiency. And we also show the uh, sensitivity analysis to show that uh, how we choose the um, the early rejection trunks and how many uh, trunks we need in each data set. And uh, this is designed when we uh, analysis the one data set and uh, offline. So as you can see here for the early, early rejection based on trunk quality scores, so we use two and five for the E. coli and human respectively. And we use five and three uh, for the E. coli and the human data sets for the trunk mapping uh, early rejection. And there are more uh, details in the paper. And uh, okay, let's conclude our talk here. So the problem in this uh, project we're targeting is the genome analysis pipeline has a large data movement between yeah, uh, each uh, genome uh, analysis step, and uh, uh, there's uh, also a significant amount of wasted computation on the useless data. So our goal is to tightly integrate genome analysis steps to reduce the data movement between the steps and eliminate the computation on useless data. Uh, that's why we propose GenePeep, the first in-memory genome analysis accelerator that tightly integrate the genome analysis steps. GenePeep has two key techniques, a trunk-based pipeline and a new early rejection technique. GenePeep outperforms the state-of-art software and hardware solutions using CPU, GPU, and the optimistic P. That's all for my talk, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you so much. OK, thank you, Hayu. Any questions? No tough questions for are you? I'm not taking longer than. Oh, well, you did well, I think. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I have one question. Uh, yeah. Why stop at read mapping? Yeah, it's a actually a very good question. Um, we can actually. Um, Read mapping is kind of a necessary one if we want to know some information from the genome analysis. Uh, we have also the variant calling, but it's kind of not very necessary thing. Uh, we can also continue with the other uh, steps, and uh, there's uh, uh, actually a lot of uh, uh, things that we can do. And uh, we focus on this uh, uh, these three steps because it's kind of a very uh, necessary step um, currently. And yeah, I agree with you. There are more things to uh, explore for <laughs> for the other steps. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. I guess that's good future work. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think there are no more questions. So thank you for the talk. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that marks the end of our workshop today. We're going to have a special <laughs> talk for John in the future for airlift. Like tomorrow morning. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next incarnation next year. Thank you, John and Honor for a great workshop. That was really inspiring. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Leonid. Thank you for staying with us. I didn't realize- Oh no, that, that was, I mean, I wasn't bored at all. Trust me. I mean, that was very interesting. Okay, yeah, thanks. And I will see you at ISCA. Yeah, see you in June. You. Yeah, take care. Thanks again. Happy holidays. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Oh, you can still give the talk. <laughs> yeah.